Uh, so very uh, warm welcome everyone. Um, today we're going to be discussing ultrafast physics, but also ultrafast chemistry and biology. Um, it's a very broad field. And so we have a very nice uh, program set up. Um, and I think we're just going to go straight at it. So our first speaker is Professor Giulio Cerullo, who is a full professor at the physics department of the Politecnico di Milano, Italy. Uh, he's leading the ultrafast optical spectroscopy lab um, and um, he's published many papers. He's a fellow of the Optical Society uh, of America and the European Physical Society. He's also the chair of the Quantum Electronics and Optics Division of the European Physical Society, recipient of ERC Advanced Grant, um, and has been general chair of several uh, important conferences in the field. So, Julio, uh, welcome, and please go ahead. What I'm going to do today is uh, to report on our work uh, at Politecnico di Milano, the physics department, on ultrafast spectroscopy of biomolecules, and in particular on the uh, use of ultra short light pulses for real time observation of conical intersections. So, here is an outline of my presentation. I'm going to start with a general introduction to conical intersections. And then, uh, since uh, I think this, this workshop is also aimed at introducing ultrafast spectroscopy to a broader audience, I'm going to give a really broad introduction to ultrafast spectroscopy, in particular high time resolution pump probe spectroscopy. And then I'm going to give uh, two examples uh, of uh, real time observation of conical intersection, which is the ultrafast dynamics of the primary event of vision. So uh, I'm going to give you a discussion of the ultrafast dynamics of the primary event of vision. And another process uh, uh, which is very relevant, uh, in which conical intersection are very relevant, are a photoprotection mechanism in DNA. And finally, if I have time, I want to discuss, uh, since looking at the future perspective, opportunities of using free electron lasers, X ray free electron lasers, to study the same process in conical intersections. OK, so let me start with an introduction to conical intersections. So if you describe the dynamics of a molecule, typically you learn in the textbooks to use the so-called Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where you separate the electronic and the nuclear coordinates of the wave function. And in this way, you solve the Schrodinger equation for the electrons for fixed nuclear positions and obtain the electronic energies as a function of these positions, the so-called potential energy surfaces. So these, in general, works. There are, however, some regions on the potential energy landscape where you are really mixing the electronic and the nuclear degrees of freedom. And so the Born-Oppenheimer, the adiabatic approximation, breaks down. And these are called the conical intersection. And, and I all like to think of these conical intersections as some doorways through which the photo excited wave packet that you are exciting with the light pulse is efficiently funneled to lower energy electronic states. And this gives rise to efficient uh, non radiative relaxation. So conical intersections are like doors through which molecular wave packet can pass to relax very efficiently and very fast from one electronic state to another. And so you, you have to think of these as some multidimensional seams. So these are areas on the surface where really the, the two surfaces become the generate of two electronic levels. They, they, they share the same value of energy. And so the, the wave packet can pass through this conical intersection and really, uh, for example, in this case, uh, reach uh, the, what is called the photo product. So these, these are like some doorways through which uh, um, the, the molecule can pass from one electronic state to another state. Now, you can have uh, two kinds of conical intersections, so-called peaked and sloped. And the, the difference is really when the two surfaces cross, if the slopes have opposite sign, you talk about a peaked conical intersection. And this promotes a photochemical transformation. So the conversion from one state, from one uh, reactant to a product state, so really photochemistry. The other kind of conical intersection is called sloped. And here you see that the slopes of the two surfaces that cross are the same. And this promotes uh, um, internal conversion back to the ground state. So what you are doing is you are very efficiently dissipating back to the original ground state the energy that you are absorbing. And these have both uh, a very important role. Um, for, uh, 
as I was saying, these uh, um, peak conical intersection are um, conducive to a photochemical reaction, in particular for rhodopsin, which is uh, the protein which is in our retina. Uh, this will uh, lead uh, to an, there will be an ultra fast photochemistry. So in general, you start from a reactant excited state and you end up in a product state, which is different. On the other end, the sloped conical intersection leads to a radiationless decay. And this is very important in DNA because in DNA, you don't want to, to, to perform photochemistry, but you want to dissipate the energy to avoid the photo damage. Now, uh, how can we uh, observe this conical intersection in real time? And uh, we do this by ultra fast uh, uh, pan probe spectroscopy. So uh, since uh, uh, I'm the first one talking in, in this uh, um, symposium, I took the liberty to start uh, uh, introducing the field by this uh, painting, which is a 19th century painting uh, about a horse lace, let, let there be the psalm by Theodore Jericholt. And this shows uh, galloping horses. And this is how all the 19th century pictures about galloping horses show this kind of uh, um, representation. Now, the, the, the galloping pro process is too fast for us to kind of resolve with our eyes. So uh, the uh, imagination was that when the four hooves are lifted from the ground during the galloping phase, the legs of the horse are spread apart. Now, is this really the way the horse gallops or not? To understand it, you need to do a time-resolved spectroscopy. And like every experiment, you, you need a sponsor. You need money to perform it. And the, the sponsor was Leland Stanford, the founder of Stanford University, but also one of the richest men in the States in the 19th century, who gave to this photographer, Edward Mybridge, the task to develop a flash photography with the time uh, which were able to freeze the motion of the horse during the galloping phase. This was a quite adventurous task. If you Google Edward Mybridge, I don't have the time to explain what happened to him, but you see it would be very interesting. He even went to jail, then in the end he got out. And, and, and in 1878, he managed to shoot this very famous sequence of pictures on the Palo Alto racetrack, where you can really see that the galloping phase of the horse is completely different from the previous picture. Now the legs are not spread apart, but are rather close together. And if you put it together, these uh, um, uh, snapshots that are taken with a one millisecond, so 10 to the minus three second time resolution, you get uh, one of the first movies in history where you can really resolve the motion of the horse. And this was done then with many different uh, animals. And uh, uh, now if you look at a 20th century painting, you see that now the painter uh, uh, shows a correct representation. Now the question is how, can you bring this technique from the macro world to the micro world? Can you do the same with a molecule? Can you make a movie of the evolution of a molecule? And what, what would you need to uh, resolve molecular dynamics? And here, I like to bring the argument of Ahmed Zewail, who received the Nobel Prize in 1991 for femtochemistry, who made an extremely simple argument. He said, let's take uh, the approximate speeds at which atoms move within molecules, which is 10 to the three meters per second. Let's take uh, the approximate distances of atoms within molecules, which is 10 to the minus 10 uh, meters. So immediately you get a time scale so, so you need a time scale on the order of, if you divide 10 to the minus 10 by 10 to the 3, you get 10 to the minus 13 seconds. So you get to the femtosecond time scale. And uh, um, so actually you can find this in the Nobel lecture of Ahmed Zewail, this argument. Now, so you see that naturally, if you want to look at the motions of atoms uh, within molecules, you need femtosecond pulses. Now, the problem is how to generate such pulses. Now, before the invention of the laser, the shortest event that could be man, controlled by men was the Kerr shutter, and it had a time resolution of approximately 10 nanoseconds. Still, it was very useful because uh, it, uh, um, in 1967, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Norris and Porter for flash photolysis. There's a lot of dynamics taking place over longer time scale. But now, if you want to look at shorter time scale, now, the laser really uh, introduced a, a, a breakthrough because after the invention, already in the 60s, 
with the uh, discovery of mode locking, it was possible to generate pulses shorter than 10 picosecond. And then there was a race to generate pulses of, with a duration of just a few femtoseconds. Already in 1986, uh, it was possible to generate six femtosecond pulses using dye laser technology. But then uh, the technology changed to solid state, Thai sapphire, and nowadays even terbium laser. But again, there was um, very even faster progress. And again, one can nowadays generate in the visible pulses with a duration of maybe four or three femtoseconds. So you, you can generate pulses of a few femtoseconds. So you may ask yourself, this was a, an, an enormous improvement, but why since approximately 30 years, the pulse durations are more or less the same? And the reason is very simple. There is a fundamental limit in the pulse width, which is the optical cycle. So if you consider a visible light pulse, this is an electromagnetic field oscillating at uh, the, the wavelength at, at the period of light. And if you again do a very simple calculation, if you take a visible uh, red light pulse with a wavelength of 600 nanometer, the period is two femtoseconds. So visible light oscillates with a period of maybe two, three femtoseconds. So you can generate pulses that are called few optical cycle pulses that contain just a few periods of oscillations of uh, the electromagnetic field. And this is more or less the limit because you cannot go below the optical cycle. Now, of course, uh, if you change the wavelength, if you go to the XUV or to the X-rays, then of course the periods becomes much shorter. And indeed, there is a whole field of uh, uh, science uh, of uh, physics uh, which is uh, atto second physics, which uses the XUV pulses to um, generate much shorter pulses. The current record is on the order of 50 atto seconds. But uh, uh, of course, these pulses are used now with completely different photon energies. They are in the XUV. They are typically used uh, to study not uh, vibrational dynamics, but electronic wave packets within atoms and molecules. Now, uh, what is the fundamental technique that we can use to look at this process? The simplest yet most powerful technique is called pump probe spectroscopy. So in pump probe, we have a sample. There is a first pump pulse, uh, the pump pulse, which is resonant with the absorption of the sample and excites the system. And then you come with a time delayed probe pulse, which measures the differential transmission changes. So the transmission with uh, the um, pump on minus the transmission with the pump blocked, normalized. Now, uh, the beauty of this technique is that it is very general. So you can use for pump and probe any color, any frequency from the visible to the mid IR to the X rays. So you can combine them as you wish. And here, the time resolution, uh, the detector is not fast. So you don't need a fast detector in this experiment because what you want to detect is the energy of the probe. So the, if you measure the transmission, you, you count the number of photons. What really gives the time resolution is the delay between the pump and the probe. And this can be controlled very precisely by a delay line. Now, uh, again, a very tutorial. Uh, if you consider a two-level system, what kind of uh, signals can you observe in a pump probe experiment? So um, if you come with a pump pulse, uh, which promotes uh, some molecules, for example, from the ground to an excited state. Now, if your probe has the same frequency as the pump, you observe a photo bleaching. So you are uh, de decreasing the absorption. So because you have raised some molecules from the ground to the excited state, so you have an increased transmission. So a positive differential transmission signal. On the other end, if you now tune your probe pulse, to a, an energy that is uh, uh, lower than, than the band gap, what you can observe is a stimulated emission. So now you are really stimulating an emission from the excited state. So what you are doing is you're really uh, having an optical gain in, in, in your sample. Uh, OK, now um, the third kind of signal is a photo-induced absorption. Now you have created an excited state, and now you can absorb from this state to higher order states. Now, uh, here I'm showing uh, my friend Christian Manzoni, who really, um, uh, so, so what we do uh, to generate the short pulses is uh, um, the so-called uh, optical parametric amplifier, or OPA, which is a nonlinear uh, um, uh, 
uh, optical device, which allows us to generate a tunable uh, pulses with very short duration, with a duration of a few optical cycles, let's say 10 femtoseconds or shorter. Now, I don't go into the technical detail of how we can generate such pulses, but I just show you some results of pulses that we produce in our labs. So here you see the wavelength from the visible to the, uh, to the infrared. And uh, you see these are broadband spectra, because of course, to get a short pulse, you need the broadband spectrum. And here are the reconstructed pulse uh, prof in temporal profiles. These are obtained by uh, no different uh, pulse char characterization techniques, such as frog or spider. So you see all these pulses that, that go from the visible to the um, uh, infrared have a duration of less than 10 femtoseconds. So now we can use one of these pulses as a pump, another as a probe, and we can initiate a dynamics and uh, um, look at uh, the um, uh, with the probe at, at what happens in real time. So this is our high time resolution pump probe system where we have two sources of short pulses, uh, one for the pump and the other for the probe. There is a delay line that controls the delay and you detect the probe spectrum as a function of delay and, and of probe wavelength. Now let's come to the first example, which is looking at uh, the primary event of vision, which is isomerization of rhodopsin. Now, uh, what are um, opsin or retinal proteins? These are uh, proteins that are contained in many different living organisms that have a structure of, uh, uh, these are transmembrane protein that consists of seven alpha helixes, you can see them here, which form a pocket. And inside the pocket, there is the chromophore. So there is the only part of the molecule that absorbs visible light, which is retinal. You can see it here. You will see it better in, uh, in the following slides. Now, uh, these proteins are found in many living organisms and can be divided in two types, the so-called archaeal or bacterial uh, opsin and the visual opsin proteins. Uh, in both cases, uh, the, after light absorption, you, you have a photoisomerization, so a change, a structural change. And in particular, in the bacterial opsins, you go from the all trans to the 13 cis configuration, while in the visual opsins, uh, you, have a, you, you start from the 11 cis and you go to the all trans. Now, uh, if you look at rhodopsin, which is the visual pigment inside the retina, now looking at the eye, of course, the eye is a lens that makes an image on, on the retina. And uh, you, you, you find the two kinds of photoreceptors that are contained in the cones for color vision and the rods for, for night vision. Now, in all these, uh, you find the uh, so-called opsin proteins, which will be conopsins in the cones and rhodopsins in the rods. And they all have this structure that I was showing you before. There is a protein pocket, you can see it here, these ribbons, that contains the light sensing chromophore, the retina. Now, what happens when a photon strikes this protein? Here I'm showing a, a kind of simplified cartoon. You can recognize again the, um, the, the opsin protein, the, po the protein pocket. And here you can see now better the retinal, which is 11 cis. Here you, you, you have a top view. So when a photon strikes with a very high efficiency of about 65%, there is a photoisomerization and you go to the all trans. So you see now this change in, in the shape of, of the retina forces also the, the protein pocket to, to, to enlarge, to accommodate for this new um, shape. And uh, what results, you can see here, this cytoplasmic tail, which is coiled, which now becomes uh, with uh, the uh, isomerization process, you can see here, it will become uncoiled, sorry. It will become uncoiled, okay? And this triggers uh, the, uh, the, the, the signal to uh, the, the electrical signal. But now what we are really looking after is the very fast event of this uh, cis-trans isomerization. So you see this signal being formed very quickly. And this demonstrates that indeed the, the, the whole isomerization is completed in 200 femtoseconds. Now, the question is, can we really follow this process in, in real time? And to do this, we can have this kind of sketch 
of the electronic potential energy surfaces, you see you have your reactant and you have your product. And in between, you have the conical intersection. Now, what happens if I generate a wave packet in the excited state of the reactor with an ultra short pulse? So according to what I told you before, I should expect a stimulated emission. Now you see that this band gap uh, will shift very rapidly to will decrease very quickly because now I'm approaching the conical intersection. So I would expect a stimulated emission very quickly shifting to the uh, red. Then I will go through the conical intersection and now the wave packet will be on the, on the ground state. So it cannot emit anymore because it's on a ground state, but it will absorb. And this excited state absorption will again be initially at low energies and progressively will shift to higher energies. So I should expect a very characteristic pattern of stimulated emission shifting to longer wavelengths, then disappearing, and then a photoinduced absorption shifting to um, a shorter wavelength until you reach the photoproduct. And all this is completed in 200 femtoseconds. So you really need a short, high time resolution. Not only that, but you only need to, you also need tunability because you need to be able to follow the wave packet as it evolves and as its signatures shift in wavelength. So to do this, uh, with the help, of course, of Christian Manzoni, we, uh, we, we develop the, uh, these very short pulses that are, uh, say, 10 femtosecond pulse that initiates the, um, the process uh, that uh, is absorbed by the molecule and brings the molecule to the excited state this is the pump. And then we have two probes, uh, a seven femtosecond probe uh, in the visible and the 10 fem 13 femtosecond probe in the near infrared. And by combining these pulses, we can now follow really the full, the full process. Now, here is uh, the, uh, if you look in the visible, we are substantially reproducing what was already seen by this seminal paper. So we, we see the wave packet uh, moving to the um, arriving in, in the photo ground state of the photo product. And we see this photo induced absorption, which is formed in about 200 femtoseconds. You see, it's really, an, it's a not exponential rise, but it's almost an abrupt rise because it's really, this is really the, the wave packet dynamics. Now, if we go uh, to uh, the near infrared, we see, this character, and this is a work by Dario Polli. This is a characteristic signature of uh, a stimulated emission. You can see it here, the blue code means stimulated emission. Then uh, the stimulated emission shifts quickly to the red, to longer wavelengths. Then it disappears, and then it reappears after about 100 femtoseconds with a change sign, and it's a photoinduced absorption, which then very quickly shifts, shifts to the uh, blue. So this is really what we expect. First, a stimulated emission from the excited state. You go through the conical intersection, so the wave packet disappears, and then it reappears on the ground state, and now it's a photoinduced absorption that quickly shifts to, to the blue. But now, if you put together all the visible and the infrared data, then you get really the full picture, which is very easy to understand, in my opinion. So you see stimulated emission, wave packet very quickly evolving to longer wavelength. In 80 femtoseconds, you reach the conical intersection. And then the wave packet jumps through this conical intersection to the uh, ground state of the photo product. And again, very quickly, the wave packet relaxes until after 200 femtoseconds, it is on the, on the bottom of, of this wave packet. And there it remains for a very long time. So uh, this is really uh, the capability of ultra short pulses to track this very fundamental process, which is what happens in our retina every time that a photon strikes uh, our eye. So now uh, to uh, uh, better to understand this experiment, I turned to a collaboration with my friend Marco Garavelli at Bologna University, who does a very sophisticated quantum chemistry uh, modeling of, of, of the um, of the photon views dynamics, and he uses what is called the QMMM approach, where you cannot treat with quantum mechanics the, the full protein because it would be too much. You, you, but you take just a, a small portion, which is a, a region of the molecule directly involved in the photochemistry. You treat it at very high quantum mechanical level. But then you consider all the remaining environment, including a protein environment and solvent molecules. 
at a lower molecular mechanics, uh, like classical level, which is however very important to get an agreement with experiments. And actually this is the simulation of, uh, uh, by left, what he does is he really uh, measures, uh, he runs hundreds of trajectories, he puts the molecule in the excited state and he runs trajectory solving Schrodinger equation and then he averages and the result is in really good agreement with our uh, um, uh, experimental. So, so, so the theory can really reproduce very well all the expected signatures. And I will show you other examples of these in the remaining time. Now, uh, let me uh, go to a second example of conical intersection, which is related to the ultra fast photoprotection mechanism in DNA. Now, of course, if you look at uh, um, uh, opsin, uh, it is made to interact with light and the, the, the purpose of the absorption is really to induce this uh, isomerization and, and, and trigger the electrical signal. On the other hand, the DNA is not made to interact with light. DNA is made to store information. So in principle, DNA doesn't have a direct uh, kind of uh, uh, photochemistry, useful photochemistry. However, uh, if you look at uh, the uh, four uh, uh, nucleotides, which are made by nucleobase, sugar and phosphate groups, uh, plus a fifth, which is uracy, which is contained in, in the RNA. Uh, so they all have these aromatic rings and all the nucleobases of DNA have a strong absorption in the ultraviolet range between let's say 250 and 300 nanometer. So, uh, because th these are like benzene rings and, and this is a very strong absorption. So you now can think of put up absorbing energy and this is a high energy photon because it's on the order of maybe 4.5, five electron volt. So you put this energy in a molecule and you can undergo photochemistry. And in fact, this is what happens. So for example, here I'm taking, a, 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 and this photochemistry leads to damage. So one classical example is you, you have two uh, thymine nucleobases after absorption of UV light, they form a dimer. So they, 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 they form a covalent bond and this disrupts the double helix and this causes an error in the, uh, in the replication of the information. So in DNA, any photochemistry is, 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 is a damage, is, is dangerous. So how can we uh, prevent these photochemical processes? We, in this case, we can again use conical intersection, but not so a very fast process of dissipation of uh, energy conversion, but not to go to a product, but to go back to the, to the ground state. So I am uh, the, the photo in this case, the conical intersection is really used to photoprotect, to dissipate as fast as possible the energy in order to avoid uh, photo damage. And so to study these processes, um, it took me uh, quite some time to generate a really short pulses in the ultraviolet, which for technical reason is not easy. Now we can generate uh, um, uh, sub 20 femtosecond pulses uh, tunable across the whole uh, ultraviolet range. Now, um, here I'm showing Rocio Borrego Varillas, who really did most of these experiments and worked very hard for several years uh, at uh, this setup. So here is essentially, uh, we can have a, a very short uh, ultraviolet uh, pump pulse, which uh, uh, triggers the, the photoprocess, which is absorbed by the nucleobase. And then uh, we have a, a white light probe that, that measures the differential transmission. Now, uh, here I'm showing, I want to compare uh, the two nucleobases. The simplest one, uh, or these are actually two uh, nu nucleosides, is uh, uridine. So uridine is the nucleoside of uracil, so one of the nucleotides in, in RNA. And this is, uh, um, in, in this nucle um, nucleoside, we have an extremely fast excited state dynamics. So here I'm showing you the experiment. And here and now, uh, Blue means stimulated emission from the excited state, and uh, uh, red means photoinduced absorption. So what do we see? Here we see uh, we are uh, we see a, a stimulated emission from the excited state, and also a photoinduced absorption from the excited state, and they both disappear very quickly uh, within approximately 100 150 femtosecond. So this is again um, um, a signature of a ballistic. A wave packet motion 
to the conical intersection with the ground state, which is reached in 100 femtoseconds. So in this nucleoside, when you absorb um, uh, the, the UV energy, you dissipate it extremely quickly within, say, 100, 150 femtoseconds to the ground state. Now, here again is the theory by Marco Garavelli. You see that th this is not a fit. This is really an ab initio simulation by, by averaging hundreds of trajectories. And you see that they can really capture all the signals, like the photon induced absorption, the stimulated emission. Uh, uh, so everything is uh, captured quite uh, accurately by, by, this, by, by their advanced uh, methods. Now, the interesting thing is that if you look at this nucleoside, you find here there is a, a hydrogen atom. And uh, uh, so this is the aromatic ring. And so, so what promotes this very fast decay is the so-called packering mode. So is this deformation mode of the, of, of the aromatic ring. Now, if you go from uridine to methyl uridine, which means that you change the hydrogen with a methyl group, it is also called a thymidine. You see, this is the only change. Now, the dynamics changes completely. So uh, you see here the excited, the stimulated emission for the excited state uh, lives much longer. And it takes about one picosecond to reach the conical intersection uh, with uh, the uh, ground state. And uh, uh, you can, uh, um, again, with the theory, you can reproduce very well, very accurately. Uh, the, um, this longer time scale. And you can have an intuitive explanation of why it becomes uh, uh, much longer. Because now, if you need to, to do this packering of the ring, you need to deform the ring. Having here a methyl provides a much larger inertia, which therefore slows down the, the dynamics. Now, you can see all these oscillations. These are not noise of the measurements. These are really coherent uh, wave packets uh, that we are exciting, that we are generating with our short pulse in the excited state. So essentially, our pump pulse is much shorter than the vibrational periods. So we impulsively excite uh, coherent vibrations of the molecules. And actually, we can study these uh, impulsively excited vibrations. Uh, here you can see, uh, if you do a Fourier transform uh, of, of, of these oscillations, you see one mode around uh, um, seven. Uh, uh, around the 750 wave number. And you see that in uridine, uh, um, since the excited state lives much longer, it is more quickly damped th than in thymidine. And you also see that uh, um, this is a really as a zero of amplitude around the peak of the, of, of the stimulated emission, because it's essentially a wave packet created in the excited state that, that oscillates back and forth in the excited state, the potential energy surface. And we can really, um, this is the in-plane breathing mode, and you can really reproduce it quite well also with theory. Um, okay, so in the end, you get by these uh, um, uh, experiments, you, you, you can get, uh, an, and especially by the combination with theory, you can really get an energy landscape of the excited state of these nucleobases. And, and you can also uh, understand the, the, the activation pathways. So the first one, the uridine, has an almost ballistic motion. It's like really sliding the wave packet down uh, this potential energy surface until it reaches the conical intersection, and then it goes back to the ground state. While the thymidine has a, a much longer, about uh, from, goes from 100 femtosecond to one picosecond uh, excited state lifetime. So the slope of the potential energy surface is different. And due to this, it has the opportunity to explore different deactivation pathways, which unfortunately we cannot directly observe in our experiment, but which are found in the theory. And it is a fact that one of the most frequent damages, photochemic, damaging photochemical reactions in DNA is the formation of timing dimers, because simply this longer lifetime gives the, um, the, the time in more opportunity to, uh, to induce a photochemical reaction to, to form a photoproduct, which is in this case a damage. Okay, now in the last uh, couple of minutes of my presentation, I want to discuss uh, opportunities of studying uh, conical intersections using uh, uh, X-ray pulse, uh, in particular with free electron lasers. So what I've shown you so far is uh, with visible pulses, which of course 
give a very rich uh, information and are also experiments that can be done in your lab uh, under your full control. However, now there are coming online many different X-ray free electron lasers, which are sources that generate very short femtosecond pulses, uh, tunable, let's say, from the XUV to the hard X-ray region. So you have x -fail. This is x -fail in Hamburg. You see it's three kilometers long. The accelerator it starts in Hamburg and it ends up in Schenefeld, which is another town outside Hamburg. And, uh, uh, but there is also, of course, LCLS in Stanford. There is uh, PSI, there's uh, Paul Scherer in Switzerland. So, so there's many of these sources. Now, what, what can you do with these sources that you cannot do, of course, with the visible? So you, you can do uh, several things. So first of all, you can use, uh, uh, if you use the soft X-ray pulses, uh, you can probe element-specific transitions from core levels. Or with hard X-ray pulses, you can do diffraction, and then you can really get uh, uh, what is called the molecular movie, looking at the, uh, at the structural evolution of the molecule uh, with, uh, um, uh, with, with time. Now, I only have one minute, so uh, let me just uh, give you one example, which is another prototypical photochemical process, which is isomerization of azobenzene. Uh, this is a, 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 a trans-cis photoisomerization associated with the change of the conformation of the central nitrogen double bonds. Now, we have studied this uh, isomerization. Uh, this is a two-step process. You go from the bright excited state to a dark state, and then from there, you can, do, you can go to the uh, cis isomer. Now, we have studied this with ultra-fast spectroscopy, and again, a, a collaboration with Marco Garavelli this is, uh, these are our experiments of pump probe, and this is the theory. And uh, we can uh, reproduce the time, th this two step process from a bright to a dark state and then to the isomer with uh, um, a time constant of approximately 50 femtoseconds. However, what you can do really uh, with uh, element specific probing is you can really follow uh, the, the pathways of, of the isomerization, and in particular, um, how the different bending and torsional modes, they promote the isomerization. And these, uh, there are now um, by Francesco Sagatta, uh, who is a um, postdoc of Marco Garavelli. If you look at near edge X-ray absorption fine structure, you can really get some very characteristic signatures of the different uh, coupling to a different modes. And so you can get a really full picture of this process, but also of course, uh, even more interesting processes in, in other biomolecules. So this brings me to my conclusions. So uh, I hope I showed you that conical intersections preside over excited state process in biomolecules and lead either to efficient energy storage or to efficient energy dissipation, depending on the cases. And you can really look use ultra fast spectroscopy um, uh, for looking at this uh, process, for example, the primary event of vision in rhodopsin isomerization or ultra fast photoprotection mechanism in DNA. And then there are plenty of opportunities to visualize in gra even greater detail the dynamics of conical intersection using X ray free electron lasers. So this will be future work, hopefully. And of course, uh, let me thank uh, all my group in Milano who really uh, contributed uh, to, to this work. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Julio, for this very, very nice talk. Um, let's start with questions from the audience. I think I will ask you to talk into this microphone so that people on Zoom will also hear it. So that was, that was wonderful, Julio, thank you. Uh, I have a quick question about the oscillations you saw in the signals for the, uh, nuclear, bases. the, the nuclear bases, yeah. So you, you, on the one hand, paint a picture of the wave packet like moving through the conical intersection and and dissipating the energy yes but on the other hand you see these oscillations that point to a a motion of the a recurrence of the wave packet right well let's say that uh, um, there are several um, so, so these are frequencies uh, let's say um, so so what i see is uh, these are high frequency motions so the period is on the order of, uh, uh, so it's 800 wave number, so the period is on the order of probably 40 femtoseconds. 
And these are not necessarily the modes that lead to the conical intersection. So you must think of these potential energy surfaces as a really multi-dimensional. Right, so right. I can only draw a limited number of... Uh, so you, you, you can think of this wave packet that oscillates and meanwhile it evolves I along see. the isomerization coordinate. And it's interesting to see that uh, if you go really to... Okay, to uh, if you compare the two molecules, the uh, uridine and the methyluridine, you see that there is a really a clear... Okay, you can see it here. So um, this is that the uridine is damped in probably 150 femtoseconds because the wave packet dissipated very quickly. While in the methyl, in the thymidine or methyluridine, it lasts almost uh, up to 700 femtoseconds because in this case the excited state lives, lives much longer. Okay, so it's motion in the wave packet, but not along the coordinate. Not along the coordinate that this yeah. guy Okay, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful talk. Um, you said something interesting about the description of, of this phenomenon, both in terms of a quantum dynamics and a classical contribution. Yes, yes. Can you say something about if there is a uh, separation of the time scales of these two descriptions? Do you need both classical and quantum all the times or the classical uh, kicks in uh, after a certain delay? Or well, well, let's say ideally you probably you would like to solve the Schrodinger equation for the full uh, protein, but this is uh, impossible. And uh, um, so what, what my friends, theory, I'm not a theoretician myself, so what, what my friends theoretician tell me is that they can, they, they use these methods uh, very high level for solving the Schrodinger equation. But then the, the bigger is the system, the more expensive becomes the method. So what they do is they consider, let's say a part of the molecule, and then they do a very sophisticated quantum treatment, uh, high level, uh, um, solution of the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation. Now, the remaining, uh, some people say, okay, I forget about the rest and I only do this. But then uh, there is um, uh, not an accurate uh, um, uh, representation of the experimental data. For example, if you take the, 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 the chromophore, this retina, and you take it out of the protein and you put it, for example, in a solvent, then it becomes completely different, the dynamics. Everything becomes different, the absorption. So you really need to consider the environment. And, in, and, and to, to treat uh, in a manageable way the environment, they use uh, like molecular classical mechanics. Right. So basically, it's to account for dissipation channels. Exactly. Yes, and and also for the, yeah for the for the whole, for example, water molecules, everything that is outside this 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 nucleus that is like quantum. Okay. More questions in the audience. Thank you, Giulio. Just a quick question. Um, I don't know if I got it, but uh, here it appears that uh, uh, uridine may be more stable than timidine, no? Because it lasts long, it lasts uh, shorter. shorter the, the, yes. But in, in nature, you would expect the other way around, no? Because uh, the DNA should be more stable than the, the RNA. Well, um, okay. So, so let, me te let me tell you that um, the story is much more complicated. And now uh, I I've tried to give like here a simple message, but in, in reality, so first of all, um, when you, now we have started our study with the, the building blocks, which are the nuclear bases. When you start to go to the, to the full double chain or even to um, oligonucleotides, like a sequence of nuclear bases, then uh, um, the, the situation becomes much more complicated. So you start to form excitons, which are delocalized over multiple, um, over, over multiple, uh, say, bases. So uh, you, you can have charge. You have more or less what happens in polymers. You have charge transfer, charge separated state, which you, of course you, you you cannot have in a single nuclear base. So. Um, I think to really fully understand the stability, you need to go to, to repeat the study on, on the full, on the full, let's say, double helix, and then you will get a much more complicated picture. Okay, we also have two questions online, so let me try to read this. Uh, how do you generate tunable 20 femtosecond pulses in the UV, and what is the highest energy you can go to okay so i so first of all in these experiments i don't need the high energies which is in a way good for me because actually if i add if i pump this sample with high energies what i do is i generate hydrated electrons in water so i ionize the water by multi-photon absorption and then i generate a lot of spurious signals and in fact 
this is anybody who does spectroscopy on DNA, the first thing the referees ask you is if you generate hydrated electrons. And to answer no, you need to lower your energy as much as you can. So I need a few tens of nanojoules. And the way to do it, there are ways to generate high energy ultraviolet pulses, for example, by achromatic phase matching, which is, however, quite complicated. So I do a very simple uh, second harmonic of the broadband pulse in the visible. And, uh, and I, I use a very thin crystal to generate uh, the, the very short pulses. And in this case, I'm limited to a few tens of nanojoules. But in case you need higher energies, there are other tricks that, that you can increase the energy. But here I prefer to have it as simple as possible because I don't need the high energies in any case. Okay, very good. I think we'll stop here. Uh, so let's thank Julio again. Thank you. And I will start introducing the next speaker uh, who will be online. So I hope this will be setting up, uh, it's being set up uh, right now. Um, looks like it. Um, so the next speaker is uh, Tobias Kampwad. He is a professor at W3 of experimental physics at the uh, Freie Universität in Berlin, Germany. Um, and his research topics include the study and control of ultrafast processes of complex solids, towards dynamics, towards transport of electrons and spins and nanostructures. And at interfaces, nonlinear terrace spectroscopy of solvents, towards radiation, generation, steering, and interaction with tailored matter. Um, so I hope Tobias can hear us. Yes, I, I can. I hope someone will project it onto our screen here in the room. Yeah. Okay, it's on the way. Good. I want to take this occasion to say uh, yeah, we apologize for the for the technical inconvenience uh, during the the break so we fix uh, the thing that we could share the the screen. So. The, the hybrid uh, thing is always a challenge. It's yeah, always easier yeah. if either everybody's in the room or everybody's online. But we took up the challenge to do the hybrid, uh, but that seems to be working. Cool. Yes, uh, we can see. Klaas Jan, can you hear me? Uh, yes, is the, is the sound fine? We will. Uh, need to increase the volume here in the room, but we will do that uh, while you while you start. Yes, I'm sitting next it's... to the speaker, Tobias, so I'm totally fine. M Misha Bon can hear you, so we're good. <laughs> now, please please start. Thank you. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction, Klaas Jan, and also many thanks to you and the ICN team to put this workshop together. I'm very sorry that I cannot be there in person. Uh, Barcelona is always worth a journey. So in this in this talk, I will uh, talk about terahertz emission spectroscopy and how you can use it to gain insights into spin and charge transport and uh, also with possible applications. Before I start, please let me thank you, uh, the people that have contributed. It's uh, the terahertz physics group here in Berlin. And uh, we also had uh, excellent samples from the groups of Matthias Kloy in Mainz, Markus Münzenberg in Greifswald, and also the groups, uh, group of Georg Woltersdorf and Halle uh, in Germany. And finally, if you do spectroscopy, of course, you would also like to understand what you observe. And here we had a great help by theorists, Peter Oppenair in Uppsala in Sweden, and also Pete Brauer here at the Free University. And this already brings me to the topic of this talk, namely spintronics. So in spintronics, the goal is to extend normal uh, electronic devices, which are based on the charge of the electron by the spin degree of freedom of the electron. And if you want to do this, you need to at least implement three elementary operations. And uh, I show them here to you. So the first one is you would like to be able to turn spins around from up to down. So this means, for example, changing a bit on a hard disk from zero to one. And if you want to do this, you need, of course, torque. Uh, second, you also would like to be able to transport spin information through space. So this means you need to generate so-called spin currents. And finally, of course, you would like to know what you've done. And that's why you should be able to detect the spin dynamics. And the goal here is actually we should read, reach the speed of other information carriers. And this speed is already in the terahertz range. And such information carriers are, for example, photons and fibers, which are already routinely realized at uh, more than 10 terahertz per second. But even Electrons in a field effect transistor have already been demonstrated to a cross cutoff frequencies of one terahertz. So this means we would like to apply uh, or we would like to push these operations to the terahertz range. And we would like to do this by using 
terahertz electromagnetic fields in a pulsed manner. And here you see such a terahertz electromagnetic pulse has a duration of about one picosecond. The center frequency is one terahertz. And uh, this means that the free space wavelength is about 300 micrometers. And this puts the terahertz range in between the realms of optics, where you talk about micrometer and submicrometer wavelengths, and electronics, where wavelengths can easily reach uh, centimeters or even meters. But the big question is now, is this actually a good idea to combine terahertz radiation with spintronics? And I think, yes, this is a good idea because of the following reasons. First of all, we would like to uh, be able to test the speed of central spintronic effects and reveal their initial steps. For example, the spin Hall effect, spin Zewig effect, N isotropic magnetoresistance, SMR, GMR, TMR, and so on and so on. You see there's a really a lot of these effects, which are very important in the field of spintronics. And it would be very important to learn how they actually function uh, on their initial time scales. And uh, by doing so, we hope to discover new physics and also develop new methods. And there's good reason for this optimism because the terahertz range coincides with many fundamental modes of condensed matter. For example, with intraband transport of electrons, electrons and semiconductors and, uh, and metals often collide with obstacles like, like uh, phonons at terahertz rates, yeah, which uh, puts intraband transport into the terahertz range. Then we have phonons, they also naturally occur at uh, terahertz frequencies, at least for optical phonons. And finally, you also have um, wave-like deviations of spins from their equilibrium direction, so-called magnons. And in antiferromagnets, the frequencies of these magnons, these spin precessions, can also, also easily um, extend into the terahertz range. And finally, by doing so, we hope to get also rewards for terahertz photonics, for example, develop new sources of terahertz radiation modulators. And this is, of course, useful for spectroscopy and imaging, as shown here by this example from the lab of Ewan Henry in Exeter. And uh, well, the question is now, since this is a bit uh, a tutorial like talk, how can we actually do spectroscopy with terahertz pulses? And there's actually three flavors of terahertz spectroscopy, the first one of which I'd like to call ultra fast and ultra fast ohmmeter. So we have a sample and uh, its conductivity sigma is varying as a function of time. And you can easily measure this by taking a terahertz pulse, sending it through the sample and detecting the traversed terahertz field. This will tell you about the instantaneous conductivity of the sample. And I guess we will hear more about this mode of terahertz spectroscopy by Misha Bonn very shortly. And uh, you can also crank up these terahertz fields and then you turn the terahertz fields from the role of an observer and to the role of uh, basically uh, a um, perturbation, a well-defined perturbation of the sample. And this brings us to the realm of terahertz high field physics. There people often deal with fields of megavolts per centimeter in electric field and Tesla in terms of magnetic field. And this is something you can use to drive electrons to very large uh, amplitudes in terms of energy and velocity. The same with phonons and of course also with spins. And more about that will be, I guess, uh, uh, explained by Andrea Kivilia uh, later today uh, in, this, in this symposium. And finally, and this is the uh, topic of this talk, you can also use terahertz radiation as a kind of ultra fast ampermeter. For example, imagine that you have a molecular complex as shown here, and by some reason, there is an ultra fast charge transfer from B minus to A plus. And this is something you can easily measure with terahertz spectroscopy, because what you see here, this charge transfer is nothing but an ultra fast uh, charge current. And this will emit a terahertz pulse which is something you can measure by ultra fast methods. And by calculating back from the terahertz field, you can learn about uh, the, the current as a function of time of this ultra fast charge transfer. And in this talk, I would like to discuss the possibility of how this uh, ultra fast ampermeter can be extended from charge currents to spin currents. And uh, there will be also more about this later today by Chiara Ciccarelli. Okay, so how can we do this? So we would like to have spin transport. So we would like to transport spins through space. And to do so, it would be great to have something like a spin battery. And here I present you an idea of a possible spin battery. So how does this work? We take a ferromagnet, uh, for example, iron. It has a well-defined magnetization because many spins 
are ordered in a parallel fashion. And uh, well, when we have this magnet at room temperature and we heat it up, we know that the magnetization will be uh, destroyed. It will decrease. So you can also um, express this in more simple words by saying upon heating, the electrons of the ferromagnet wish to release spin angular momentum. And locally, this happens by transfer of spin angular momentum to the crystal lattice. And uh, well, this brings us to an idea. Let's also allow the electrons to release their spin angular momentum, not only to the crystal lattice, but also to an adjacent layer of a material. And in this way, we should be able to launch spin transport. And well, how can we implement this and show it that this actually works this way? Well, we again take our ferromagnetic layer uh, with a magnetization shown here by this red arrow. And then we put on top of this, for example, a non-magnetic material like platinum, a heavy metal. And by doing so, you also break the symmetry. That means you define an arrow, which could be, for example, useful for the spin transport that we envision. Now we heat this stack as fast as we can with a femtosecond laser pulse. Now the ferromagnet would like to get rid of spin angular momentum, and it will hopefully do this by ultra fast spin transport. That this principle works is actually not new. It was already shown in numerous works before. But the goal in uh, our lab was, well, how can we measure the spin current by using uh, spintronic principles? And uh, how can we do this quasi-electrically? And, uh, and a very nice uh, principle in spintronics is they convert the spin current into a charge current. And this can be done by the so-called inverse spin hall effect. So how does this work? The spin polarized electrons enter the non-magnetic metal, for example, platinum, this is a heavy metal. And in a heavy metal, you have a lot of spin orbit coupling and spin orbit coupling acts like an uh, effective magnetic field on a spin polarized electron. And for spin polarized electrons with spin up, the electrons will be deflected upwards in the heavy metal by this effective magnetic field, whereas spin down electrons will be deflected downwards. And since we have a ferromagnet here with a majority of spin up electrons, we end up with a net charge current in this upward direction. But this is something one can easily measure by just using an ampere meter. But it's clear that an ampere meter has a strict cutoff in terms of frequency. Uh, if you invest a lot of money in a very expensive oscilloscope, you can go up to 50 gigahertz, but we expect here bandwidths of tens of terahertz because our femtosecond pump pulse is yeah, very short and has a, a bandwidth of uh, almost 50 terahertz. So how can we measure the terahertz current? Of course, we do it by terahertz emission spectroscopy. When we throw away all these contacts here, we realize that this is actually a, a time-dependent charge current. So it's like a superposition of many harmonic Hertzian dipoles. And as such, this charge current will emit a terahertz electromagnetic pulse. And that's something we can measure by uh, something that is called electro-optic sampling. And uh, the mission is now clear. Let's take such ferromagnetic metallic or normal metal uh, two layer stacks, excite them with a femtosecond laser pulse, and let's measure the emitted terahertz radiation. And the samples, we use polycrystalline films, so nothing special. And the pump pulses are from a Thai sapphire oscillator with a quite short width of 10 femtoseconds. So let's take a quick look at how this is implemented in the laboratory. So what you have here is a lens through which the, the pump beam comes. The pump beam excites here the spintronic sample. You see it's almost transparent, so it's a very thin metal film. It hits the sample. And this will hopefully then emit terahertz radiation, as shown in yellow here. The terahertz radiation is reflected here, finally travels to this parabolic mirror. And uh, the terahertz radiation is then focused into this crystal here, which is zinc telluride. It's an electro-optic material. So this means the terahertz electric field will change the refractive index of the material. And this allows us actually to measure the terahertz electric field as a function of time. And this can be done by a probe beam or a sampling beam, which is uh, propagating collinearly with the terahertz pulse. It interacts with the terahertz electric field. And uh, as a consequence of that, the probe pulse becomes elliptically polarized. And the ellipticity is proportional to the electric field, the instantaneous electric field of the terahertz pulse. And this allows us actually to detect the electric field of the terahertz pulse step by step as a function of time. 
Okay, now let's take a look at typical terror signals that we obtain in our lab. And this is shown here. So here on the y-axis, you have the terror signal, which is roughly proportional to the terahertz electric field. And here we have the time axis and picoseconds. And uh, a sample, we use iron platinum, uh, platinum on top of iron. And we put it into a magnetic field of 20 millitesla to put the, the ferromagnetic film in a well-defined single domain magnetic state. And then we obtain this signal here. And this is already great. So this means we have a signal. And uh, the question is, of course, does this really arise from the magnetism of the material? And to check this, we just turn the magnetic field, the external magnetic field around. The sample uh, reverses its magnetization, and so does also the terahertz electromagnetic pulse. This is already very encouraging. It shows that the signal here has a magnetic origin. OK, let's do more checks. So here it's again the, the signal of our iron platinum sample. Now let's grow the sample in reverse order. Now the spin current should flow from the right to the left. And accordingly, the signal should again change polarity. And indeed, it does. It fully reverses. Finally, let's omit the platinum from our sample. Then actually, the signal should drop a lot. And indeed, indeed, again, it does. So it shows that the presence of the platinum layer is very important to get terahertz radiation from such spintronic thin, film, thin films. So there are further findings. So the terahertz signal amplitude we found to be proportional to the pump power. So this means it's driven by the heat that we deposit in the system. And uh, we also found that the terahertz electric field of these pulses here is uh, pretty perfectly linearly polarized. And the polarization is perpendicular to the magnetization of the sample. So the external magnetic field and the terahertz electric field are perpendicular to each other. But this is exactly what you expect from any kind of Hall type effect. Okay, so this is all consistent with the scenario that I had uh, outlined previously. So spin transfer from the ferromagnet into the platinum, and then the inverse spin hall effect in the platinum. But we need more evidence that really the inverse spin hall effect is at work here. So how can we do this? It's very easy. Let's just vary the non-magnetic cap layer. And uh, we decided to compare tantalum versus iridium, because these two materials have an opposite spin hall angle. So these, this means spin up electrons are deflected in opposite directions. And the, the spin hall angle in iridium is larger than in tantalum. So here you have the terahertz emission signal from iron tantalum. And now let's replace the tantalum by iridium. So if this is true, that uh, all of this arises from the spin hall effect, now this signal should reverse sign and it should have a larger amplitude. And indeed, it has. And uh, this is already a clear, uh, well, confirmation that what we see here is due to ultra-fast spin transport in combination with the inverse spin hall effect. And these data also show that these two effects are possible with terahertz bandwidth. And the question is now, well, is this just of academic interest or is it useful? Can we do something uh, with it? Is, are there applications? And I think, yes, there are applications. First, you can characterize the spin hall angle or the spin hall conductivity of this non magnetic cap material. You can use these uh, spintronic layers to generate terahertz electromagnetic pulses. And finally, you can also use this technique of terahertz emission to calculate back to the spin current that is flowing inside the sample and thereby learn more about the spin current dynamics and its origins. And let me just now illustrate these three applications with a couple of examples. So first, let's, uh, let's take uh, iron and put some uh, non-magnetic layer on top of it. For example, chromium, palladium, tantalum, tungsten, and so on. And then let's measure the terahertz amplitude as a function of, the, of this material N, of this cap layer. This is, this, these are the amplitudes that we obtain. You see, we get a lot of amplitude for platinum, also for tungsten, but in opposite direction. You can now compare these amplitudes to app initial calculations of the spin hall conductivity. And you see that we find a pretty good match between experiment and theory. And this shows that actually the terahertz emission strength yields uh, a measure that correlates strongly with the spin hall conductivity of the material. And this means terahertz emission spectroscopy enables rapid sample uh, characterization and in an easy way. So we do not have to microstructure these samples or contact them, which is always necessary, for example, in uh, spintronic 
um, approaches to measuring the spin hole conductivity of this n layer. And uh, you can then also go further and ask actually how important is the interface of such two layer stacks for this inverse spin hole effect, or more generally for this conversion of a spin current into a charge current. So here again, just to repeat, this is the, the principle behind it. We excite a structure by a femtosecond pulse. We get a spin current. We get a charge current in the transverse direction. And this emits terahertz radiation. And now the following uh, was done. Uh, our group and also other groups measured uh, the terahertz emission from these two layer structures as a function of the thickness of the F layer and the N layer. And we found that the terahertz current is actually generated in a very small region around the interface of the two layers. And this region is only about one nanometer thick, one, two, three nanometer of this order of magnitude. And this means actually that this is a very pronounced interfacial effect, the spintronic terahertz emission, and it should therefore be very sensitive to the interface properties of these two layer stacks. And uh, well, we then decided let's check the interface or let's uh, check the impact of the interfacial structure on the terahertz emission. And for this purpose, we decided to use permaloy as a ferromagnet and copper as non-magnetic material. The reason why we took copper is because copper has a very small spin hole effect. So this means there is no spin to charge conversion in the bulk of the material. And uh, most of the effect of the spin to charge conversion should happen at the interface. And in the course of the study, we studied uh, more than 50 samples, which were provided by Gerhard Jakob and Mainz. And these 50 samples are impossible to study with, uh, with uh, DC methods. And uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy is basically born to do such experiments. And these experiments were performed by Oliver Wickstock here in Berlin. And uh, this is what we got. So we took different permaloy copper samples and tried to vary the interface between the two layers. So this is our reference sample. So where permaloy is grown first, and then subsequently the, the copper is put on top of this by uh, argon ion sputter, sputtering. So this means uh, copper atoms arrive at the sample and they are partially Im implanted into the permaloy. So this means in this interfacial region, we expect uh, quite a number of copper atoms inside the permaloy. And this is the signal amplitude that we get. You see it's a negative terahertz emission signal. So let's go to the next sample and try to let's try to play with the interface. And uh, what Gerhard Jakob did here, he dusted the interface. So he offered a little bit of oxygen be before he was putting the copper on top of the, the permaloy. So you get a thin layer of permaloy oxide. Now let's take a look at the terahertz signal. And all of a sudden you see the terahertz signal not only changes amplitude, it even changes polarity. It's now positive. Okay, next sample. So we grew the sample again and, uh, uh, by sputtering, but uh, we increased the sputter pressure. So this means that the kinetic energy of the copper atoms arriving at the permaloy is now lower. And that's why we expect that less copper atoms are implanted in the permaloy. Let's now see what signal we get. Again, okay, it's negative the signal as for the reference signal, but less amplitude. So something seems to happen. Now let's anneal the sample. So we get then thermally activated diffusion at the interface. So this means light copper atoms will diffuse a lot into the permaloy, as shown here by these uh, orange uh, disks. But also a few of the heavy permaloy atoms are expected to propagate into the copper layer. And again, we get a terahertz emission signal, which is now positive and has comparable amplitude as the reference sample. And finally, let's anneal the sample to even higher temperature, such that also the heavy permaloy atoms uh, can uh, propagate into the copper. And then now again, the signal changes sign, so an abrupt change. So we observe here a drastic variation of the terahertz emitted amplitude versus the structure of the interface. So how can we explain this? And this is our interpretation. So what happens here in, uh, in this film is so-called screw scattering, also called mod scattering. So we have a spin polarized electron. It propagates toward the interface. And now see, sees here these copper impurities inside the permaloy. And uh, this acts like a scattering center, also connected with spin orbit coupling. And uh, therefore, you get mod scattering, which deflects the spin up electron downwards when it uh, gets onto the copper. Uh, because copper and permaloy is known to have a negative spin hole angle. 
This is known from calculations by Martin Drathand in Bristol. And uh, the opposite happens when you, um, for example, would uh, put permaloy impurities into copper. Now their mod scattering is such that they are deflected upwards. And this means that permaloy and copper, so these gray disks in the copper layer, have a positive spin hall angle and also larger magnitude. And these two um, results from calculations can consistently explain what we see in our experiment, as you can see here. So here we have a, our sample. We have a lot of copper inside a permaloy. So this means we get screw scattering, which goes downward. And we get a negative uh, terahertz amplitude. Then let's go to the, to the higher um, sputter pressure. So we have less copper inside the permaloy. That's why less screw scattering should happen at the interface. And therefore, we also observe less amplitude here. Now we anneal. And by annealing, we get, again, a lot of uh, copper impurities inside the permaloy. And the amplitude becomes comparable to the reference sample. Finally, if, if we anneal at 250 centigrades, we also get a lot of um, permaloy impurities inside the copper. And now we get. Uh, also a lot of uh, screw scattering, which goes upwards yeah, through the ceiling. And that's why uh, this wins and we get a positive spin hole angle in total. And I think this example can shows quite nicely that terahertz emission spectroscopy is highly interface sensitive and also enables relatively straightforward interpretations. Okay, as a second application, let's, uh, yeah, let's build a terahertz emitter. So the structure that I have sh just shown you, these, these Iron platinum structures emit sizable terahertz amplitudes. So we could use them and try to build a terahertz emitter. And uh, to compare this to a reference, we should use uh, the standard emitter in the labs. For example, zinc telluride, 0.3 millimeters. This is the emission that you get. And when you Fourier transform it, you get the spectrum here. We have a big peak at low frequencies and a broad peak at higher frequencies. And there's a gap in between, which is the famous Reststrahlen gap. But of course, we would like to have a closed spectrum. But do we get this with our spintronic uh, samples? So this is our zeroth version of the spintronic emitter. So you see that the amplitude is really disappointingly low. So this is certainly not competitive. But the nice thing is there's a lot of spintronic materials and we have a lot of parameters we can play with. And after 70 samples, we came up with a tri-layer emitter. And the terahertz waveform is shown here. And you see that the terahertz waveform is now all of a sudden with an amplitude larger than the standard emitter zinc telluride. And it's also much more narrow, which indicates a larger bandwidth. And indeed, when you Fourier transform this, uh, this waveform here, this red waveform, you obtain this red spectrum. And indeed, you completely fill the range from 1 to 10 terahertz. In particular, we fill this Reststrahlen gap of semiconducting terahertz emitters. And this shows that spintronics is not only interesting for building better uh, computers, but it's also interesting for terahertz photonics, for example, for constructing more broadband efficient and cheaper uh, emitters of terahertz radiation. And since this uh, spintronic emitter is made of metals with a, with a magnetization consisting of ferromagnets, it enables interesting features. Let me just show a few of them. First of all, since it's made of metal, the emitter is insensitive to the pump wavelength, here shown for the visible. Uh, but we could also show this now for terahertz radiation and even X-rays. Yeah, the spintronic emitter still works and emits terahertz uh, radiation. Then you can also uh, take advantage of the fact that the terahertz amplitude is strongly tied to the magnetization of the terahertz emitter. So this means we can uh, apply an AC magnetic field to the sample and in this way modulate the polarity of the terahertz wave. And we can do this meanwhile now with a frequency of 30 kilohertz. And we cannot only do this with the polarity plus and minus. We can also rotate the terahertz polarization by 90 degrees. And this is, for example, interesting for applications like terahertz ellipsometry. And we cannot only uh, temporarily modulate the terahertz emitter. You can also spatially modulate it, modulate it because it consists of a ferromagnetic layer seen from the top here. You can now apply a spatially structured magnetic field, as done here by this group in the United Kingdom. And uh, well, this magnetic field structure is then directly translated into a terahertz well uh, field distribution, which can, for example, here this, uh, have this donut like beam cross section. So, by just playing with the distribution of the magnetic field in the plane of the sample, you can generate almost any 
uh, electric field distribution you would like to have, for example, donut wheels. And finally, you can take uh, your metallic spintronic terahertz emitter, scale it up, for example, to a diameter of five or even seven centimeters, take a bigger laser, and then you can uh, crank up the terahertz field amplitude. Here, 0.3 megavolts per centimeter, but meanwhile, we are also able to generate more than one megavolt per centimeter peak field. And this is, of course, then interesting for applications like nonlinear terahertz spectroscopy. So given these applications, so we found it very uh, important to improve the performance of this emitter even more. So how can one do this? Here's again the principle, the femtosecond laser pulse, launch a spin transport, spin to charge conversion, uh, then causes a spin current, uh, sorry, a charge current in the plane, which emits a terahertz pulse. So you can optimize spin to charge current conversion in terms of bandwidth. And it turns out that platinum uh, or typical metals have already uh, a maximum of bandwidth. They react quasi instantaneously. Uh, we can try to improve the spin to charge conversion amplitude of the materials, for example, by interface engineering, as uh, I just uh, mentioned. But finally, of course, we would also like to have a spin current as large as possible for a given pump pulse energy. So how can we maximize this? So this means we should at least be able to measure it to learn more about how the spin current arises. And this brings me actually to the last application now, measurement of the spin current that flows inside this two layer structure. And the question is now, what is actually the origin of the spin current? How does it arise when we perturb the sample with the femtosecond laser pulse? And uh, maybe uh, remember uh, the previous idea that I mentioned, the heated magnet actually wants to get rid of spin and it does it by transport into the N layer. So this means actually we should compare the dynamics of the spin current to the dynamics of the loss of magnetization of just the ferromagnetic layer. And this is called ultra-fast demagnetization. It's a pretty mature phenomenon in the field of spintronics, of ultra-fast spintronics. You take a ferromagnet, perturb it with a laser pulse, and of course, it will shrink its magnetization. And the question is now, is there a correlation between this ultra-fast demagnetization and the spin current uh, in our samples? So this means actually, if we want to answer this question, we should be able to measure these two processes in one and the same experiment to compare them to each other as well as possible. So how can we do this? Spin transport is quite simple because we already know how to do this. We know that the terahertz electric field directly behind the sample is directly proportional to the instantaneous amplitude of the spin current. But how can we measure the ultra fast demagnetization? Uh, how is this possible? So note that this is a magnetic dipole. And when we perturb this magnetic dipole by a femtosecond laser pulse, it will shrink. But this means we have now a time dependent magnetic dipole. And it's such, as such, it will emit also electromagnetic radiation. And the electric field of the electromagnetic field behind the sample is proportional to the rate of change, m dot, of the magnetization of the sample. So this means, yeah, we can measure these two processes in one and the same experiment. Then we are now ready to compare the rate of change of the magnetization of a single ferromagnetic layer to the spin current that flows in such a two-layer structure. And as materials, we use uh, the ferromagnet cobalt iron. We start with this. And uh, well, we first look at the rate of change of the magnetization. And you see that this is the signal. It's now much more noisy because this uh, the rate of change of the magnetization gives rise to magnetic dipole emission. And this has, of course, a much smaller amplitude, but you see it's still a measurable effect. But now let's compare this to the signal due to the spin current in its twin sample, in its, uh, yeah, in its uh, counterpart sample, namely the ferromagnet cobalt iron with platinum on top of this. And then we get this blue waveform here. And you see the two waveforms have almost identical dynamics. Pretty amazing. But maybe this is a coincidence. So let's go to a different ferromagnet, cobalt iron boron. But again, we see the same dynamics. But maybe cobalt iron boron and cobalt iron are too similar to each other. So let's take a different ferromagnet, permaloy nickel iron. You see that the waveform now looks pretty much different. It's more asymmetric now. But again, the transport signal has exactly the same dynamics. So what does this tell us? Does this tell us? It actually means that the signal due to ultra-fast demagnetization of a single ferromagnetic layer is proportional to the electric field, terahertz electric field, 
uh, due to ultra fast spin transport in such a two layer sample. And this implies that the rate of change of the magnetization of the F layer sample is proportional to the transport of uh, the spin current in the two layer sample. So let's check this explicitly by taking these waveforms and calculating back to the spin current and the rate of change of the magnetization. And this is shown here for cobalt iron. So this is the spin current in the cobalt iron platinum sample. You see at negative delays, there's no spin current. All of a sudden, when the pump pulse arri arrives at time zero, we get a rate of change of the magnetization. But now for a totally different sample, the, the ferromagnetic layer, cobalt iron. And we see also the same for the other uh, uh, ferromagnets, cobalt iron boron, and also permaloid. And this shows actually that demagnetization, that the demagnetization rate of a single F layer sample has the same dynamics like the spin current in such a two layer stack. So how is this possible that the dynamics of these at first glance very different processes is so similar? And here's a simple model. Here we have uh, our ferromagnet and uh, we have here the density of states of spin up electrons, of spin down electrons. Now we excite it with a, a femtosecond laser pulse and what you get is spin flip processes from spin up to spin down electrons. You can calculate them by just subtracting the number of spins for spin up minus the number of spins down. So this difference here. And then finally, you integrate over all energies. And then you have it, the rate of change of the magnetization in this toy model. OK, and you can do the same for the transport. Here's the, again, the density of states of the ferromagnet. Here's the non-magnetic material. And then you have these interface transmission events. And they, of course, lead to the spin current. You can count them. And again, you get this integral here, the integral over all electron energies times the spin up minus the spin down electron population. So you see that the rate of change and the spin current in this simple model are proportional to each other. But this is exactly what we observed in the experiment. So this simple con uh, consideration already shows that what we observe is very reasonable. And uh, it's interesting to more analyze this integral here. Because if the electron distributions n up and n down are Fermi-Dirac functions, you can show that this integral here is actually the chemical potential of spin up electrons minus spin down electrons. And in spintronics, this is called the spin voltage or spin accumulation. And therefore, we, uh, for our integral, we call it the generalized spin voltage because in general, in our experiments, these occupation numbers are not Fermi-Dirac functions. The, these distributions are very non-thermal in the beginning. So how can we interpret the spin voltage in a very simple way? They, the, the spin voltage can actually be shown to be just the magnetization of the sample that the sample has right now and the, sam the magnetization that the sample would like to have. So we heat up the sample. The magnetization actually should go here, but the magnetization of the sample is still here. And this difference is actually the excess of spin polarization or magnetization. And it can be shown that this is exactly the spin voltage that uh, we just derived on the previous slides. You can now put all of this together and uh, derive an equation of motion of the dynamics of the spin voltage. And this is what you get. You get a memory kernel just an exponential, times the rate of change of the electronic temperature. So this means to get terahertz emission, you need a rate, you need a change in the electronic temperature. In this sense, this is really an AC effect similar to the pyroelectric effect. And there's only one free parameter. It's the electron spin relaxation time. This basically tells us how long does it take the spins of the ferromagnet to adapt to the new temperature of the electrons. And uh, the dynamics of the electronic temperature is known from literature to describe it. You just need two parameters, uh, the electron phonon relaxation time. So how long does it take until electron and phonons uh, relax? And then you just need uh, on top of that, the ratio of the electron and total heat capacity. All of this is very well known. So this means we have just one fit parameter. Let's see whether we can fit our data with this, with this one fit parameter. And you see for cofib it works very well. And uh, also for cofib platinum and also for permaloy. Yeah? In all cases you get very nice agreement between theory and experiment, even though we use, just use one fit parameter, this electron spin relaxation time. And you see in cobalt iron boron, it's much faster, 100 femtoseconds, than in permaloy, where we have 190 femtoseconds. And this is also very consistent with previous works uh, in femtomagnetism. And the picture is now as follows. When we perturb the sample with a femtosecond laser pulse, 
the temperature goes up and so does the spin voltage. And then uh, later on the spin voltage decays because of spin flips and cooling of the electrons. That brings me to the conclusion of this talk. So, uh, well, we could, um, I hope I could make the point that uh, ultra fast spin transport and ultra fast demagnetization are driven by the same force, by the spin voltage. And this is of course significant. Yeah, you can now apply all the knowledge which is best about ultra fast demagnetization to spin transport and try to optimize spin transport and, and yeah, for example, terahertz emitters, but also things like mag magnetic switching. And in summary, I'd like to make the point that I think that terahertz uh, emission spectroscopy provides new insights into the mechanism of laser induced spin transport, but also interfacial spin to charge current conversion. And it even enables interesting applications, for example, terahertz wave generation. And uh, of course, in the future, we would like to increase sensitivity and time resolution and go for more complex magnets. And I think this is also something Chiara Ciccarelli will later talk about. So thanks a lot for your attention. Um, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much, Tobias, for this very nice talk. I'm not sure if you could hear the, the applause here in the room, but it was uh, very loud. Um, so let's move now to the, to the questions. Thank you, Tobias, for the very nice talk. Can, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, great. Um, very interesting, this uh, tracking of the demonetization with the, with the spin current. I, I was wondering if you now introduce a more complex interface with, uh, with some skew scattering, uh, would you be able now to, to track some, uh, some properties of, of the skew scattering using, using your, your model? Have you tried to do this? Uh, uh, so the question was, uh, can, we, can we try to see the dynamics of the skew scattering at the interface, for example, by taking a more difficult or a more complex material? And that's actually what we are trying at the moment. And indeed, we see, we see something which is unexpected. Uh, but it would be too early to say that it's due to the skew scattering. But definitely, we, we would like to see this. Okay, more questions here? Hello, Tobias. Thank you for your talk. I mean, you were showing that this terahertz is generated on this interface. So it's from a very, very thin layer, I guess a nanometer or a few. And then to get a lot of power, you need, you need centimeter areas to, to go up in power. So is there any way to go deeper on the generation of the terahertz or is this a fundamental limit? Well, the question was, so uh, the, the terahertz emission basically is produced at the, at the interface. And yeah. uh, can we extend these lengths here? So first of all, it needs to be the interface, at least when it's electric dipole radiation, because for electric dipole radiation to generate from a second order process, you need broken inversion symmetry. And uh, this is here broken by this interface. Yeah, That's why it's already dictated by symmetry. What you can try is to make these propagation lengths, yeah, these relaxation lengths longer. And possibly this works when you go for, for example, crystalline platinum and crystalline iron. And it's something we are also trying to understand at the moment. But in principle, yeah, it's an interfacial effect and that's why limited to the interface. You can just try to increase these relaxation lengths by yeah, decreasing the scattering rates. Would it be possible to just uh, dope the left material with copper particles so that you just have a lot of interfaces, but in a bulk material? Uh, that's, a, that's a very good idea. You could dope, for example, here with copper, but please note that this is then still inversion symmetric yeah, because it looks locally uh, the same on the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Uh, unfortunately, this wouldn't work. So you need to build in your sample a kind of spatial arrow. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it's the interface at the moment. So, so, so you need a doping gradient. That would be cool, yeah, a doping gradient. That would be a great idea, exactly. Okay. Or oh, someone is saying you're making a sandwich. A doping sandwich, that would be great. Uh, there's a discussion now in the audience about making a sandwich, and we're, we're not sure if that will be symmetric or not. Um, OK, more questions from the audience? <laughs> because we also need to get to the coffee break at some point. Um, and online, oh, there's two questions online, okay. 
so I see it in slide 13. I'm curious about the shape of the um, parasphere. So we have a few questions here. Um, in slide 13, I'm curious about the shape of the terahertz field. It looks like the two terahertz fields overlapping a bit in time delay. Is it? Is there any reflection at the interface? 13. Yeah. Okay. So it's possible. Yeah, that these uh, these fields, for example, contain um, still the response function of the electro optic detector, uh, and uh, there you can also get uh, all kinds of reflections. I am I'm not hundred percent sure what uh, electro optic detector we used here. But uh, this, this double peak here can be a, a consequence of this. Absolutely. But when we calculate back from these signals to the current, all of this is taken into account. OK, let's take one more question online before we go for our break. Um, yeah, there's a question from Sergio, uh, who is a group leader here at the Institute. Uh, if you see any uh, signatures of spin to charge conversion by the spin galvanic effect, as opposed to just the inverse spin hole effect. Yeah, um, so the question was, um, so there's more spin to charge conversion phenomena than the, uh, the inverse spin hole effect. There's also the spin galvanic effect, which for example happens through the inverse Rashbar Edelstein effect. So we, we, we do not yet see this directly, but there are some indications in, in, in samples with topological insulators where we where you could interpret it like that. So Sergio, uh, can we talk about this later maybe? Uh, we can, it would be great to meet you online. Can we talk about this later? Uh, so Sergio is uh, not in the room right now, but we'll set this up. Yes, we should. Uh, but Sergio, write me an email and we just meet. I'm, I'm sure he will do that. Great. Good. Yeah, thanks, OK, very good. Um, so thank you again, Tobias, for this very nice talk. And we will uh, go for our uh, little coffee break here. So that's the advantage of being in person uh, at the, <laughs> of course, all the online people can also get their coffee. And um, so let's uh, get back here at 12 or maybe five minutes before 12, if you can. Uh, my name is Sergio Valenzuela. I'm uh, going to be the chair of this session. And our first speaker is uh, Misha Bon. Uh, he's a, a Max Planck director at the Institute of Polymer uh, Research in Mainz, uh, where he runs the Department of Molecular Spectroscopy uh, since 2011. He's also an honorary professor at Johannes uh, University, uh, uh, Gutenberg Johannes <laughs> University of, of Mainz. Uh, his research focuses on ultra-fast uh, vibration and spectroscopy and microscopy of biomolecular system, including water, and uh, on uh, carrier dynamics on phot uh, photovoltaic uh, building blocks. And he's coming to talk about uh, charge transfer and mobility in other hybrid uh, materials. Yeah, so I don't think you're going to be able to... I'll give you the, the laser pointer. Okay. But I think people at home won't be able to see the laser pointer when you share the screen like this, but that's okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so. Anywho, um, welcome. I mean, uh, thank you. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how we can use ultrafast spectroscopy to characterize new materials. So it's a little bit material science-y. Um, and we investigate a lot of different materials. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about today are two of those materials, namely maxines. Um, and uh, hybrids of perovskites and 2D material. Now I'm going to show you how we can use ultrafast spectroscopy to learn about the fundam fundamentals of charge transport and transfer in these systems. I'll start with the uh, maxines. And maxines are a lot like um, potatoes, in fact. Um, so they are... Uh, 2D materials, which you which you make by by treating a bulk material and essentially um, making it 2D. So it's not a, a physic physics physicsy clean material, um, but nonetheless it is uh, very interesting. Um, so there it consists of carbon carbides, carbonitrides, and nitrides. I will tell you a little bit about the chemical structure. So it's a transition metal. Uh, with a carbon or a nitrogen and some sort of surface termination. And especially the surface termination, it's like OH or fluoride or oxygen. It's not very well defined because of this chemistry that's occurring, but that's also makes this an interesting material. 
And so this is what it looks like at the, uh, at the sort of uh, atomic level. So you have these, these sheets. And so one, one sort of sheet here is one of those sheets here. Um, and the question is, so th this material is actually being used in, uh, in, as a battery material. So there's a lithium intercalation. Uh, it's used as a photocatalyst. So there's a lot of charges flowing in the material. And the question is, how are these charging charges moving? And the reason I ask that question is because there is a, a lot of controversy uh, around that issue. So there is theory that states that in these materials, there should be an increase in the resistivity with temperature. Uh, so a, a, a negative gradient of the mobility with temperature. And the reason for that is that in theory, when you heat up the material, you excite phonons and the phonons impede the flow of current. However, if you look in the um, literature, you will find that the resistivity always decreases with temperature, as you see here. So that means that a positive slope of the mobility with temperature. Um, and this is uh, usually assigned to hopping type transport. And so to, to tell you these two uh, limiting cases in a little more detail. So if we have a lattice, which we have in the material, and there's uh, charge in it, then that charge can, uh, can move around freely if it's band transport and it scatters every now and then and it scatters over phonons, which I've indicated here with these uh, shaded uh, nuclei here. Uh, and this gives rise to a reduction in the mobility when we increase the temperature, right? And so this is band transport. We can also have a hopping transport where the carrier self traps at different locations and then it has to hop from site to site. And then there's typically an energy barrier associated uh, with that motion. And then of course you get thermally activated transport and a mobility that increases with temperature as you see here. So these are the two limiting cases. And as I told you, theory states that it should be trans band transport and experiments has shown that for Maxines there's hopping transport. So what's going on? And so what we're going to do is we're going to apply a voltage to our material and measure the current. This is how we measure mobility. This is how you, you, you do it at home, right? I have one of these at home. Um, and, but rather than applying a field for seconds, we're going to apply a field for a picosecond. And that field is going to oscillate very quickly. Uh, and that allows us to measure the conductivity without adding contacts. And so how that works very quickly is that if I have Maxine with an electron in it, that uh, the, the incident field is going to drive a current, right? It's going to make this electron move up and down. Uh, and that current, Maxwell's equation, a current produces a new field. And so th that current emits a field that is proportional to the time derivative of the current. And so what I measure at the end is the, uh, the interference of that incident field and the emitted current by the material. And so that's the total field. And of course, then I can backtrack from this trace, uh, the current that was running in my material as, I, uh, as the electrons were there. So the uh, experiment is very simple. We're going to compare uh, the, the normal Maxine with the photo excited Maxine where we, where we introduce the charge carriers. And this is testimony to my poor animation skills in PowerPoint, but I think you get the, the idea. Um, and so this difference in, in, the, in the amplitude is a direct measure for the number density, the product of the number density and the mobility of the charge carriers in the material. And this phase shifts we'll forget about for now. And so we can Fourier transform these waveforms, right? They're almost single cycle. So they span a lot of a, a wide frequency range. And then we get uh, from the amplitude and this phase information, the real and imaginary part of the conductivity. And this is very insightful because this contains direct information 
also on the nature of the, of the conductivity in the material. Uh, this is uh, an example for actually for graphene. Uh, so this is the conductivity of one layer uh, of graphene. And you see that we can fit uh, this data very nicely. So here these lines are the Drude model. And so we really get directly the number density and the scattering time, which is proportional to the mobility. So we get all this information for free. So the, sim the sample we looked at is this uh, niobium-based material. Uh, so it's a thin film on a substrate. Uh, it's, it's nice because this is a material that's been used in, in uh, electrochemical applications because it's very stable. And so we're, oh, sorry, we're first going to measure the the simply the photoconductivity. So we're going to measure how much of the terahertz is attenuated uh, by the excitation. And so the idea is now to test these different models uh, to see whether we see this, this negative or positive uh, the temperature dependence of the mobility. So if we do that, uh, this is uh, at uh, room temperature. Uh, you see that as we decrease the temperature, the, the conductivity goes up. So this is the sheet conductivity that we measure. Um, and so this is very nice. And if we, if we plot the, the conductivity at long times, so after a nanosecond or so versus uh, the temperature, you see this, uh, this kind of behavior here. So the conductivity decreases with temperature, which is indicative of band transport. However, we have to be careful because what we measure is, as I told you, the product of the number density uh, and the mobility. So we have to make sure that in our experiment, the number density is not varying with temperature. And so to exclude that, we measure these, um, the full spectrum and so here are two examples uh, at, at low and at, at room temperature. So you see the we have the, the conductivity spectrum. It's not exactly Drude-like, um, as I showed you before. It's actually, you have to use what's called the Drude-Smith model, um, but that has the same parameters that the Drude model has. So it has the, uh, the plasma frequency, the scattering time, and it has this additional parameter, this C parameter, which is a kind of a, uh, fudge parameter, if I'm being totally honest. There is a, there is a physical interpretation to it, but uh, it's not quite clear what that is. Um, in any case, when we apply that model, that model describes the, the data remarkably well. So now we have three parameters. And what is important is that the plasma frequency doesn't really change with temperature. So the quantum efficiency of, of photon to electron conversion is more or less temperature independent. The, this backscattering parameter is also constant. So what is really changing as a function of temperature is the, the scattering time of the, um, of the electrons and holes. And you see that with increasing temperature, the scattering time decreases, which again is due to thermal excitation of the phonons. So that is nice. So now we know that in Maxine, we have this, uh, carrier phonon coupling, we can quantify that by going from scattering time to scattering rate, because then we can use Matisse rule to add um, the different contributions of the, to the scattering rate, which is acoustic phonons, optical phonons, and impurity scattering. And then you see that we can describe this system, uh, this behavior very nicely. And it's essentially just one, uh, well, two fit parameters, the electron phonon, uh, optical phonon coupling coefficient, and the uh, amplitude of the impurity scattering. And this works very nicely. So that means that we now have also a measure of the, uh, the electron phonon coupling strength. Um, and what we conclude from that is that we have polarons that are being formed. So we have a a somewhat ionic lattice in this material. And if we add an electron, which is this, this fuzzy orange ball here, it will repel negatively charged atoms and attract positively charged atoms so that we get this wonderful PowerPoint em em animation uh, that we get this uh, local lattice distortion. This is called, um, so the, the, the formation of a new quasi-particle of polaron. This is what a polaron is, is called. 
And so uh, much like a, 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 a real horse uh, can become a quasi horse, the real particle now becomes a quasi particle. Um, and that is uh, the, what, the essence of Polaron formation. Um, what that means for the mobility is that when the electron moves, it has to drag this lattice deformation along with it. So there's, uh, there's some phonon drag, it's called, so that reduces the mobility a little bit. But uh, we're in the Maxines, we're in the weak electron phonon coupling limit. So we have a, a relatively large uh, polaron. So the, the wave function of the electron is extended over several uh, lattice units and the phonon drag is rather limited. So we have a rather high mobility still. So how does this, what I just told you, fit into this, uh, this picture of all these other experiments? I mean, there's quite a long list. Um, that, that have shown that this hopping transport. So I showed you that we see band transport, but all these experiments have shown hopping transport. And so the reason for that is that all these experiments have been on Maxine-based devices such as this. And if we make a device, we get the same from the same, exactly the same material that we use for the terahertz experiments. Uh, so here is the the optical conductivity that I showed you just now with the terahertz. And here is the, the device measurement on the same, exactly the same batch of material. And you see that they, those two have completely opposite trend as a function of temperature. And we can understand that because with the terahertz, we apply a, very, a field for a very short time. So the length scale over which electrons can travel is very short. It's, so the electron has no time literally to go from flake to flake. It has to stay within one flake. When we measure a device, of course, we apply contacts over you know, millimeters, centimeters. And so that means that the electron will have to hop from flake to flake to be able to go from one electrode to the other electrode. And so this is uh, what uh, sort of resolves this controversy. So if we look at uh, transport within a flake, like we did with our terahertz, we have band transport. And that's of course also what the theory predicted. But if we have uh, a, a device that is based on many, many flakes, uh, the transport is limited by interflake transport and that is thermally activated and you find a hopping process. So that is uh, that, is that. that uh, paper has just come out um, and I think I've said everything I want to say about that. So let me go to my, uh, to my second part, which is um, to put um, uh, a um, perovskite on graphene and look at the optical activity of that system. And why do we want to do that? Because we want to get the best of both worlds. And the reason is that these perovskites have been used for uh, X-ray detection, but of course, uh, with x-rays, we have to be careful when we use living tissue. So we want to use as low a dose as possible. Um, and that is why people have detected x-rays with, uh, with these perovskites. So this perovskite is shown here in green. And the perovskite is very good at detecting this particular perovskite at detecting x-rays. It has very strong uh, x-ray absorption. It has a long carrier lifetime. There is little to no ion migration in this particular perovskite. And of course, it's very easy to make large area devices because you simply drop cast the stuff. You spin coat it on, uh, on a substrate. Now, it has, of course, also a drawback. And that is that the charge mobility is very low or relatively low in this material. So the idea was if we put this perovskite on a substrate with high mobility, then maybe we can get the best of both worlds, right? The high absorption of the perovskite and the high mobility of our material. And then uh, the material that we chose is graphene because graphene has a ridiculously high mobility uh, and it's easy to contact and we know how to make devices. So the graphene uh, that we uh, look at, so this is the band structure of graphene. I think most of you know what that looks like. It's conical. This is the, the, the direct point. And in our case, the Fermi level is slightly below the direct point. So it's slightly 
P doped. Um, that is simply how it comes when you put graphene on a substrate, it's slightly p -doped. Um, And so the questions that we need to answer, is there charge transfer? Is there electron or hole cha charge, charge transfer? Like we really had no clue what we were going to see. And uh, is it useful? So do we get charge transfer without having very rapid recombination so that the charges are live long enough to be able to detect them with a, within a device. And so the question is, uh, what happens when we put, um, we put the, the double perovskite, this is the, the DP here, onto the graphene, which is G. And so we know that there are some uh, holes in the graphene. And here again is my super duper um, animation. And so what we will see is that there is indeed hole transfer from um, the double perovskite to the graphene. And so there will be a larger attenuation of the terahertz compared to the, um, the case where there's no optical excitation. So what is very important is all the sample prep. I, I don't wanna get into that, but you can, uh, you can make a bad uh, sample very easily. Let's just leave it at that. Um, so when we put the, the, the two materials together, we do a Raman uh, micro microscopy to characterize uh, the doping levels. Uh, and so this is uh, graphene only. Um, and this is the, the heterostructure. And you see there's a shift of the, of the graphene bands, which is due to a change in the doping level uh, of the, the monolayer. Uh, and in fact, what you see is that the doping level increases substantially so we go from a Fermi level of about minus 50 millivolt to a Fermi level of almost minus 400 millivolt. So a lot of charge transfer already occurring in steady state between the two um, materials. Um, so what is happening is that um, presumably there are, there is, there must be electron transfer to go from this minus 50 to minus 400. And so what we, what we think is that there are defect states here between the, the graphene and the double perovskite where we have some charge transfer, which is further doping the um, graphene. Uh, so let's, uh, by, by lack of x-rays in our lab, we don't have a lot of x-rays. We'll just use 400 nanometers that will, that will do the job. It will mostly excite the, the double perovskite and not the graphene. Um, and so if we um, excite only the graphene layer, we see uh, actually a decrease in the conductivity of the graphene. Uh, so that is due to heating of these dopants, essentially by the optical pulse. And then there's a subsequent cooling over a time scale of uh, a few picoseconds, as you can see here. If we only look at the perovskite, you see that it's, uh, it behaves like a, a semiconductor, not a very good semiconductor. So we inject some, some carriers. There's a, a rapid cooling within a few uh, picoseconds. Then there is uh, a, a stable photoconductivity, which recombines on a time scale of a hundred, few hundred picoseconds, and there's a slower time scale. And so this is the, the, the picture that we have. So I was, uh, uh, this is actually not a direct band gap material. So this is a bit uh, um, suggestive, this picture, but it's just a schematic. So what happens if we put these two together? So here are the same measurements that I just showed you uh, on a slightly different scale. So in red is the graphene. In, uh, orange is the double perovskite. So what's important is that you see that the graphene is much more conductive than the double perovskite, right? It's already apparent from, from this measurement. So in the graphene, we're, we're only slightly modifying the, the mobility of the already present uh, carriers. And this gives us a signal of 0.04. And for the double perovskite, we are injecting carriers where we had none, and we see a 10 times smaller signal. So it means that the conductivity is, the mobility is very different. So the nice thing is if we look at the response of the, um, of the hybrid system, 
we see something of each uh, system individually. So you see that the, the, the graphene response is still there. But what's important is that we get this actually fairly slow, slowly ingrowing positive photoconductivity uh, at, at long times that lives longer than at least a nanosecond. So this is very encouraging. Because the, um, the signal is, um, the photoconductivity signal is positive, that means that, uh, well, first of all, there must be charge transfer. Um, yeah, this is the, the, the very bad sample that I showed you, and that is really just the sum of the two components. So we have charge transfer um, between the two. Um, we need a clean interface, maybe not so, um, so surprising. Uh, and what is interesting is that we have, what we see is whole transfer from the double perovskite to the graphene. So that must be because we see this, this additional conductivity appearing, right? So we're increasing the doping of the graphene essentially. Uh, so there's whole transfer, and the, the good news is that we have this long-lived uh, charge-separated state in our system. If we excite just out of curiosity below the band gap of the double perovskite, so then we're, we're exciting just the graphene. We were, we were curious what happens. Uh, and actually what you find is that also here, there is a relatively long-lived uh, uh, charge transfer signal. But now it's negative, which means that holes are leaving the, the graphene. So that means essentially uh, that we're creating room by exciting the, the graphene. We're, we're creating room here for electrons from these defect states to hop back to the graphene. That is the interpretation that we have. And this is kind of interesting because now we have a, a system where depending on what we excite, we get whole transfer from, from the one to the other or from the other to the one. But we always get whole transfer. Uh, and this is kind of interesting because usually in, in the other systems that we and others have studied, you get either electron transfer or whole transfer, but you never get bidirectional whole transfer. But this is just a side note. So anyway, does it work, right? So we now know there is charge transfer. It is long lived on the, the time scale of our nanosecond delay line, but is that long enough to make a good device? Uh, and yes, it is. So what you see here is the, um, the X-ray response curve of a, a double perovskite only device. That's the, the solid line here. And the, the dotted line is a, a, a graphene double perovskite device, which was not at all optimized, um, but you can see it has about three to four times larger response than the, the, the state of the art uh, double perovskite uh, device. So it works. Um, that is actually um, the summary of that second part, which I won't um, go into. I want to end by thanking these these uh, these wonderful people. So um, Van Hao and and Hung did the uh, the experimental work on the two projects. The double perovskite were is a collaboration with Johan Hofkens and Elke. So they are the let's say material scientists. Um, and the, um, the vaccines were um, prepared in the lab of Xin Liang Feng, who is also a synthetic chemist. Um, and so I just wanted to show you guys how uh, these kind of fancy schmancy spectroscopies can actually be useful to understand some aspects of materials that are difficult to understand otherwise. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for this very nice talk. Uh, so do we have a question from the audience? Yes, certainly. Thank you, Misha, for this really nice talk. So concerning your first part, uh, do you think that this differentiation between, let's say, intraflake and interflake conductivity uh, is more general than for MCs that applies also to other kind of 2D materials? Yeah, that's a very nice question. And the, the, I think the answer to that question is unequivocally yes. Uh, so we've seen it um, also in, for instance, um, carbon nanotube uh, type systems or, or graphene nanoflake systems. 
Um, and so it's very, it's very, I think, very um, typical for weekly coupled systems. We actually have one nice uh, paper with Paolo Samori um, where we looked at um, molybdenum diselenite flakes or, the, or disulfide, one of the two. Um, and what, and so we told him transport, macroscopic transport is limited by interflake coupling. And he came up with this idea to put um, um, a, a double, double sulfur sulfonated benzene, benzene ring to chemically couple the flakes. And, and then, then indeed you get an increase in the conductivity of a, of a device. So, so you, you can, can increase the, you can lower the hopping barrier essentially. Um, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is about uh, Maxine Perovskite. How stable are these samples when you do ultrafast spectroscopy? The Maxines? Yeah. So these Maxines that I showed you, so the, the niobium are very stable. They're extremely robust to air, to water, they're actually used. We've done experiments to, my, so water is my favorite molecule, right? It was already mentioned. So we've looked at water intercalation into these systems and they are completely, that's re completely reversible and robust. Um, but certainly not all Maxines are. So we've also done measurements on other Maxines that uh, where, where we have to be very careful. It's just essentially photo oxidation is a problem. So you have to do the, the experiments in vacuum. Um, and the second thing is when you were talking about charge transfer in this um, heterostructures. So when you do the pump probe spectroscopy, um, can you get an idea about this from uh, the rise time of the signal? Do you see some signature there? Or uh, yes. So, oh, it's gone. So, so I showed you that there was this, uh, this kind of slow um, rise. I mean, there's a fast component, but there's also a slow component. And so we did, uh, we did measurements where we changed the excitation wavelength to see, is it, uh, is it a, a one, one photon, one electron transfer, or is it a thermalized electron transfer process? And it's in fact a thermalized electron process. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, I think, I think I've made the point. I think it's fine. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so this, this, this certainly contains, contains uh, so this, this is the, essentially the rise time of the signal. Uh, it, I was talking about the initial part, no? when you ascribe to the first few from the hundreds of microseconds. Oh, here, yeah, this is, yeah. that is just uh, limited by um, the, the, pulse. the pulse, yeah, and the heating or the generation yeah. of carriers. So you don't see anything there? No. no. Misha, thank you. I mean, in exactly this work on the pair of skies on the graphene, you, you said it's the best of two worlds. So, so the absorption of the perovskite versus the conductivity of the graphene, but then the curve is very much the graphene curve still. I mean, I see only a little bit of a lift or, or the point is that I get this long-term yes. rise yes. because it's so, a very, very small value compared to what the graphene itself does actually. Yeah, so the important thing, of course, is that we're using 400 nanometer and not x-rays, right? So if you use ah, x-rays, ah, yeah, yeah. the graphene is essentially transparent and it, there will only be absorption in the, in the double perovskite. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, this is, a, this is kind of a, a, a model experiment, but the proof of principle, of course, shows that it works in the actual device. Um, but the, so the important thing to, to compare is the strength of this signal compared to the strength of that signal. Uh -huh. Because you want to do a measurement, you, you need long-lived charge carriers to detect them yeah, in the yeah. device. Yeah, so the graphene only changes like 10% or so, but on the long term, where it was zero, it becomes something beyond exactly. zero. That, that's the that's point. That's the point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh -huh. this increase uh, here, Yeah, that is... Many orders of magnitude, in fact. Okay, one. yeah.
thanks for a great talk. I was very interested by the estimation of the electron phonon coupling that you've done with error spectroscopy. Maybe uh, you show that you had uh, alpha of the order one that you were yeah. able to, to measure. Maybe can you comment on, on the limitations of this technique of uh, the type of polarons that you, you can analyze and if you give, can give other examples of maybe, maybe even stronger electron phonon coupling that you'd be able to, to track with this, uh, with this approach. Yeah, example, can you see also small polarons? Um, so we can see. Um, so this is the this is basically the the based on the the Froelich or Feynman uh, theory for for polarons. Um, so I have we have never so we've used this theory on large and intermediate sized polarons. So it works for a lot of materials. So oxides. Uh, titanium oxide is a good example where you have an intermediate sized polaron. Um, so not you're not in the large polaron limit or in the small polaron limit, but somewhere in between. And you need to, to use this, this uh, whole Feynman theory. Um, so we've never used it for small polarons, but I think our, our spectroscopy there is not unambiguous. So the, it works because we can, we can from these conductivity spectra, we can get the, the scattering rate. And that rate is independence on the temperature is what gives us alpha. It's basically the, the curvature of that. Right, it's the non-temperature dependent part that yeah. determines, yeah. 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 And so if, we're, if we go to small polarons, the, 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 let's say the, the spectroscopic signature of the small polaron is more is is not as unambiguous as the large polaron or intermediate right. size. Right, but essentially because the frequency of the LO mode that you're considering is is way larger than, yeah. than KT. Yeah. Exactly. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Thanks. Okay, I think it's it's probably time to continue. Uh, so we thank again for your wonderful talk. So uh, our next speaker uh, is. Uh, Ashwati uh, Sivan. Uh, she received her diploma in physics from the University of Mumbai in 2017, PhD in physics uh, from University uh, Roma Sapienza in 2021. She's currently a postdoc in an orthodontics group of uh, Ilaria uh, Sardo, uh, who unfortunately couldn't join us today, at the University of Basel. Uh, she, uh, her research interests include uh, carrier phonon interactions and lattice dynamics in low dimensional structures. So. Welcome. Thank you for the very kind introduction. I'm really happy to be here and um, I feel really, um, let's say, starstruck because I just defended my PhD um, about a year ago and um, I was following the works of many of the speakers here today. And now I'm working in the nanophononics group at University of Basel with uh, Professor Ilaria Zardo. And uh, we are mostly interested in investigating uh, lattice dynamics and electron phonon coupling uh, at the nanoscale, and also to explore exotic uh, heat transport regime at the nanoscale. So in the next few minutes, I will talk about how we can use ultra-fast laser lasers to study um, phonon dynamics. So as we have seen from the program of this talk, which is quite diverse, we can use ultra fast physics to, or lasers to learn not just semiconductors, we can learn magnetic material. I'm mostly interested in um, talking about how we can use this physics to learn uh, more, more about semiconductors. semiconductors. In semiconductors, when we excite them using an ultra short pulse and use a probe to study them, we can gain a lot of information about electron dynamics, lattice dynamics, about how the phonon population evolves and um, different phase transitions that are induced during this process, as well as how the lattice expands um, and several other thermal effects. So the first step, of course, is to excite your sample using an ultra fast laser. And upon photo excitation, several interesting phenomena happen in your material. The first of course is carrier excitation, which happens in several femtoseconds. 
followed by thermalization. This is essentially when you create um, a population of non-thermal electrons or holes following photoexcitation. They undergo several scattering process and then they form a thermal uh, distribution. Then if you're using these semiconductors in a device, for example, you need to remove these hot carriers um, effectively or they, radi uh, they recombine radiatively on, or non-radiatively. And finally, you have several structural effects that uh, follow in nanoseconds of time. So the thing that we are interested in is something called a phonon. And most of these, most of these processes that happen after photoexcitation is assisted through something called a phonon. So what is a phonon? I, I'm sure that most of you already know, but since this is more of a tutorial kind of talk, I, I wanted to um, introduce you also to this. So phonons are nothing but um, quasi particle for lattice vibration. So just like electrons or photons, you can also explain uh, something like, a, okay, something um, called a phonon spectrum, which is essentially um, just the energy dispersion or the energy distribution of your um, phonons. So these quasi particles are basically um, responsible for your everyday heat and sound transport in your materials. Um, the sound has low frequency in several Hertz. And then as you go higher in frequency, you have ultrasound and hypersound. Then you have heat, which is also transported as mechanical vibration or atomic lattice, and they are at higher frequency. So sound transports with lower frequency, but at long ranges, but heat transport at like terahertz frequency, but at short length scale. So if you want to manipulate your sound, you can build um, macrostructures or even microstructures if you want to manipulate hypersound. While if you want to study heat, we want to have smaller length scale. So nanofabrication becomes necessary and we are mostly interested in this energy range. So why do we want to um, manipulate sound and heat? Of course, the first thing is we are now miniaturizing our technology, our devices. So one of the main problem that we have in this case is heat management or how this heat can impede the performance of your devices. So if you can manipulate and control phonons, we can essentially have a better thermal management in these devices. The next thing is thermoelectric devices, which is just like a photovoltaic that converts light into electricity. You have thermoelectrics which convert heat into electricity through the Seebeck effect. So if you have a lot of waste um, generated in the form of heat, and if we can convert this back into electricity, this would be great. And of course, recently, uh, there has been report of using heat to um, store and compute uh, data. So phonon-based computing. And um, this is, of course, very interesting, not only from a fundamental point of view, but also application point of view. So in the next few minutes, I will tell you about different experimental techniques that we can use to study phonons especially ultra fast techniques. And then I will introduce you to the laboratory that we have. So if there are people here who are um, implementing techniques, I think this would be useful because we have been trying for the last couple of years to create techniques that we can use to study phonons. And this has been quite um, tedious and difficult. And then uh, finally, I will talk to you about couple of systems where we have we can use this or where we want to use these techniques. The first thing, of course, to study um, phonons is um, spontaneous Raman spectroscopy, which is very classical way of studying them, and we are all familiar with it. So this is, well, sorry, so <laughs> I don't see the pointer, but okay. So we have your um, sample or your atoms in the ground state, and then you excite them with light. And the two fundamental processes that happen when you excite a sample with light is of course absorption, reflection, and also transmission. But a very few percentage of this light gets scattered. And this is what we study in Raman spectroscopy. 
So this can basically be seen as a two photon scattering process where your light excites them to a virtual energy state and then they decay, ba um, decay back. And you have Stokes and Andy Stokes, which is usually studied using a very simple setup of a laser source sample, a spectrometer and electronics. And a typical Raman spectrum looks like this with the central wavelength uh, called something Rayleigh scattering when your scattered wavelength is the same as the incident. And then you have Stokes um, where you lose energy and Andy Stokes when you gain some energy. So I want to explain in this talk some advanced Raman technique. So before I go into it, um, it would be useful to know the classical picture behind um, spontaneous Raman. So we can consider your molecule uh, for simplicity, a diatomic molecule where you have two of your atoms connected by a spring and we consider a harmonic approximation where you have a mean position X zero and then a resonant frequency omega R. And this can oscillate, um, this can oscillate in that um, XF cos omega RT and Well, like this. And then when you give an electromagnetic radiation, E of T, which is basically your light, the polarizability of this molecule, uh, there is an oscillation. And under harmonic oscillation, you, you can approximate, well, you can approximate it uh, or you can expand it using Taylor expansion close to the mean position. And then basically the Raman effect comes from the variation in the polarizability of, of your molecule. So this induces a dipole moment, which can be written as a product of the polarizability and the uh, incident electromagnetic field. And when you expand it, putting the values of your electric field, electromagnetic field and the polarizability, you get something in this, uh, these three terms. The first term has the same frequency as your incident um, light, which is your Rayleigh scattering. And then you have two terms, which is omega P minus omega R and omega P plus omega R. These are basically your Rayleigh and, um, uh, sorry, your Stokes and Andy Stokes lines. And this is what you see when you measure your Raman. So these are the different processes that happen in your Raman scattering. So, um, I mean, we are not, I mean, in this talk, at least we are not interested in the spontaneous um, Raman. We are interested in how we can use ultra fast lasers to study the Raman effect. So we study this in our laboratory, which um, uses a yttrium um, solid state laser, which emits at 1030 nanometer at one megahertz uh, repetition rate. Our laser system is uh, equipped with the pulse picker, which just enables you to con uh, control your uh, repetition rate. So we can go from one megahertz to several kilohertz. And then on our optical table, we have four different optical parametric amplifiers. Two of them are non-collinear optical parameter, parametric amplifier, and two of them are linear, um, collinear optical parametric amplifiers. And of course, just like any other um, ultra fast laboratory, we have several delay lines on our table, which helps us to control the time delay between the pump and the probe. And we have all our beams coming onto our sample and they're focused using an objective because we are interested in studying the processes that happen at the nanoscale. And the light that comes out of the sample are detected in two different ways. So, we have um, a mirror which can basically be flipped into two different kinds of detection. One is based on um, a very simple balanced photodiode, which is then connected to a lock-in amplifier. This is useful when we know exactly what frequencies that we are exciting. The second is a little bit complicated, which we use a triple spectrometer, which has three spectrometer ratings um, connected to each other, and then a CCD. This is what we use when we want to study femtosecond Raman spectroscopy. So why do we want to investigate phonons through pump probe spectroscopy? So the first thing is that we can get uh, the phonons lifetime using a pump probe spectroscopy. The next thing is that we can see how the population of non-equilibrium phonons evolve over time. 
And we are also interested in st studying coherent phonons at, at the nanoscale. And um, as Michelle already said, we can use a pump probe spectroscopy to get information about electron phonon coupling in, in different material systems. The first technique that we have is a tunable time resource spontaneous Raman spectroscopy. So it's just like uh, the spontaneous Raman that I mentioned in the beginning, but now we have a pump and the probe. We measure the spontaneous Raman of the probe, but then you excite your sample using a pump and then you study the temporal evolution of the non-equilibrium optical phonons caused by the pump. And this technique basically studies the incoherent phonon dynamics in materials. So first of all, uh, in order to implement uh, Raman spectroscopy or any other um, optical technique, there are certain design parameters that one has to keep in mind. So in a pump probe spectroscopy, the energy resolution and time resolution becomes really crucial to designing the technique. So there is a fundamental limitation or there is an inherent compromise between your energy resolution and your time resolution in any pump probe, pump probe spectroscopy that you design. This comes from the uncertainty principle. So here on the right, you have a curve with the pulse bandwidth and pulse duration. So this is limited by uh, the uncertainty principle in, in such a way that if I want a really narrow pulse width, I cannot get a really narrow time width. So in any ideal setup, we should be able to choose where we want to compromise. Either we want a more energy resolution or you want a better time resolution. So this can be solved by something called a, a pulse shaper which is basically you have your incoming beam dispersed by a grating and then you use a slit which is you just physically cut off some part of the dispersed light so this way you tune the band if you cut some part of the bandwidth or the time so you can interchangeably choose between what you want or you can use a notch filter by which you choose a very narrow bandwidth and this way you can play with the time resolution or the um, energy resolution that you want. So in our setup, we have an optical parametric amplifier as the probe, and then we use a non-collinear OPA as a pump. There is a delay line between the pump and the probe and they go to the sample through an objective and then we collect um, the signal in the spectrometer dispersed by the gratings and then with the CCD you get the um, you get the spontaneous Raman of the of the probe. Just to explain this um, better, since we are measuring Raman, the efficiency of Raman process is really really low. It's not like uh, the tran um, transient absorption or transient reflection. The process happens in the cross section of Raman is really really low. So the efficiency of your signal or how well you can measure the Raman time resolved Raman depends on how good your spectrometer is. For this is why we use a triple spectrometer where you have three different stages and we use it in a subtractive mode, which helps us to prevent any stray light. To explain this um, technique better, there, th these are the results on uh, time resolved spontaneous Raman on silicon. So what they do is, um, they excite the sample with a probe first, and then they just do the spontaneous Raman of the probe. And here you can see negative time delays, which means there is no pump that the probe is preceding the pump. And then you see the spontaneous Raman from the probe, um, like a typical Raman signal from silicon at 520 centimeter minus one. Then the fourth one panel there is, zero picosecond, which means that your pump and the probe are coming at the same time. And then you have one up to 10 picosecond where the probe is coming after the pump. Then on panel B, you see something called Delta Raman signal, which is just your Raman signal minus the spontaneous Raman from the probe that is without the pump. So the first two panels on B is minus two minus one, which is just the spontaneous Raman from probe. So when you subtract it, you get zero. There's nothing more there. 
but from zero to one picosecond, you see an increase at increase of signal, which means now you have your pump creating a non-equilibrium population of optical phonons. So this uh, spontaneous Raman from the probe, the signal increases. And then you see a fast decay within 10 picoseconds, this delta of Raman dies away. So this is in agreement with, um, with what you would expect because you have a non-equilibrium population of electrons that are created after pump excitation, which then um, coupled to the lattice through the emission of optical phonons, which then decay as acoustic phonons into the lattice. So you see this within 10 picoseconds, they're gone. So this is in a way, this is how you study um, how the population of, of non-equilibrium optical phonons with time resolve spontaneous Raman. So Raman is indeed, spontaneous Raman is a very powerful tool. You can study a lot of things from your material using this technique. But however, the scattering is really, really weak. And if we want to use a femtosecond laser to get any useful um, signal from Raman, we have to scan for several hours, which is not practical. So maybe we need to use some um, advanced Raman technique to improve the efficiency. So how can we do this? We can do this by taking advantage of different resonant processes that happen in materials. These are called stimulated Raman uh, spectroscopy or coherent and stoke Raman spectroscopy. So in this case, we have two electromagnetic radiation, two beams that are incident on the sample. So just like how we see, um, how we saw in the spontaneous Raman, you have the diatomic approximation with connected through a spring with the resonant frequency, and then you have ES and EP, which are um, just two um, Raman pump and Stokes beam incident on the sample. And they also, uh, when you have two beams of two different frequencies incident, it causes some kind of beating, beating phenomena in your sample. And if the difference between the frequency of your pump and the probe are equal to the frequency omega r of the system, they go into resonance and we want to take advantage of this to increase the signal of your sample, signal coming from your sample. So just like how there was a polarizability induced by the electric field, now we have two, two electro, electromagnetic fields here. So we can um, see how they oscillate and we can get an equation, a motion for equa uh, equation for the motion of your how your molecules vibrate. And you see it's of this form. And when omega tend to omega r, you go into resonance. And you can still expand the polarizability or polarization in your molecule. And when you substitute all the values, you get two terms. One is a linear polariz polarization, which is what we see in the spontaneous. But now there is also a nonlinear polarization because of the two beams that you're using. And when you expand them, you can see that the frequency of these um, oscillations are two omega p minus omega s, two omega s minus omega p, and two of them are the same frequency as your incident um, pump and the Stokes radiation. And this resonant phenomena or this uh, radiation, this four kind of radiation from your nonlinear polarization is what we will take advantage of through uh, resonant uh, Raman scattering techniques. The first two are coherent Raman scattering. This is not something that we are interested at the moment. We are interested in the stimulated Raman or uh, loss and stimulated Raman gain. So these are the different uh, positions of the frequencies of these four processes. So what we are interested in is um, stimulated Raman gain and stimulated Raman loss is uh, cumulatively usually referred to as um, stimulated Raman spectroscopy. So in this process, uh, the important condition that you want to do is you have your uh, system and there is a certain vibrational mode for your system and you have to excite the sample in such a way that uh, the difference between the frequency of your pump and the probe is equal to the frequency or the vibrational mode of your system. Then the system goes into resonance 
So you excite the sample with a pump and then which is highly intense and then you put a smaller intensity probe and then what you see is that the photons will be transferred from the high intensity pump to the low intensity probe and then the probe experiences again and then we are measuring this gain. So by using this spectroscopy we get an increase in efficiency by 10 to the power seven times. So for example, if we were to do um, spontaneous time to solve Raman to get any reasonable amount of signal, we, we really scan for several, several minutes. But with this, we can do it in less than five minutes, let's say. So we can do the stimulated Raman spectroscopy in two ways. One is called a narrow band um, stimulated Raman spectroscopy. This is when we know the vibrational mode of your sample and we, we just pick the pump and the probe in such a way that the difference between the frequency of them are exactly the vibrational mode of your sample. But this would be very easy to detect because we can just use a photo detector connected to the lock-in amplifier and then just study the signal. But this is not really useful in samples that we don't know very well because we will have to change the frequencies at different times and then scan it over and over again. So an easier, easier way to do this is something called the broadband stimulated Raman, where you have your pump, which excites the sample, and then you use a broadband probe, um, a broadband probe, probe of different wavelengths to study this. So in this broadband of the probe, several vibrational mode of your sample is contained and hence you can detect it. But then detection becomes uh, more complex. So this is what we, we are interested in doing. So you have your, you have your um, narrow band pump and your broadband, broadband probe. So they are coinciding in time. But now we cannot use a photo detector to detect this anymore. So for this, we have to use a spectrometer and then a detector. So this is how a typical broadband uh, stimulated Raman spectrum will look like. The red curve is without the pump. It's just the broadband probe. And then the green one is the one with the Raman pump on. So your Raman signal is just on top of your pro, uh, of the probe, which gets enhanced. And then you subtract uh, the pump and the probe, and this is how you, you see the Raman signal. And this is really enhanced and really saves time and very useful when you want to do experiments. So um, as an example, I can, I will show how we will detect, for example, phonon modes from silicon. So we choose, well, so we choose um, pump and probe um, at two different wavelengths. So here we have our pump at 640 nanometer, which is really narrow. And the probe is quite broad. So to do Raman, we basically convert our wavelength into wave numbers. And we choose um, the window in such a way. Window is just the difference of the frequency that you use for your pump and the probe. And the delta, the omega two is nothing but the broadband of your probe. And by choosing appropriate um, width of your probe, you can see whatever photons that you want to see. For example, when we choose a probe of about plus minus 32 nanometer, we are able to see phonons in the window from 225 centimeter minus to 949 centimeter minus one. So this is something we use, for example, to see silicon phonons. So the last technique that we can use in advanced Raman is something called femtosecond stimulated Raman spectroscopy. This is the next step that we are implementing uh, from time-resolved uh, stimulated Raman. So before we had for time-resolved, we had two beams, which um, create this resonant process in your sample, and then you study the uh, phonon modes. But in 
femtosecond stimulated Raman, we have three beams which are incident on our sample. And you have the first narrow femtosecond pulse, which initiates a photoreaction in, in your sample. That is, um, yeah, so it excites your sample to this excited state. And this delta T here is a time delay. So instead of here, the probe are two beams. Usually you have a single probe, but here our probe is the entire stimulated Raman technique. So your sample gets excited from ground state to the excited state. And after delta T time, you send your stimulated Raman uh, pulse and your Stokes probe. So by changing this, by changing this delta T here, you can follow um, in real time how your photoreaction progresses. So these are the advanced Raman techniques that we use in our lab, but we also use something called um, transient reflectivity, which is um, comparatively easier to implement than the other three techniques. So this is also used to study um, thermal properties of um, materials. So when light excites your sample, there are different processes that happen. And then there is a modulation of the dielectric function of your sample in the excited state. And we are interested in studying the light that gets reflected from the sample. So for this, again, we use um, to non-collinear OPAs, which are incident on the sample, which is modulated by a chopper. And in this case, we use a simple uh, photodiode to detect the sample, and it goes to the lock-in amplifier. And the lock-in amplifier is, um, has a reference frequency of your chopper, which cuts the pump at regular intervals, and then and modulates your, sig your probe signal onto this. And this is how we study the reflected signal. And this, um, we developed this and at the beginning, since we were building this from scratch, we wanted to check if our setup was working fine. So we did some proof of concept measurement on silicon, gallium arsenide, all the traditional semiconductors. And we were able to observe different band gap renormalization and other carrier scattering processes. Next, we also did these measurements on graphene. Well, not graphene, um, thin layers of graphite because we had multiple layers. And we also uh, were able to verify that this technique worked for us, that for more than 10 layers of graphite hour decay times that we measured from our setup agreed with literature. Now, um, we, we are building all these techniques and we want to see where we can use this technique. So the first one, uh, where we are interested in um, using this technique is something called hydrodynamic heat transport. The traditional way of transporting heat or heat transport in materials is a diffusive heat transport. But there is also um, 50 years ago, there were prediction of uh, hydrodynamic heat transport, but they were only theoretically predicted to occur in at really small temperature window or at really small dimensions. But lately uh, with new first calculations and also a couple of experiments, people observe this transportation in graphite at high temperature. So we wanted to see if we can use our technique to measure this. So this happens um, when there is a, there are different kinds of scattering in your material for phonons when you want to study heat transport. The first one is, uh, momentum conserving normal scattering, and then you have momentum destroying scattering. But hydrodynamic transport takes place when your momentum conserving scattering is more than momentum destroying scattering. And in this case, there's a drift velocity for your phonons and they transport like a temperature wave. And this is called the second sound and we want to measure this. So we can measure this using um, transient reflectivity or also with time resolved Raman. The next thing that we want to study is uh, phonon engineering using nanowires. So nanowires are ideal platforms to um, create heterostructures because they have really um, small contact with the, with the substrate. So you can grow them on lattice mismatch substrates. And then by, by creating heterostructures, basically you are modifying the electronic band gap of your material and also your thermal properties and also hence 
the phonon properties. So the first work we did in our group was um, building a twin super lattice of gallium phosphide nanowire, which is basically uh, in pure zinc blend form, but you rotate your crystal grain at 60 degrees with respect to each other at a regular period. Hence, you create something called a super lattice, which is basic, which causes modification to the lattice. So the first we did some theoretical calculation using molecular dynamics. We see that in gallium phosphide pure zinc blend, you only have E2 and transverse optical mode. This is the pure zinc blend and wood site. So you have two peaks, but when you introduce um, the super lattice structures, there are some new modes that come into play because you have changed the lattice. So now you will study new phonon modes. Then we did spontaneous Raman measurements on them and we did see this new modes on them. And this is what we want to now study using um, time resolve technique because we want to see how long the coherence of these phonon modes exist. And we also want to study them in a different kind of super lattice, which is gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide super lattice nanowires, which is just, you have one layer of gallium arsenide, another layer of gallium phosphide. So this way, by changing the period, you also change your lattice constant, and then you will create new phonon modes. And we want to characterize them using this um, ultra fast techniques. So with this, um, I want to conclude my talk. I, I hope you get an idea about how we can use advanced Raman techniques to study different um, phonon modes or how we can use ultra fast techniques to increase the efficiency of Raman. And we can also use this technique to study different heat transport regimes and also to study phonon engineering. And I also want to thank my group and the SNF for funding this project, as well as the University of Basel. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, so we have some questions. Thanks for a great talk. I have a question about the uh, resonant enhancement of the Raman scattering yeah. that you showed. Um, if I understand correctly from the data, you showed enhancement of the Stokes processes. This, is, uh, it, is it possible also to enhance the anti-Stokes? No, this was anti-Stokes. This was anti-Stokes. Yeah, but they also did Stokes. So you can, I just put the example of the anti-Stokes. Right, so depending how you tune yeah. your, your wavelengths, and, you, you can choose to, exactly. to enhance one or the other. Yeah. yeah, and with the spectrometer that we have, we can either look at, there is a, Physically, you cut off your Rayleigh and then you can look at either Stokes or the anti Stokes, and then, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Uh, I have a question about the, the plant experiments you proposed uh, doing stimulated Raman scattering, broadband simulated Raman scattering yeah. following optical excitation. Mm -hmm. So that is a fifth order nonlinear optical process, uh, which are tricky because you get all sorts of spurious signals. Yeah. Have you thought about that? And do you know how you want to address those um, kind of ghost signals that you will yeah, probably so, get? Um, first thing is that, um, as I said, that the efficiency of this, of course, depends on what kind of spectrometer you use. So we use this triple uh, spectrometer where you have first two uh, gratings which move together and then the final one on the third stage which is a single one. So we can use it either in an additive mode or a subtractive mode. So we will use it in a subtractive mode where the first two spectrometer basically behaves as a filter for spurious signals. And then you use the third one to look at it. So I'm, I'm not so much worried about the frequency filtering because I think you can do that. So yeah. I'm worried about signals at the same frequency where you expect the yes. pump stimulated Raman differential measurements. Um, no, we haven't. Uh, I mean, we haven't measured in, a, in such a case, but yes, this, this could be a problem, but yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, because you said that when we use the broadband, you're saying that if we have vibrational modes, 
I think, we- yeah, just generally, there's this whole history of these very high, um, highly nonlinear processes. Yeah. You can get cascaded, right? So yeah. the fifth order is is uh, the same, ends up at the same frequencies as two cascaded third order processes. Yeah. And the third order processes have much higher cross section. So, uh, you know, often people have claimed looking at fifth order, but then in the course of time, it turns yeah. out they're looking at cascaded third order. So there's all these uh, signals yeah. that, that appear at the same frequency yeah. that yeah. you somehow have to be careful and test carefully that it's, you're really yeah. looking at what you think you're looking at. Yeah, this is true because we have been working for two years just setting up this and always finding yeah noise or your sick yeah we have all these problems and we're working on yeah no it's it's beautiful but very ambitious yeah <laughs> yes any other questions from the audience uh, i have a question in yeah. in regards to <clears throat> the second sound detection there yeah. have been a number of, of experiments recently which yeah. you wouldn't expect to see uh, this effect like in germania and so on yeah, yeah. so can, can you tell us a little bit more on how how your experiment would work in this situation so we want to uh, first thing is when we use stimulated ramen we want to measure the stokes and andy stokes line and then uh, from the ratio of stokes and andy stokes we can get an information about the temperature of your modes and then um, and when you have femtosecond stimulated you can also have the time delay so we want to see how this temperature mode evolves and then by fitting that with the theoretical model for second sound but this is very ambitious to do because we want to have like three beams so the first thing that we want the first thing we want to do is um, thermoreflectance so for this we can change how your pump and the probe are incident on your sample and by moving the pump and the probe at we want to see how the heat propagate in this and yeah but this is the first stage but the final goal is to use femtosecond stimulated to you using three beams to really look at the temperature of your phone on modes and see how they propagate how they propagate yeah. right. i see i see thanks yeah but at low time maybe starting at low online <clears throat> <clears throat> in your slide 27 yeah in, in your slide 27 uh, the amplitude of the pam pro signal changes sign as you change the number of layers can you comment on that ah uh, no this was not our work this was just to say that we did comparison and we didn't do for small layers because we couldn't exfoliate mono layers of graphene so we didn't see any sign change yeah. okay uh is there any other question so i think not uh so we thank uh speaker again so thank you very much Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back after the lunch. I hope you're all feeling refreshed and ready for this afternoon's session. Uh, a slight change to the program. We're gonna hear from Andrea Cavalier first. Um, he obtained his PhD in physics in 2010 from the University of Geneva uh, before moving to the Max Planck Institute in Hamburg for a postdoc. In 2013, he took up an assistant professor position at Delft and uh, during this time, he was awarded the Nicholas Curti Prize and an ERC starting grant. And earlier this year, he returned to Geneva as full professor in the Department of Quantum Matter Physics. So, Andrea, the floor is yours. Thanks for the kind introduction. I'm uh, delighted to be here. Thank you very much for having me here. And all the organizing teams. So today, I would like to discuss with you uh, topic of uh, manipulating the electronic properties of uh, oxide interfaces uh, using light. So the focus of my presentation is going to be the electronic properties of surfaces uh, and uh, interfaces of complex oxides and what we can do 
with uh, short processes of light to, to, ma to manipulate the, the electronic properties. And um, the work that I will be discussing was mainly performed by Dima Fanasiev and by Yori Tortensius. So Dima uh, now has started his own group uh, at the University of Nijmegen, uh, and Jorit has just obtained his, his PhD. And I would like to acknowledge also a great collaboration with Roberta Citro uh, and Boris Ivanov uh, for uh, uh, the theory of, of some of the some of the experiments that I will discuss, and also Eric Busquet and Andreas Sazani for the DFT uh, work uh, that I will be I'll be presenting. Um, so we are interested in, in oxide interfaces because we see them as, a, as an interesting uh, way to, to manipulate uh, the properties of, uh, of materials. So when we create a sharp interface between material A and material B, we can create an environment in which we can confine a, a system of, of electrons with uh, some in interactions that, that we can uh, tune. So we can define local uh, Coulomb interactions, hopping integrals, uh, magnetic exchanges, spin orbit coupling, and so on. And also, at these interfaces, we can control the geometric phases of electronic wave functions and have a handle on, uh, on the topology of the system. So both a control of symmetry breaking and, and topology of electron systems. And today I will be discussing the out of equilibrium properties of, of the system. So we can also think of perturbing the system with light, driving them with, with strong electric fields and uh, lead to uh, Hamiltonians with, with renormalized parameters. That's a little bit the, the broad uh, strokes uh, aspect of this research. And the key um, aspect of, uh, of this research is the fact that electrons can act uh, collectively in, uh, in quantum materials and uh, possess um, elementary excitations that carry an electric dipole. And if they, if they carry an electric dipole, you can drive them with, uh, with light that is uh, appropriately tuned in resonance with these dipoles. And I will be talking about the excitations of phonons uh, in a, in a uh, resonant way, and also of particular uh, charge excitations. And, it, and the idea is that if we bring the system out of equilibrium through a resonant uh, excitations, we, we can uh, stimulate order in, in materials. So we can create an out, of, an out of equilibrium state in which the uh, electronic uh, or phononic uh, energy functionals can be, can be remodulated and uh, new, new minima can, can appear in, a, or we can even uh, provoke phase transitions between, between uh, competing states. That's a, a paradigm of dy dynamical stability. And I would like to discuss uh, three examples. Um, so I will be focusing on the resonant excitations of phonons in uh, complex oxides um, uh, using lanthanum aluminate as an example, I will be discussing the excitations of uh, ultra-fast uh, strain waves and, 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 and phononic waves. Um, and, and I will apply this type of concept to the manipulation of magnetic interactions in a, a material called dysprosium orthophorite that has a very interesting magnetic transition. And then in the final part of the talk, I will be discussing the excitation of charge resonances and uh, how we can use this to excite uh, coherent uh, spin waves. In, a, in an antiferromagnet. All right, so the, the, this type of, of research in which we uh, drive uh, phonons with light uh, started in 2007 with the seminal work uh, of uh, Matteo Rini et al, um, where they, they showed that uh, by tuning mid IR pulses in, in resonance with a manganite, they could induce a insulator to metal uh, phase transition through a, a non-equilibrium uh, channel. So this, this opened up a whole, a whole research field in, in which uh, um, light is, is used to, to bring the electron lattice uh, out of equilibrium. Uh, we can create uh, crystal structures that, that exist for a certain amount of time uh, that uh, will not be stable otherwise. And in order to, to play this kind of game, uh, you need to produce uh, pulses of, of mid infrared light tuned in resonance with phonon modes that carry a, an electric field that is, is large enough uh, to be comparable with the electric fields at equilibrium in solids. So in the uh, covalent type of solids that we consider here, or ionic uh, covalent solids, um, we have electric fields of the order of 100 megavolt per centimeter. And uh, a laser pointer, to give you an example, carries an electric field of the order of 100 volt per centimeter. So it's not going to, to shake <laughs> much the, the atoms, even, even if tuned in resonance. So we need something a little bit more powerful. 
And um, in our lab, uh, we use uh, two optical parametric amplifiers seeded by the same white light, uh, and then a different frequency generation setup to produce mid infrared pulses uh, that we can tune in the mm -hmm. six to 18 microns range and uh, carry something of the order of five microjoule uh, per pulse. And they last uh, around, around 200 femtoseconds. Uh, so the corresponding electric fields of these pulses is, is of the order of 10 megavolt per centimeter. So with this type of pulses, we, we can uh, reasonably um, bring a lattice in, a, in an out of equilibrium uh, state. And uh, our, our idea is to in dynamically induce uh, lattice distortions. So this type of concept was introduced in 2011 in this uh, seminar work of first uh, and collaborators in the, in the group of Andrea Cavalleri where uh, they show that if you shine a strong enough uh, electric field, pulse electric fields in a material with a, with a nonlinear lattice dynamic, you, you can essentially induce uh, lattice distortions uh, out of equilibrium. So if your uh, electric field is strong enough, you can uh, produce an optical rectification of your, of your phonon field. And this corresponds to a displacement along a Raman active coordinate. So you, you shine light uh, at, at resonance with an infrared active phonon mode. And as a result, you uh, displace your, your, crust, your, your crystal along, along a, a Raman active coordinate. Uh, and this corresponds a little bit to apply pressure on, on very fast uh, uh, time scales. And I'm gonna give you an, an example of this type of uh, phenomenon uh, um, occurring in lanternum aluminate. So lanternum aluminate is an insulating material that undergoes a phase transition from a low temperature rhombohedral phase to a high temperature cubic phase. And this phase transition is accompanied by the condensation, by the softening of a Raman active mode, a A1G uh, mode. You see that uh, goes to zero around the 800 Kelvin. So this, uh, this, this lattice is, is soft, is, uh, is accompanied by a, a mode instability where in the, in the high temperature phase, you have a stable mode and in, in the low temperature phase, the mode becomes unstable. And, and this uh, realizes a, a rhombohedral symmetry. So naturally, you will have nonlinearities associated with this uh, with lattice dynamics, and this is what we are shown in this measurement here. So this is a measurement of, of time-resolved reflectivity at time zero. You come with an excitation pulse that is either resonant with the infraductive phonon mode or off resonance. Right. So if you are off resonance, you you have a very rapid decay. Of your, of, your, of your effectivity back, back to equilibrium and nothing interesting happening. But so this, is, this corresponds to the pump wavelength of 10 micrometers here uh, outside this, this phonon uh, resonance here. If you instead uh, tune uh, your, your pulses at 14.5 microns, where exactly where at the peak of the, of the phonon resonance, you start to see a coherent response. So, this, uh, this so here you come in with a uh, 20 terahertz mode uh, excitations and uh, you see a, an oscillation at uh, one terahertz. So this is a 1.1 terahertz mode that corresponds to this A1G uh, mode that it, it is associated with the, with the rhombohedral symmetry. So this is a coherent oscillation along a, uh, a uh, axis uh, that, is, that is along the 111 coordinate of the, the 111 direction of this, uh, this crystal lattice. And so this is extremely useful for us because this, uh, this type of structural mode control a lot of electronic properties of complex oxides. So from the uh, orientation and, uh, of these oxygen octahedra uh, patterns, we can derive fundamental parameters such as hopping integrals, magnetic interactions, and so on. So, so being able to, to manipulate uh, octahedral rotations on very fast time scales is an interesting way to, to manipulate uh, properties of complex oxides. Uh, the second phenomenon that occurs when you're applying a strong uh, laser pulse at resonance in, a, in an insulating material is a phenomenon called electrostriction. So this is a second order response of your crystal that, that occurs in every insulating material when you apply uh, an electric field of the order of uh, tens of megavolts per centimeter, elantrum aluminate, you have an expansion of the lattice of the C-axis parameter of the order of 2%. So when, you're, when you apply a... a pulse at resonance, you're going to have extinction of your, of your pump field within the, the surface of, of the crystal, and this will cause an expansion of your, of your C-axis parameter. And then naturally, this will lead to the creation of a strain wave. Oops. Uh, pardon. So, so this is what hap what's happening in this measurement here. So at time zero, uh, you're coming at resonance with the, with the funnel mode, 
you have a strong electric field uh, with an extinction depth of the order of, of a few hundred nanometer. And then uh, the creation of a, of a strain wave that starts to propagate across, across your substrate. And uh, from a, a polarization rotation spectroscopy that is based on the destructive and constructive interference of your, uh, of your uh, impingent uh, 800 nanometer laser pulses, you can uh, actually probe the, the propagation of, of the strain wave. And we actually see the propagation of two modes. One is a transversal strain wave, and the second is a longitudinal uh, strain wave. And uh, through this measurement, you, you can compute uh, their, their propagation velocities, the order of 4.8 kilometers per second and 6.7 kilometers per second. Um, so a, a, a longitudinal strain wave is something quite common that happens in, in every metal uh, that you can excite and, and has even seen, been seen in some insulators. Here is the first time that a, a, a transversal strain wave is seen in, in an insulator. Uh, and um, the interesting aspect is that you can, you can tune the intensity uh, the relative intensity of the transversal wave and the, the longitudinal waves depending on the, uh, the wavelength of your pump. So, so by, by tuning the, the photon energy in and out of this resonance, you have a, you have a complex uh, pattern of, uh, of intensities of the transversal strain wave versus the, the longitudinal strain wave. So we find this quite, quite interesting because we can uh, apply this transversal shear strain to, to manipulate properties such as ferroelectric polarizations, uh, magnetizations, and, and so on. So this is a very interesting way to break the symmetry of a, of a crystal. So when we uh, excite complex oxides at resonance, we have this uh, coherent uh, Raman response uh, that I showed first, and then these two type of lo longitudinal and transverse strain waves uh, propagating through this uh, optical, tr optically transparent uh, material. And um, if you have a thin film on top of this insulator, uh, for example, uh, an adimion nicolate thin film that has a low temperature antiferromagnetic state, you can use this to, uh, to generate a, uh, a propagating wavefront uh, across, across your, your thin film. So there is a, there is a, a melting of the antiferromagnetic order that, that occurs in your, in your thin film that is generated by, by this uh, impulsive uh, resonant excitation of the lattice right, right at, at the interface. So I don't have the time to talk about the details of this experiment. Um, I just wanted to show this as, a, as an example of, of what, what, what we can do. What I would like to discuss more in details is uh, manipulating a transition between order, order states in, a, in an antiferromagnet. So that was an example of a melting of, of antiferromagnetic order. What I would like to show you now is a transition between two order states of, of an antiferromagnet uh, called uh, dysprosium mortoferrite. So this brings me to the second part of the talk, which is about a lattice control of magnetism using the, the principle that I discussed here. Um, so if you consider a, a magnetic system that has a strong spinobic coupling, then in this type of magnets, you have typically a locking of the magnetization to the lattice. So if you, if you think of uh, squeezing the lattice uh, according to a certain pattern, uh, then the magnetization will, will, will surely follow uh, thanks to the to the spin orbit physics of, the, of, of these systems. And this is important if you want to switch the monetization from an, from an up to a down state, for example. So you, you need to overcome an energy barrier in order to switch a monetization. And the way this is done typically in a ferromagnet is by exciting a ferromagnetic resonance. So in, in this type of approaches that is typically used, uh, you excite a spin precession. Uh, so the, the frequency of, of, the, of the precession reflects the local curvature of the, of the potential here. Okay, I lost uh, my, my pointer. Okay, so it reflects the curvature of this, of the, of this potential. And uh, um, if, you, if you excite a large enough um, uh, amplitude mode, then this, this will uh, overcome the energy barrier and you, you will switch your, your, your monetization orientation. Um, what, I, what I would like to show you is that if you excite the lattice at resonance, you can actually manipulate the energy barrier itself. So rather than, than uh, jumping across the barrier, you, you, can, you can remodulate the energy barrier itself, leading to, to, magnetic, to magnetic switching. Um, the material that we chose for this type of study is uh, this prosium mortiferite. Uh, it's an orthorhombic perovskite characterized by a, a first order phase transition from a low temperature antiferromagnetic phase to 
a weakly ferromagnetic uh, high temperature field. So, and this, is, this occurs at the Morin uh, point uh, of 51 Kelvin. So, uh, this phase transition being of the first order kind is characterized by a competition between two energy minima in configuration space. So one, one uh, uh, related to the low temperature antiferromagnetic state with a, with a collinear spin arrangement, and the other one uh, with a high temperature weakly ferromagnetic state where there is spin counting in a net magnetization. And uh, at 51 Kelvin, the one, one minimum prevails over the other. And uh, this is characterized by an energy barrier of the order of a few million electron volt, which uh, gives rise to this, to this particular transition temperature. Um, what, what I will show you now is that if you shine a pulse of light that is, that is resonant with, with a phonon mode, uh, then uh, this will lead to a displacement of atoms along a Raman coordinate that will modulate the super exchange interaction between ion and dysprosium. Uh, this will change the ma magnetic energy landscape and favor the switching from the antiferromagnetic state to the, uh, from the antiferromagnetic state to the ferromagnetic state. And the system will develop a magnetization. Um, and key to these experiments is uh, to measure the, the dynamics of the potential or the magnetic potential energy landscape. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, if you excite a spin wave in these systems, uh, this, uh, uh, the frequency of the spin wave will be a measurement of uh, the local curvature of your, of your magnetic potential. So measurement of spin precession. So therefore we performed uh, mid IR pump experiments uh, uh, Faraday rotation probe experiment. So this is, so we come with a, with a mid-infrared uh, laser pulse. And then uh, we measure the, the, the transmission of a probe pulse and it's, it's Faraday uh, rotation. And the, the angle of the Faraday rotation is uh, proportional to, to the monetization projection uh, along the, the, the propagation direction in this system. And the monetization here is, is arising from the uh, ion three plus uh, ions of this, of this system. Um, so, uh, if we excite the system off resonance, so with a, with a pulse uh, of the order of 170 milli electron volt, then uh, through a Raman uh, process, so an impulsive stimulated Raman process, we excite spin waves in the system. Uh, uh, so and the, the frequency of the spin waves of the order of 150 gigahertz. So this corresponds well to other Raman uh, measurements at equilibrium of, of the system. Uh, however, if uh, we tune of our laser pulse um, to be resonant with the phonon mode of this prosium orthophorite, so 85 milli electron volt. So this is a ion oxygen stretching mode. We see that the, the, the frequency of the spin wave is renormalized. So there is a, a very pronounced redshift of the, of the uh, oscillation frequency of, of the spin waves down to 120 gigahertz. So this directly reflects a change, uh, so a softening of the, of the magnetic potential of the system. Uh, we, we can perform the same experiment in the, in the high temperature weakly ferromagnetic state. And in, in this case, we see a hardening of the other magnetic potential. So a, a shift of the, of the magnon uh, frequency up to higher, uh, to higher frequencies. So what is going on here? Oops. We have a technical issue. Uh, I don't see the, the PowerPoint anymore. Yeah, the, PowerPoint the PowerPoint like collapsed. Back. Why is Hybrid meetings are always tricky. Okay. They, they cannot hear. 
Maybe you can just Mm, the pointer. Mm, okay. Now you're going to see the presentation in a flash. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I showed you a, a renormalization of this of the spin potential uh, seen by by the system when we excite the phonons at, at resonance. And here I'm showing you the, the whole uh, data set of uh, precession frequency as a function of photon energy of the pump. Uh, the red points are measured in the, in the low temperature antiferromagnetic state, and the blue points are measured in the high temperature uh, weakly ferromagnetic state. And you see that uh, as soon as you approach the phono resonance, uh, in both phases, the potential gets, gets renormalized. So um, this is directly indicating that we are modifying the magnetic energy landscape when, when we are uh, shaking the lattice of, of, of the system. And it takes a certain amount of time for the magnetic energy landscape to, to recover back its equilibrium state. So we're creating an, an out of equilibrium state with a softer or a harder uh, spin potential. So this, this happens on, on the time scales of the, of the uh, first uh, spin procession. So a, a sudden jump within, within this, uh, this type of uh, time delays. But then it takes something of the order of 100 picosecond in the high temperature phase to recover back to equilibrium. So this is measured through a measurement of the uh, frequency of the spin waves versus time. So if you measure uh, later and later, you see that uh, gradually the, the frequency of your, your spin wave goes back to its, uh, to its equilibrium value. Um, well, in the, in the low temperature phase, it, it's, the recovery is much more rapid, the order of, of 40 picosecond. So there is a fast settling and a, and a long uh, lifetime of a new magnetic potential that has been uh, changed by uh, resonant phonon excitation. So through this uh, type of measurements, we can actually reconstruct as a function of time, how the energy landscape looks like. Uh, and we see that we have created a metastable state uh, with a, with a uh, uh, flatter, flatter potential. Now, the question is, if we uh, excite the system with a, uh, with a very weak, uh, pulse, we can, we can generate this metastable state. But if we excite the system with, with a very strong laser pulse, can we actually uh, induce a transition from this state down, down to this one? So if we pump the system strong enough, can we obtain, can we obtain a, uh, a switching, uh, so a, a reorientation of, of our spins and induce uh, this type of phase transition through an out of equilibrium pathway? And so this would be a transition between two uh, order states. And this is shown in this uh, measurement set here. So at equilibrium, uh, our system is in the low temperature collinear antiferromagnetic state. If we excite the system with a, with a fairly weak pump pulse, we observe a harmonic spin dynamics and a decay back to equilibrium. But if we crank up the power of a laser, we start to see a strongly nonlinear spin dynamic uh, and a development of a, of a net uh, monetization, a net further rotation in, in, in the system. So this corresponds to a transition from a, from a spin collinear uh, orientation to a, a, a non-collinear uh, uh, state with, with a net uh, monetization. And you see that the switching occurs within the first uh, period of the, of the spin procession. And uh, this is a, a threshold type of process. So we need something of the order of a, a four or five milliwatt in order to, to, to get this, uh, this net monetization to, to develop this, uh, this magnetic switch. Um, why is, is this interesting? Um, so this, uh, this is a, an approach to, to switch a, monet, a monetization that uh, is ex extremely fast and uh, occurs through a, through a non-equilibrium landscape. And, and so here I'm emphasizing that the transition from this uh, collinear state to this non-collinear state with a monetization uh, occurs within the first uh, uh, precession uh, uh, cycle. We can compare this type of, of dynamics so obtained through phonon pumping with a charge transfer excitation. So in, we, in the same material, you can choose instead of exciting a phonon resonance to excite a charge resonance. So this is at much higher photon energy, 2.3 electron volt. So this corresponds to a, to a, a transfer of charges within the orbitals 
of this uh, of this of this material. And you see that in this case, you do indeed uh, excite a spin precession that starts to oscillate around zero. So this is like an excitation from the uh, from the um, um, electron system to to the spin system. But then uh, this this excitation gradually uh, heats up the lattice, induces the transition to the high temperature phase, and your magnetization starts to develop. So through a charge transfer excitation, it takes something of the order of 100 picosecond to develop uh, humanitization. While uh, through a phonon pumping route uh, within the first cycle of, of your spin precession, you, ha you have your, your, uh, your transition between, between the, two, the two states. So th these are two different pathways. One, one is going through an incoherent heating of the lattice, and the other one is going through a, a process that is directly um, giving energy to, to, to the lattice system. Um, so what, what we like about this is that it's a it's an example of a, of a modulation of the of the fundamental uh, super exchange interaction in the material uh, acting directly to the uh, with the lattice. Um, and this brings me to the final part of my talk, um, where I want to show you a little bit uh, about uh, exciting charge resonances. So charge resonance can also be very interesting. Uh, in order to develop a, a antiferromagnetic spin transport approach. So as, as Tobias showed this morning in his very nice talk, um, there's a very uh, uh, strong research effort being, being done in developing uh, antiferromagnetic spintronics. And uh, the reasons are quite obvious. So in, in an antiferromagnet, you can, you can propagate uh, angular momentum at, at very high uh, uh, frequencies in, in the terahertz range. And the, the propagation speed or the spin waves, so the given by the dispersion um, uh, shown here, can be can be very fast. So it can be something of the order of twenty kilometers per second in, in antiferromagnet. So the, the way uh, people are normally approaching this uh, this problem is to uh, drive some spin currents by some thermally driven spin accumulation, and this relies on some uh, incoherent diffusing diffusive spin transport. Um, what we are interested in is to uh, induce um, spin precession in, uh, in, in antiferromagnets that uh, propagates uh, across the material. And uh, uh, in, in antiferromagnets, the, the typical frequencies are, are dictated by the magnetic anisotropy and by the exchange interaction. And this naturally sets uh, the, the, the spin wave frequencies in, in the terahertz range, as opposed to the gigahertz range of, of ferromagnets, where only the magnetic anisotropy is, is playing a role. Um, so the uh, antiferromagnetic spin dynamics uh, have been have been uh, investigated uh, previously through through impulsive excitation in in transparent uh, antiferromagnet, but, but typically uh, people have observed uh, coherent motion of the uniform spin, spin procession modes. So uh, the uh, propagation of, of antiferromagnetic uh, coherent spin waves has been uh, until recently uh, not not observed. And the, the idea uh, that, that we had in, in Delft um, was to um, rely on, on charge excitations in order to confine the, the excitation of spin waves to a very small uh, surface region of, of your sample. So, so we like always, always to work with surfaces and interfaces of material. So if you excite now a charge excitation at resonance, you can have a very sharp uh, confinement of your optical excitation on the skin depth uh, of your of your system at resonance, which which can be below 100 nanometer, and this uh, if if this is uh, communicating with the spin system, you can set in a magnon wave packet, and uh, the magnon wave packet now is uh, can have a very broadband character thanks thanks to the um, very sharp uh, profile of this of this charge excitation that, that we can obtain at resonance. So this, this is the idea. So we are relying on a, on a naturally occurring optical absorption of the same material that I discussed before, this prosium orthophorite, uh, where uh, when you approach a resonance at uh, four uh, electron volt, there is a there is a very sharp uh, confinement of your of your light field in the, in the sub fifty uh, nanometer range. Okay, so this is a, a transition between uh, two orbital states of the of the ion system. And um, when, we, when we measure further rotation, uh, so this is a transmission type of, type, type of measurements, we are only sensitive to uniform spin precession. So, so the, the Q equals zero mode of the system. Uh, 
But now if you switch to a care rotation type of type of measurement, then we can uh, have an, an extra degree of, uh, of sensitivity here because now we can have a, a Bragg reflection occurring uh, from between the, the light pulse and, and the, the propagating spin wave. So by, by controlling the angle of incidence of our, of our, uh, of our uh, probe pulse, we can also be sensitive to a specific uh, part of, the, of, of a non-uniform non spin precession. So this is the, the part that, that satisfies the, the Bragg conditions. So you can also see this as a, as a Brie 1 scatter. And uh, this is shown in this measurement here. So if you perform a Faraday rotation measurement uh, after excitation of a, of a, a very sharp uh, uh, charge resonance of the system, um, the Faraday rotation measures the uniform mode. So 175 gigahertz frequency. But if we now come with a curve uh, uh, rotation type of measurement, now we, we become sensitive to a non-uniform propagating uh, spin wave and we, we can pick up a specific uh, portion of a, of a propagating wave packet. In this case, uh, one that has a frequency of 225 gigahertz. Um, so this, this corresponds to this specific uh, portion of the, of the dispersion re relation uh, with, a, with, a, with a specific wave vector of the order of 140 nanometer. Um, so how, how is this happening? So we, we are coming at resonance. Um, our, our charge excitation is, is imposing a very sharp profile of, uh, of absorption of, of light within the material, which, which dies down in, the, in a space of about 50 nanometer. And this is setting in a, a broad uh, wave packet of, of, of propagating spin waves that has approximately this type of, type of shape. And with this specific measurement that I showed before, we are sensitive to this particular component of the, of the propagating uh, wave packet. We can also uh, tune uh, our uh, uh, sensitive uh, conditions uh, to change uh, both K0 and, and gamma, so the angle of our, of our uh, um, of our uh, probe, and this, this allows us to map a portion of, of the of the Brie 1 zone, and and follow the dispersion relation of the spin waves. And you see that so the 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 gray line is not a fit. So the gray line is a measurement of the spin wave dispersion of, of this material, and on top uh, the the colored points are our uh, selected portions of of the wave packet packets uh, measured. So the a few spectral components that that, that we that we can access. So from these measurements, we can actually uh, measure the uh, dispersion uh, of our spin waves and the velocity of their propagation. And we see that we have a propagating spin wave going at, at about 12 kilometers per second. Uh, so which is in between uh, the speed of sound of this material and the theoretically maximum accessible spin wave propagation, which is the, the linear uh, slope uh, at, at the edge of the, of the Brion zone of this, uh, of this system. Um, as you can see from, from this set of measurements, if we move away from, from, the, from this sharp uh, charge resonance, we completely lose the propagating wave packet. So uh, if you excite the system at 3.2 electron volt, you, you still see a propagating wave packet. If you excite your system below this range, you, you cannot probe any, any, any more uh, propagating components. So uh, the amplitude of this, uh, of this propagating component depends crucially on the confinement, uh, so on the penetration depth of your, of your pump uh, pulse. So the, it's very important to have a confined uh, excitation. Um, so now, now if you measure the, the, this propagating spin precession at long time delays, uh, you can now estimate uh, the decay time uh, so that the, pro the propagation length of this uh, coherent uh, uh, antiferromagnetic wave packet and we see that uh, this, uh, this, uh, this wave propagates at supersonic velocities. So I showed you before 12 kilometers per second and goes up to of the order of one micron in, in propagation. So something that is reasonable to start to, to create devices and uh, to, to manipulate um, angular momentum on a, on, a, on a realistic device. Right, so this uh, brings me to the conclusion of my, of my talk. So I discussed the control of magnetic interactions with light and of, of propagating spin waves. And uh, 
uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, we have moved uh, at the beginning of this year uh, from Delft to, to Geneva, and we have several postdoc and PhD uh, open positions funded by the ERC and by the Moore Foundations and by the University of Geneva. So we are building up the group in, in Geneva. So if you're interested in, the, in this type of stuff, I'll be very deli I'll be delighted to discuss with you possible projects. But thanks very much for your attention. Okay, thank you for the, for the nice talk. Do we have any questions in the room? Thank you for the very nice talk, very interesting materials. Mm. I have a question about the drill when kind of measurements that you did. So when you're mapping the dispersion relation, you change the angles, but um, I would assume that you only get information about the surface propagating, or do you also get some information about what's happening in the bulk? Right, so we see a propagation, a propagation from the surface up to about one micron within, within the bulk. And um, after that, the, the spin wave has, uh, has decayed. So what uh, we would like also to do is to design some in-plane propagation now. So now, instead of uh, uh, confining the, the field within the, the skin depth, so within the, the software, it would be nice also to, to consider in-plane propagation by uh, using cavities and, and propagating the, the, now the spin waves also in-plane. Um, but um, let's say that this, this one micron uh, length is kind of uh, in intrinsic. So, so this is dictated by, by the, the dissipation the mechanisms of the system, which is, which is again through spin orbit coupling. Uh, so I would say this is quite uh, a, a value that is set by, by material parameters. Okay. It's possible that there are other, maybe other antiferromagnets that may have longer mm -hmm. uh, propagation distances. Um, but um, I do not know if we can compete with uh, uh, ferromagnets and uh, extremely long uh, propagation yeah. lengths. Um. That was wonderful. Thank you. I have a, a question. You showed, um, I think you, you excited at 16 microns or so, one of your samples. I for, forgot which one. And then you see this uh, coherent oscillation at one terahertz. Do you, do you understand how that, let's say, mode conversion is occurring? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the, uh, the mode conversion was proposed uh, originally by a theory uh, from uh, Merlin and uh, collaborator. And also um, it was investigated through uh, more GFT type of approaches in the group of Antoine Georges. The idea is the following, that uh, when you excite to a large amplitude an infrared active mode, and you have a nonlinear lattice response, this corresponds to a rectification of your, of your phonon mode along a Raman coordinate. So, so this is a QIR squared QR uh, coupling. So you're coupling the square of your infrared active uh, coordinate with a, a linear um, coupling with a, with a Raman displacement. Uh, and this is the most, you know, the, the first order nonlinearity that, that you can consider in a, in a lattice. So this is symmetry allowed uh, within this, this type of crystals. So, and there is a specific Raman mode that is symmetry allowed. in this couple. And if you want this, this uh, displaced Raman coordinate, so it's oscillating, but it's not oscillating around zero. It's oscillating around, around a, a finite displacement. And then it is lo it's slowly decaying, right? right? So, so this corresponds to uh, um, you know, shifting your, your atomic position along this Raman coordinate and uh, allowing them to, to relax and, and drive them yeah. over, over, over a, a certain time scale. Yeah. Uh, and there are also other types of nonlinearities that, that we can consider. So there are other theoretical proposals of uh, higher order nonlinearities that can occur in materials with a broken inversion symmetry. Uh, yeah, just a follow up question on this. So, so does that mean that terahertz is generated because of your pulse duration? So with a different pulse duration, you would get a different frequency? Uh, very important point. Yes, yes. So what I didn't show here is that uh, you, you also need your pulse to be short. Uh, so this is, if you want, it's, it's, a, it's a Raman process. Uh, a little bit like, like what, you, uh, what you showed before, uh, that is enhanced at, at the phonon resonance. 
So you, you do need indeed to, to pick up uh, the, the frequency differences within 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 your pulse. So you, you need uh, a, a broadband enough uh, pulse in order to. So, and this has been measured in the same material that I show lanthanum aluminate very carefully by the group of Steve Johnson at, uh, at PSI and ETH. So they, they've done the whole study uh, where they compared the electronic conventional Raman scattering to this uh, lattice enhanced uh, Raman scattering. And they showed that there is a very strong enhancement by these phono resonances of this uh, Raman process. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll just have a look if there's any questions online. Okay, perfect. Then we can thank our speaker again. And next up, uh, next speaker will be joining us online, Chiara Ciccarelli. Um, she completed her undergraduate master's studies at the University of Rome in 2008. Uh, then she received her PhD from Cambridge, University of Cambridge in 2012, after which she held a junior research fellowship until 2016. She started her research group at the Cavendish Laboratory of a Winton Advanced Research Fellowship. And since 2019, she is a Harding lecturer. Chiara, we can see your slides, so you're good to go when, when you're ready. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, for the invitation. I haven't seen you for too long. It's good to see you. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah okay. I, I, am, I have to catch a plane, so we shifted with the other. I hear a noise. I don't know where it's coming from, but... Um... Yeah, okay, so I'll carry on. First of all, apologize. Uh, I'm literally five minutes away from the conference venue, but I, I've been shivering with fever uh, during the whole night. So I prefer to, to do this talk remotely, not to infect anyone. Um, anyway, so the, the, the topic uh, of my talk today is uh, spin to charge conversion. Uh, which is a topic that interested us for, for quite a few years now as a group in Spintronics. The reason is that uh, uh, this is what allows us to, to read out the magnetic state of a magnet or magnetic dynamics like spin waves and magnets electrically. And electricity is a much more localized way to read out a magnetic state in comparison to optics. So it favors more compact memories in the context of computer memories. Um, so there are essentially two ways which allow, which we find more interesting and which are mostly explored today in spintronics to convert a spin um, information into, into a charge uh, electrical signal. The first one is based on the break of space symmetry combined with the spin orbit coupling. The second one is based on using a, a, a spin to charge transducer external with respect to the spin source, which is the magnet. Okay, so we've dedicated a few years to studying the first effect, which is based on the break of space symmetry. Uh, so just to, I would like to spend a few words on it as a matter of completeness. Um, when we have the break of space symmetry, this results in the lifting of the bands, uh, of the spin bands in momentum space. So this, is, uh, this naturally sets a correlation between the spin orientation of carriers and their momentum K. So this means that in general, we have a band structure that looks like this. So if no electric field is applied, then all the bands, the sp both spin bands are equally occupied. So we don't have any uh, non-equilibrium spin uh, in used in the, in the, in the system. Um, however, when we apply an electric field, so we induce a, uh, we induce a, a net direction of motion for a net value of momentum K, then this also results in a net non-equilibrium spin. And this uh, electrically induced non-equilibrium spin uh, is not necessarily aligned with the magnetization of uh, the magnet where the symmetry is broken. Um, so in principle, uh, it can exert magnetic torques. And this is at the heart of uh, the, the famous spin orbit torques which we, uh, we studied in many different materials, for example, in half Oisler compounds, which have an inversion as symmetric unit cell. So in this case, the symmetry is broken directly in the bulk of the ferromagnet in the unit cell. But we also studied uh, uh, system in, in systems in which the uh, symmetry is broken at interfaces, for example, um, between a ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet, or more recently, um, by using organic materials like C60s. Um, now, it turns out that the break of symmetry uh, gives us um, two different possibilities to convert spin information into, into a charge signal. Uh, the first one is with the emergence of a new magnetoresistive effects, which we uh, discovered recently. 
Um, so in spin orbit torques, uh, what people uh, normally uh, do is to uh, apply an electrical current, and this results into a non equilibrium spin in the in the ferromagnet with a with a break of symmetry. And this component is perpendicular to the magnetization, so it's able to generate torques. Now this magnet resistance effect uh, is instead correlated to the non equilibrium spin collinear with the magnetization. So this collinear component is not able to generate torques, but it turns out that it, it experiences a def different scattering, so a different resistivity, depending on whether its spin orientation is parallel or anti-parallel to the net magnetization of the ferromagnet. And you can see this as a sort of uh, bulk giant magnet resistive um, magnet resistance, which is the workhorse of, um, of reed heads in, uh, in, in hard disk drives. Um, this magnet resistance is unidirectional, so it allows us to distinguish two opposite directions of the magnetization, which is something that other magnet resistances, like the most common anisotropic magnet resistance, cannot, cannot do, uh, and which is very beneficial for the purpose of uh, reading out opposite bits, for example. Now, the second possibility that we have to perform a spin to charge conversion, where we have a symmetry break, it relies on the reciprocal effect of the spin orbit torques. So the spin orbit torques are generated by the break of space symmetry. Um, time reversal symmetry is not a requirement. So uh, in principle, we expect a reciprocal effect uh, where reciprocity, by reciprocity, I mean, I, I mean um, Lars on Sanger reciprocity. So reciprocity means uh, stay, is valid when we have the possibility to interchange cause and consequence. So this implies that we need to preserve time reversal symmetry. So because time reversal symmetry is, in, is reserved, in, 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 preserved in this case, then we expect a reciprocal effect. So this means that if in, in, in spin orbit torques, we induce a non-equilibrium spin by applying an electrical current in the reciprocal effect, we have the opposite. So if we generate in the magnet uh, a non-equilibrium spin population, this will uh, also have a net moment. So when this um, population relaxes, it does so unevenly in momentum space, and it leads to a net charge current. The easiest way to generate a non-equilibrium spin in a ferromagnet is to excite ferromagnetic resonance. So we carry these measurements in the microwave region of the spectrum, so not ultra fast. Um, we excited for magnetic resonance and we read out the, a microwave voltage uh, output. So this graph here shows the amplitude of the microwave voltage emitted by the ferromagnetic bar, and you see a peak um, corresponding to the uh, uh, resonance field. Uh, this microwave voltage had the same frequency of, uh, of, the, of the precessing magnet, and by uh, comparing its amplitude and symmetry to the theory, uh, to the theory uh, developed by Arndt Bratas, we were able to confirm that what we were measuring is actually the reciprocal effect of spin orbit torts. So in, with respect to the first case, um, this allows us to, to read out the magnet a dynamic state of the magnetization. So it, it allows us to read out magnon spin waves. And that's why we called it magnonic charge pumping. But now let's go to the focus of, the, of this talk, uh, which does um, it, it instead relies on a different way to convert spin into charge, which is uh, um, a very much um, studied way in spintronics and relies on using an external spin to charge transducer, usually a heavy metal like platinum or tantalum. These materials are very precious in spintronics because they exhibit uh, uh, the spinol effect. The spinol effect uh, it was introduced already by Tobias very briefly when we pass an electrical current in these uh, thin films uh, of platinum, for example, um, the spin-dependent scattering results in a transverse uh, spin current, which then leads to the accumulation of opposite spins on the two sides, on the two opposite interfaces. Vice versa, there is an inverse effect. If we inject a spin current in this thin film uh, heavy metal, this is uh, converted into an electrical current. And the electrical current JC, the spin current JS, and the polarization of the spin current sigma are correlated by this cross product rule. So they're orthogonal to each other. So because we have these very nice uh, elements that uh, automatically convert spin into charge, the only thing we need to uh, bother to, to, carry, to, to, to care about is how we now inject the spin from the source, from the uh, magnet into this uh, uh, external transducer. There are essentially two ways to do that. The first one is coherent spin pumping, where we, as we said before, we excite the coherent precession of the magnetization. This results into a non-equilibrium spin, which then diffuses into the, the platinum layer, for example, and is converted into a charged current measured electrically as a DC voltage. 
The second way is to uh, via incoherent spin pumping, where the non-equilibrium spin uh, in the magnet is generated by incoherent magnets, um, which uh, uh, then uh, again, um, and this non-equilibrium spin then diffuses in the platinum. Thus, this, these incoherent magnets are generated, for example, by a temperature gradient. And this is uh, what is usually referred to as uh, the spin Seebeck effect. Now, um, so the spin Seebeck effect is uh, normally uh, has been is normally studied in uh, by using techniques that are uh, in the DC or quasi DC or up to the microwave frequency range. Um, now you understand that when we uh, use this second uh, method of converting spin into charge, um, we need to be uh, what becomes really crucial uh, to assess its its efficiency is really to understand the efficiency with which we can transmit uh, we can transfer spin from the magnet to the heavy metal. Okay, so we need to really understand the spin transfer process at the interface. But in these slow measurements uh, of the spin Seebeck effect, uh, for example, then it turns out that uh, um, the, 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 the signal that we read out electrically is not only sensitive to the spin transfer uh, at the interface, uh, but also to the spin transport properties of the bulk ferromagnet. So this uh, uh, spin transparency, if you want, or spin mixing conductance uh, is very hard to, to isolate. Uh, so this is the, the, the picture that we have on the, on the slow spin Seebeck effect. A temperature gradient basically causes a, a gradient in the Boltzmann distribution of magnets in the bulk. Um, these magnets diffuse then towards the interface, inducing a non-equilibrium spin at the interface. Uh, and then um, this is again converted into a, into a charge signal. Uh, but because um, we're sensitive basically to magnet spin transport here in the bulk, we can see this uh, re reflected in the heat thickness, uh, in the ferromagnetic insulator thickness dependence of the spin Seebeck uh, signal, which you can see it saturates when the thickness of the magnet is uh, comparable or larger with respect to the spin diffusion length of magnets in the bulk. And we can see this bulk spin transport also reflected in the temperature dependence on the spin Seebeck voltage, which you can see is characterized by a peak, where the uh, initial increase as we go down in temperature is correlated with uh, uh, an increase in the spin uh, diffusion length of magnets as we go down in temperature. And then the, the following decrease as we go approach zero Kelvin is instead correlated to an overall decrease of the Boltzmann population uh, of magnets. Uh, as we go to, to zero temperature. So in principle, so in general, the, the spin current uh, is, um, is, is, is described by a few parameters. The spin mixing conductance here is what really describes the spin transfer process at the interface and what we're interested in uh, isolating in understanding. Uh, but other parameters depend on the bulk uh, and are very hard to isolate in this uh, type of measurements. However, also in these low measurements, it became uh, obvious that uh, there is a, a strong contribution from the interface. Uh, for example, if we take the temperature dependence of the spin Seebeck effect, you see that the position of the peak uh, strongly depends on the nature of the interface. Um, so if we keep using YIG as a spin source, um, uh, we see, and by different spin to charge transducer like tungsten or platinum, we see very different positions of the peak. But then if we inter put an interlayer of copper, we see that the position of the peak uh, is the same. Uh, so the interface plays really an important role. And uh, how do we uh, uh, isolate this? How do we understand uh, the, the, this, uh, this, this role and isolate it from bulk effects? The, uh, the approach is to use faster techniques. So for example, uh, time resolved uh, terahertz emission spectroscopy. Uh, this is a layout of the uh, experiment of the experiment uh, set up and of the um, device that we use for this experiment. Um, we have a hundred nanometer uh, thick YIG, um, um, which surface we treated with piranha etching, and then we spattered the five nanometers of platinum on, on top. Um, now we used uh, a, a 50 femtosecond optical pulse uh, to drive this barrier system into non-equilibrium. Um, and this non-equilibrium uh, trigger is what triggered the spin transfer from the magnet into the platinum. Now, because of the inverse spinal effect, any spin arriving into the platinum is then converted into a charge pulse, which then results into the emission of electrodipole radiation with uh, a bandwidth in the terahertz uh, region. So by reading this, uh, so what we do, we read out this terahertz emission via electro-optic sampling um, with a, a one millimeter thick 
Sinclair-like crystal, uh, which basically determines the bandwidth of our measurement uh, between 0.2 and 2.5 terahertz. So the amplitude of the emitted terahertz is directly proportional to the spin arriving uh, into the plasma, so, so the spin transferred from the magnet uh, to the plasma. And there are other proportionality parameters which depend exclusively on plasma, for example, the spinol uh, angle, which determines the, the, the magnitude of the spinol, inverse spinol effect. Lambda S is the spin diffusion length in plasma, and Z omega represents instead the impedance of the Bellier system. So first three evidences that what we are, the terahertz emission that we're reading is uh, uh, indeed generated by the inverse spinal effect in platinum. First of all, the terahertz emission that we read out is composed of two different components. One that, that, one that does not depend on the polarization of the optical pump. The other one depends on the polarization of the optical pump. Um, the one that depends on the polarization is uh, even in magnetic field. And we correlate it with the optical rectification. Now, both YIG and the substrate on which YIG is grown, GGG, are symmetric, but uh, strain at the interface can result in a gradual deformation of the lattice uh, and therefore in the break of symmetry, so, um, which then leads to a non zero uh, second order electro optics uh, constant. So, in principle, it's possible to, to have to observe this in, in geek platinum uh, samples. Uh, but the component we're mostly interested in about is this uh, um, component here that does not depend on the optical polarization and which is odd in magnetic field. Now, the fact that this component does not depend on the polarization tells us that uh, um, whatever the mechanism generating the terahertz pulse uh, is, uh, um, is uh, sensitive to thermal effects, uh, probably. Um, also, the fact that this component is odd in magnetic field uh, is in agreement with the symmetry of the inverse null effect, uh, because flipping B corresponds to flipping the spin polarization um, of, uh, uh, of the spin currents arriving um, uh, from the yig into the platinum. Uh, the third evidence that we have is that by flipping the sample with respect to the optical propagation length, we have a flipping in the sign of the terahertz emission. And this is expected, again, from the symmetry of the inverse null effect, because this corresponds response to flipping the direction of the spin current, which always goes from the magnet into the platinum. So, but now we need to make sure that uh, um, we have established that the terahertz emission is indeed produced by the inverse spinal effect. We want to make sure that really we're sensitive only to uh, surface contributions, to interface contributions to spin pumping. And uh, to do that, we, we can um, just, uh, um, we can make a few considerations on the time scales involved. Um, when we have the optical pump arriving, uh, um, pumping in the, it, it, into the bilayer system, the E-platinum, a great part of the energy is absorbed by the free electrons in platinum, which are quickly heated up. Um, and uh, the, uh, after this, they, these electrons, the hot electrons start to thermalize very rapidly with the phone bath with a typical time scale of 280 femtosecond. How do we know that? We know that from transfer um, uh, reflectance uh, measurements. Um, shown here, where you see uh, a very rapid increase of the electron temperature, which then decays with a time constant of uh, 0 0.28 picoseconds. After this time, we can then safely describe the electron bath uh, as a Fermi Dirac distribution at an increased uh, temperature with respect to ambient temperature. The other thing that we learned from transfer reflectance measurements is that they change linearly or quasi linearly with the with the pump fluence as expected, but also they don't uh, um, they don't depend strongly on the ambient temperature. So um, these transient reflected measurements give us uh, 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 information, an empirical information on the increase of the electron temperature in platinum, which we can assume to be. Um, uh, in the fluence, in the low fluence that we use, we can assume it to be independent on the ambient temperature. Okay, then uh, after these electrons are heated, um, there are they start to thermalize with the environment. Now, uh, the thermalization mechanisms that we're interested about are those that involve magnons, because these um, because these thermalization mechanisms are those that generate that lead to the generation of a spin current and the photo spin pumping. And there are two possible routes for this to occur. 
one first route is via direct electron magnet scattering mediated by the exchange interaction, JST exchange interaction. The second route involves phonons, but this second route is, uh, is a slower route. Um, a phonon magnet interaction is in, in the order of hundreds of picosiphons in YIG. So um, these slower processes are filtered out by our fast detection mechanism. So we can safely assume that the spin currents that we're reading out are indeed generated by the direct electron magnet interactions. And this was actually also uh, confirmed by nice measurements by Tobias Kanfra, where they uh, extracted from the terahertz emission um, the time uh, trace of uh, uh, the spin currents and correlated it to the uh, transient reflectance measurements. And the two time scales overlap pretty well, uh, meaning that the spin current follows, um, follows pretty much the, the temperature uh, of the electron bath in platinum. So it's generated by direct electromagnetic interactions. Okay, so this is the temperature dependence um, of uh, the uh, spin, the ultra fast, if you want, the, the optically induced spin transfer in our um, in our geek platinum sample, um, which you see it. Uh, so the terahertz emission, so the spin current uh, keeps increasing towards lower temperature with a power law of uh, T temperature to the third. Now, if we compare these measurements to the slow measurements of the spin civic effect, we see that the, there is a clear difference with the two. Uh, we don't see the same peak structure that was observed at low temperature. And this is because in, in, in this case, we are not uh, relying on a bulk magnon spin transport, but the magnets are those excited directly by the hot electrons in platinum. Uh, and it, the, this power law is actually very similar to the power law observed for a higher temperature range, so from 300 up to the Curie temperature of, of YIG, both in fast measurements carried by Tobias Kanfrath, but also in slow measurements uh, of the spin civic effect. Um, and we can understand this because as we go higher in temperature, then the magnet propagation length becomes shorter and shorter, so we become more and more sensitive to interface effects. So it makes sense that the power law with which the spin civic effect decays at higher temperatures is the same that we, that, that we measure for lower temperatures, but with faster techniques. Okay, but now we really get an, a, a new opportunity uh, to study the, the, the spin transparency with, with antiferromagnets. Antiferromagnets are, are quite uh, um, studied at the moment in spintronics because of the fast spin dynamics, um, which, uh, uh, which allow ultra fast spin uh, pro processing and, and computing. Um, antiferromagnets have a much richer um, um, spin wave spectrum, magnet spectrum, and, uh, um, and for this they offer new opportunities for understanding the spin transfer at the interface. So the main difference with ferromagnets is that um, they, the, the magnet uh, spectrum is characterized by the opening of a gap in the density of states. So this means that uh, in order to excite the coherent mode of precession, we need to apply a minimum energy, um, which corresponds response to H omega zero, where omega zero is the um, frequency of precession. We also have that uh, at uh, zero magnetic field, there are two possible modes which we can excite and which are characterized by opposite chiralities. So they carry opposite spin momenta. This degeneracy is lifted by applying a magnetic field up to a spin flop volume, after which the nail vector of the uh, antiferromagnet uh, flips orthogonally with respect to the magnetic field. And then we have a quasi-ferromagnetic mode, very similar to the Kittel mode that we measure in, in ferromagnets. And as we increase the magnetic field, the two uh, moments of the antiferromagnet count towards the magnetic field inducing a net moment. Okay, so the spin civic effect in antiferromagnets has also been studied uh, by using uh, slow techniques uh, to, not, to, to date. And um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the spectrum of results that has been obtained is also much richer with respect to that obtained in, uh, in ferromagnets. Uh, for example, two, 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 two uh, antiferromagnets have been studied uh, uh, particularly um, belonging to the same family of uh, uh, difluorides, manganese uh, uh, difluoride and uh, iron difluoride. So in manganese difluoride, uh, the temperature dependence of this low spin civic effect is characterized by um, a temperature, uh, a peak uh, at low temperatures. This peak has been reproduced by the theory by simply translating the theory of magnon uh, bulk transport uh, developed for ferromagnets into antiferromagnets. So again, we can uh, understand this peak structure in the same way we understood the peak uh, in, uh, in the ferromagnetic uh, experiments. 
Iron defluoride, on the other hand, has a, um, a different uh, temperature behavior because in addition to the lower peak, uh, to the peak at lower temperatures, we also see another peak around the nail temperature, which is not reproduced by the theory. And uh, uh, this peak around the nail temperature is, uh, um, is, uh, is the peak that is probably most sensitive to surface effects, to interface effects, uh, because as we, as we said, as we go up in temperature, then the uh, magnum spin diffusion length decreases uh, and we become more sensitive to the interface. Um, so the, um, this has been partially correlated to the critical behavior of the susceptibility, but this is strictly only very uh, valid for temperatures above the nil temperature. So uh, an explanation of uh, this peak below Tn um, and the fact that the, the, the behavior strongly depends on whether the magnetic field is perpendicular to the nil vector or parallel to it, uh, as you can see here, it has not been provided. So we try to shine light on this uh, by using our ultra fast uh, measurements technique. And in particular, we consider two antiferromagnets, again, belonging to the same uh, family of three fluorides this time, potassium cobalt fluoride and potassium nickel fluoride. These are interesting materials that have been considered, uh, um, they've been studied a lot in the 60s and the 70s. Um, they're considered um, uh, almost model system for Heisenberg um, antiferromagnets. Um, they curie, we have characterized the Curie temperature with uh, the net temperature with squid measurements, 117 Kelvin in potassium cobalt fluoride and uh, 245 Kelvin in potassium nickel fluoride. Now, these materials have a cubic structure with the opposite neighboring spins, um, and the, the nail vector can point in any one of the cubic directions. So in principle, we can have three types of domains, uh, one uh, with a nail vector on the 1, 0, 0 direction, along the 0, 1, 0 direction, or the 0, 0, 1 direction. Okay, so um, the first uh, um, important thing uh, for us is to quantify the gap in the magnet density of states. Um, and we can do this by measuring the, the, the frequency of the coherent mode, uh, which has been done by Davide Bostini, which collaborated with us on this project via pump probe measurements. Um, so you can see that uh, the, the, the magnitude of the gap, um, which corresponds to this value here, is about 97 gigahertz in potassium nickel fluoride, but it's about an order of magnitude higher in potassium cobalt fluoride, 1.1 terahertz. So these two materials are also very interesting to compare because they, despite be, have, having a very similar magnetic and, and, um, and crystal structure, they have a pretty different value of the gap. Um, also, um, we, um, another reason why they're interesting is that their domains are pretty large in the range of tens of microns, and it's relatively easy to orient them with low fields, um, which are reachable in our setup. So we can reach uh, fields up to 0.87 Tesla. Um, now, as we said, there is uh, one way to, to, to reorient the nail vector is obviously to go through the spin flop transition, um, which in this case is, uh, in, in the case of these two materials, is pretty high. So we have in potassium nickel fluoride, we need to apply at least uh, a value of the field of around three Tesla. And for potassium cobalt fluoride, it's even higher. But it turns out in these materials, there is another way to reorient the nail vector, which is via domain wall motion. Uh, so when we apply a field uh, at a critical field of only 0.5 Tesla and 1.5 Tesla in uh, potassium cobalt fluoride, we induce the irreversible motion of domains, which promote um, the domains with the nail vector perpendicular to the field at the expenses of those with the nail vector parallel to the field. So, um, and we confirm this with squid measurements, um, where you see that uh, as a function of field, we, we see the moment increasing at the, at the critical field that, um, that we stated here. So, uh, because we in our measurements, we apply an intermediate field of 0 0.8, we expect that while in potassium cobalt fluoride, there are domains with an L vector parallel to the field in potassium nickel fluoride, we have domains with an L vector predominantly aligned perpendicular to the field. Um, and this makes uh, a big difference in the magnet spectrum, um, because in this case, where we have uh, domains with an L vector parallel, then we have the opening of a gap in the density of states, uh, while in this other case, we have pretty much the quasi ferromagnetic mode and therefore no gap in the density of states. And we can see how this affects spin propagation in our system. So we use the same setup pretty much. We treated the surface of the antiferromagnetic insulators with uh, with a um, polishing technique and then sputtered platinum. Um, 
again, two signs, uh, three signs that we see uh, the terahertz that the terahertz emission originates from the inverse spinel effect. First of all, if we eliminate one of the two elements, either the antiferromagnetic solator or the platinum, we don't see any emission. So. For, to see an emission, we need both the spin source, the antiferromagnetic insulator, and the spin to charge converter, which is the platinum. Um, then uh, we see that the terahertz emission does not depend on the pump polarization index of a thermally driven effect. Uh, and also it has a, a very defined polarization in the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field that we apply. Um, and finally, a flip sign if we flip the direction of the sample relative to the optical propagation length. So all, all these uh, observations are compatible with the symmetry of the um, inverse spinal effect and with a thermally driven uh, effect. Also to reflect very rapidly on the time scales involved, uh, we see that in magnon phonons interaction times are different in potassium colferite and potassium nickel ferrite, but still they are slow in with respect to the bandwidth that we access in our measurements. So we can safely exclude uh, that phonons uh, give us a, a substantial contribution to the spin transfer. And we can assume that electron, direct electron uh, magnet scattering is the mechanism that leads to the spin pumping. So let's go to a more microscopic description of the effect. So the Hamiltonian that we considered is uh, um, made by an Hamiltonian that describes the ferromagnetic insulator, an Hamiltonian that describes the platinum, and then we have the part that describes the uh, exchange interaction between the two. Now the, the spin, uh, um, um, now when we, so how do we generate the spin current? So when the optical pump arrives, uh, we have a heated electron uh, temp, um, uh, population in, on the platinum side. Now these uh, hot electrons undergo spin flip scattering mechanism and via the spin scattering mechanisms, they excite magnons. Now, because platinum is non-magnetic, uh, in principle, we can have two types of scattering mechanisms, which lead to the generation of uh, magnons with opposite spin. Um, it, moreover, in uh, as we said, in antiferromagnets, uh, the two magnons population, the two opposite spin magnet populations are degenerate if we apply zero magnetic field. So in principle, both of these spin scattering mechanisms are equally probable unless we break the degeneracy by applying a magnetic field. So we don't expect any spin transfer if we don't apply a magnetic field. Um, the spin current that originates can be calculated uh, by using Fermi, uh, Fermi um, golden rule. So effectively calculating the probability of the spin flip scattering in both cases. So we have two different terms, one corresponding to the first spin flip scattering, the second one with a negative sign because it leads to an opposite spin um, current corresponding to the second spin flip scattering. Um, so we have that uh, this term here describes the, um, the difference between the uh, Bose-Einstein distribution for the electron hole pairs in the platinum. Um, uh, and this is the magnum distribution in the, uh, on the ma uh, magnetic side. So this is effectively uh, proportional to the uh, difference in temperature between the two populations. Uh, this is the density of states of magnons. Um, we have these two terms that describe the clap and unclap processes in the antiferromagnet. This is the um, scattering rate. The scattering rate is directly proportional to the exchange as the exchange interaction between the free electrons in the platinum and uh, the uh, localized spins on the magnet side. Um, and then we also have uh, this uh, mu s here, which describes the spin accumulation on the platinum, um, so you, which acts as a, a with a positive speed um, feedback effect. So you need to think that after magnet creation, um, the, uh, these magnets pump spin back in the platinum, causing a spin accumulation. And obviously, if we change the spin accumulation on the platinum side, uh, this uh, uh, will uh, favor one spin flip scattering with respect to the other. So it will alter the probabilities of the spin scattering event. Um, and this is taking into account with this term here. And third, what is important to understand the amplitude of, the, uh, of this uh, probability is the overlap between the density of states of magnets and the density of states of the free electrons in platinum. So you see that below the nail temperature, where we have the opening of the gap, um, we see that the overlap with the Fermi Dirac distribution of electrons is not much unless we apply a high fluence. Uh, optical fluence that changes the temperature of the electrons uh, uh, significantly. Um, whereas close to the nail temperature, the magnon gap closes and we have a much better overlap between the electron uh, bath and the, and the magnon gap. Um, so 
Um, so let's see now what the experiment tells us and how it compares to the theory. The first thing that we see is that in both cases, uh, the spin emission, the spin uh, symbolic effect is linear with the magnetic field, um, as we would expect in the case of uh, um, nail vector parallel to the magnetic field, because we need this to lift the degeneracy, but also in the case for a quasi for magnetic mode, because as we increase the field, we increase the induced magnetic moment. You see here, there is a small hysteresis in the case of potassium cobalt fluoride, which we correlate to a ferromagnetic element present probably at the interface, uh, but uh, this ferromagnetic component is not correlated with, a anti with the onset of antiferromagnetism because it does not disappear above the nail temperature. Um, now, the temperature dependence um, of the uh, spin seabeck effect is very different in the two materials. Uh, we see that in potassium cobalt fluoride, it is characterized by a peak at the nail temperature and then a decrease uh, below that. And we see also that above the nail temperature, while it does not depend um, significantly on the pump fluence, it does so uh, below the nail temperature. Uh, for, sorry. Uh, so in the case of potassium nickel fluoride, on the other hand, we see that the uh, trend is completely different, uh, very similar to YIG. Uh, it keeps increasing towards lower temperature and does not depend on so significantly on the pump fluence. Um, so now, if we compare this experiment of potassium cobalt fluoride with the theory, we see that the theory fully captures uh, uh, the main elements of the experimental observation with the, um, the peak around the nail temperature and also the strong fluence dependence on the uh, at low temperatures. Uh, for what concerns the, the potassium nickel fluoride, this is uh, for the quasi, um, this is very similar to YIG. Actually, if we plot the two things uh, um, um, as a function of the renormalized temperature, we see that they overlap pretty, pretty well. Um, so in this case, uh, th this suggests that the temperature dependence might, uh, in, in a, in a um, uh, dispersion, when the dispersion modes is, uh, it, it does not have any gap, is mostly dependent by other parameters. For example, uh, the, uh, for example, the, um, the temperature dependence of the spin lifetime in platinum, which is what determines the spin accumulation in platinum and which acts as a positive feedback effect in the spin pumping. So with this, I would like to conclude um, saying that we have uh, um, extracted the uh, interface uh, contribution of the spin transfer, the spin mixing conductance in both ferromagnetic, paramagnetic bell layers and anti-ferromagnetic, paramagnetic bell layers. And we have seen um, evidence that the spin transfer is uh, uh, highly affected by the opening of a magnet gap in the density of state. Uh, I would like to thank for this work uh, Farhan Khalid, my PhD student who did most of the experimental work, but also collaborators uh, on the uh, material side, um, Russell Coburn, Dorothy Petty, and Jason Robinson in Cambridge, but also Roman Pizarev at uh, the Yoff Institute, uh, and Joe Barker who helped us with, uh, with the theory. Thank you. Let's talk. Um... Probably didn't hear the applause, but we had some nice applause here. Do you have any questions from the room? Or I can have a look at the online chat. Let's have a look. Yes. Ah, they're earlier. Okay. okay. Do we have any questions in the room? No. Okay, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. And our next speaker and final speaker today will be Akshay Rao. Um, he completed his undergraduate degree from uh, the University of Delhi in 2006 and his Master in Science from the University of Sheffield in 2007. He obtained his PhD uh, in 2011 whilst working in the group of Professor Sir Richard Friend at the University of Cambridge. And then from 2011 to 2014, he held a junior research fellowship. Uh, in 2014, he started his research group at Cambridge and is both an EPSRC Early Career Fellow and Winton Advanced Research Fellow. And also in 2009, he was appointed to a Harding Lectureship. So, Akshay, we can see 
we can see your slides and the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. Can you guys hear me all right? Yeah, hopefully. All right. Um, if I'm not audible, someone shout out. All right, let me begin by thanking Klaus for organizing this great workshop. And my apologies, I couldn't be there personally, uh, last minute visa issues, but uh, hopefully I'll be able to make a small contribution to this. So my group is based at the University of Cambridge with a mixture of physicists and chemists based at the Cavendish Laboratory, which is the physics department here at Cambridge. Here are some nice sunny pictures of Cambridge. It is sometimes sunny as well. In fact, the weather just, stained, just changed over here and it's very sunny at the moment. And uh, me and my group are interested in this idea of energy materials. So as all of you know, the world is undergoing a transformation in the way we generate energy and also the way we use energy. And this is to sort of reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and move to a more renewable and sustainable energy supply. And uh, from a science point of view, this creates a lot of exciting questions and exciting opportunities to study new materials uh, and kind of uh, with a range of new functionality. So this sort of goes across semiconductor materials for things like solar cells, lighting, high power electronics, to batteries and thermoelectric. So there's a whole range of materials for energy generation, storage, and also use. Uh, so these materials provide a kind of a wide range of in interesting questions. And uh, since we're kind of, you know, our, our topic today is about ultrafast and beyond, the question is, you know, what can we contribute to this area, right? So we have very complex material systems uh, as we have seen today and as I'll kind of continue to show you. Um, and these are kind of highly interdisciplinary areas which span conventional boundaries of physics, chemistry, materials, and even biology. And can, you know, our kind of methods, ultrafast methods really make contributions here? So obviously, as you would have guessed, our premise is that yes, they can. And we specifically think that optical spectroscopy and microscopy can provide sort of both fundamental insights and also help drive device and materials design. And I'll tell you a few stories in not a great amount of detail today, but I'll kind of jump through a few areas to show you some of the work we're doing and why we think these are kind of promising areas. So our group itself works in four areas. So we're interested in electronic and structural dynamics. So combined um, you know, electronic and nuclear motion, things like what Julia was talking about in the first talk this morning. We do a lot of microscopy work. And we also then try to use the concepts we have learned from our spectroscopy and microscopy to develop new materials and devices. But for today's talk, we'll focus just on the kind of microscopy work we've been doing optical microscopies. And I'll give you two examples of those. So what is, what is our kind of primary question with this microscopy, right? So if we, if we consider the materials that led to sort of the ICT revolution, materials essentially basically silicon-based materials or silicon-based devices, uh, or if we look at classical semiconductors like gallium arsenide, one of the common things is that these are very well understood materials. They're very homogeneous materials, right? If you study a silicon wafer or a gallium arsenide wafer, if you excite one point and study it with spectroscopy or microscopy and you excite another point, you can pretty much be confident that those points will be exactly the same, right? So over decades and decades of work, we have gained a great amount of uh, control over the growth of these materials to the point at which, you know, you can quantify the number of defects on your fingers, basically, right? Now, if you look at the newer kind of materials that we're interested in for novel photovoltaic applications or batteries or thermoelectrics or LEDs, et cetera, one of the common features is that these materials are actually quite disordered. And that disorder is actually intrinsic to their nature. So, you know, a battery material undergoes phase changes and there's nothing that you can do about it. That's in fact intrinsic to its nature. So a lot of these materials have dynamic uh, interfaces. They have dynamic structures. A lot of them are disordered. They're processed from solution, things like this. And so disorder comes with the package. And so the question is, how do we understand these new range of materials? How do we improve their functionality when disorder at the nanoscale is, is part of it? Right. And so the challenge that uh, that we're after, um, so I, I just got a message here. Can you guys see my slides, actually? Or is that working? Nope. Yes. Okay, right, fine. Thanks to the people in the chat. Um, right, so the challenge we have across a range of different materials, if we look at molecular semiconductors, if we look at uh, hybrid organic and organic perovskite materials, um, if you look at two-dimensional semiconductors, 
These are all have disorder at the nanoscale, but they also have interesting non-equilibrium dynamics on kind of sub 100 femtosecond timescales, right? So there are dynamics which are interest across a range of timescales, but for the purposes of today's talk, we'll be focusing on these really early time dynamics. So the question is, how do we how do we study these materials? How do we kind of close this loop, right? We need to be able to study uh, these materials on their native length and time scales for the processes. So that means we need to study them on femtosecond time scales, but with nanometer spatial precision or resolution. So how do we do this? Now, this idea of probing kind of below the diffraction limit is of course well established in other fields. Uh, the most important thing being structural biology. So many of you would have heard about super resolution microscopy. This is now kind of very standard technique in biology developed over the last 20 years. It's uh, of course was given the Nobel prize in 2014 and it's been a revolutionary technique in biology, right? So the idea here is that you stochastically pinpoint photoluminescence emission events, and then you can build up a sub uh, diffraction limit resolution image of your system. So in structural biology, this is completely revolutionary. No good bio biochemistry lab would not have a uh, one of these super resolution microscopes now. It's a very standardized technique. And the best case is you can get resolution down to two nanometers. So this is an amazing technique, but from a physical sciences point of view, it's not that useful because you know, unlike uh, in biology, we can't tag things with green fluorescent protein. Many of the things we're interested in don't emit. And of course, this kind of technique intrinsically has no resolution in it, time resolution in itself, right? You're waiting for emission to happen. And so that uh, that's an intrinsic limit. So what we want is really some kind of technique that gives us very, very fast time resolution, but also some kind of spatial dimensionality. Now, Julio did a great job early in the morning, uh, kind of explaining pump probe spectroscopy and how you can do pump probe spectroscopy at very, very fast time resolutions. So um, myself personally and my group has learned a lot from Julio and the, the group in Milan over the years. And uh, so of course, what we know how to do from that interaction is build pump, fast pump probe setups. So we did something that was the most obvious thing is we took a fast pump probe setup and just combined it with a wide field microscope, okay? So this is really the simplest thing that you could possibly imagine, but as I'll show you, it turns out really uh, turns out to be really powerful. So the idea here is very simple. We take our pump pulse and probe pulse, and then we have uh, in this cartoon here. Let's say there's a nanostructure represented by this wiggly line that is of interest if we want to study. So we excite that nanostructure uh, with a diffraction limited pump pulse, right? So focus down to the diffraction limit, about a seven femtosecond pump pulse. So that's represented by the green circle here. And then we come in and we probe what happens as a function of time with a wide field probe pulse, right? So that's this larger kind of orange pinkish uh, sort of circle you see here. And then we image that onto a CCD camera. So what we're doing here is that we're taking snapshots in time of the spatial distribution of our excitations. So what you can imagine happens is we come in at early times with our fast pump pulse, we create a spatial distribution of excitations, which will basically follow the, the kind of spatial distribution of the pump pulse, which is a Gaussian, right? So you create a kind of Gaussian excitation profile and then that will evolve in time. So stuff will then move in time. And then you can imagine that you come in at some later time and take a snapshot of this and another snapshot and so on and so forth. Now, everything here is limited by diffraction. You can't sort of cheat your way through the diffraction limit, but you can kind of sidestep it. And what we're doing here is if we're gonna compare images in time, so we're gonna compare an image at say 20 femtoseconds to an image at 30 femtoseconds. And what then happens is that when you're comparing these images, when you subtract images from each other, you aren't limited by diffraction. You're just limited by uh, essentially your signal to noise because you're just kind of taking, a, taking two mathematical functions and, and subtracting them. And what that allows us to do is to very, very precisely localize in space stuff that moves, right? So if my distribution of photo excitations change in space, I can watch that changing evolution, the, the sort of delta of the spatial distribution with very, very high uh, uh, precision. And essentially we can now routinely get 10, uh, sub 10 femtosecond time resolution and sub 10 nanometer spatial precision, okay? So this is kind of an interesting and uh, relatively simple implementation in some ways of a pump probe microscopy uh, technique. There are other things we can do. We can we not only have two dimensional spatial uh, precision, we have three dimensional. So that is we can track things in all three spatial dimensions. We can do this at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, we can use terahertz pulses to kind of drive, uh, drive the system of interest, et cetera. So 
all in all, what the tool gives us is a kind of ability to probe photo excitations and their flow in time and space with very high accuracy, right? And here's just a so few of the people who worked on this over a number of years. And I should mention, we did a lot of the early work on this with Professor Philip Kakura, who at the University of Oxford, who some of you will know. So Philip was instrumental in the original development of this technique. And here are other people from my group who have kind of been working on this for the last four or five years now. So let me kind of give you a, a snapshot of what we can do with this technique, a couple of kind of uh, interesting results, and then we'll move on to some other stuff. So we'll start with a very, very basic question, uh, which is which is this one, which is, you know, what happens in a photovoltaic material just after photon absorption, right? So obviously the answer is charges are generated in some form or the other. And the question is, how do those charges then move? Okay. So if you pose this question in a quantum mechanics class, you go to undergraduate quantum mechanics class, uh, the answer is, well, you know, you have a band structure for your semiconductor and you'll have a hole in an electron and they'll move at the band dispersion velocity. However, if you go into your semiconductor device class, people will talk about, you know, uh, drift and diffusion and kind of a, effective mass and things like this, right? So we have a semi-classical picture on one hand, uh, which is the device picture of how the device works. And then we have the quantum mechanical picture of waves and, you know, ballistic motion on the other hand. And so the question is, how is the device really functioning? And where is the crossover from the quantum to the semi-classical regime in actual uh, materials and devices, right? So we're going to take a test system to, to look at this. These are uh, metal halide perovskites, which are kind of very much the rage in, in photovoltaics have been for the last almost 10 years now. These are very high performance yet solution process materials. Highest device efficiencies are now at 25.6%, which is very close to what silicon can do. But the mobilities of these materials are relatively low, right? So uh, this mobility value of 40 is almost the highest you can get in the literature. Normal mobility values are below 10. Uh, and so that's actually very low uh, sort of mobility compared to things like gallium arsenide. Yet these materials work really well in, in photovoltaic. So the question is, you know, is slow charge diffusion and slow extraction of charges uh, able to explain the high performance that we see in these materials? So we're going to do our pump probe uh, microscopy experiment in this. So we have this sub 10 uh, femtosecond pump pulse. We're going to come in and then image in wide field what's happening. So the data is here on the top. You can see essentially we, at time zero, we create our photo excitation profile. And then hopefully you can see visually that this is just expanding in time, right? So these are snapshots now taken of this two-dimensional profile uh, every few femtoseconds. And you can see that this profile is, is sort of expanding, right? So this spatial profile is expanding. And then on the bottom, you, can, you have the kind of the best fit to the data. And you can see your sigma. So there's the spatial profile of the distribution is increasing dramatically, okay? And you can sort of put this on a graph. And what you get is, uh, is lines like this, where if you plot the mean square displacement, uh, you can see that this is sort of a alpha equal to two behavior. So we were looking at ballistic transport here. These are different kinds of films. You can go in and control morphology of perovskites to various processes, et cetera, add in more defects, uh, process better, things like that. The important number that we get out of this is that you know when you make a nice film, uh, which has kind of uh, fewer grain boundaries, more single crystal regions, things like that, you get a, a kind of a velocity uh, or rather a distance that, the, that your carriers travel just in the first few femtoseconds after photo excitation of up to 150 nanometers, right? So, you, so in this first 30 femtoseconds, when the charges in in a, are in a non-equilibrium distribution before carrier carrier scattering is kind of kicked in or while that's happening, your carriers move up to 150 nanometers. So this is an incredibly large number because the devices are only about, you know, five, 600 nanometers thick in terms of their active layers, okay? So what does this number mean? What, what is the kind of physics of this number? So if you go off and do a band structure calculation, uh, you know, we find that the number, the velocity we measure, the transport velocity, which is about five into 10 to power six meters per second, actually matches to within a factor of two or three of the band dispersion, right? So what you take, if you take the derivative of the band structure, your kind of band dispersion velocity, this is a pretty good match with that. Okay, so what we're looking at is essentially this non-equilibrium transport, as you would predict from a kind of relatively simple band structure quantum mechanics picture, is at play at early times in these materials within the actual photo photovoltaic layer of the material. So what does that mean for the actual device? So you can say you can build a relatively simple model, take into account you know uh, the optics of the, of the solar cell, the active layer thicknesses, etc. Build a transfer matrix model of this. 
And you can work out that up to 25% of the carriers in your device would actually hit the charge collection layers ballistically, right? That is to say they are not kind of, uh, they don't have enough time to scatter, localize, and then move kind of in an effective model. They actually just fizz through this active layer and would hit the charge collection layers ballistically. That doesn't mean to say that they'll be extracted ballistically because there are charge collection layers on either side for electron hole, but they will reach that layer um, within about a, you know, 50 femtoseconds of that initial photo excitation event. So this is something very interesting because of course, ballistic charge transport is not something that we put into normal photovoltaic models. If you look back in the old literature, right back to the Bell Lab days, it is actually something that they talked about at the very, in the very earliest days, uh, the papers from Bell Labs do mention this of when they were kind of discussing the first photovoltaics. Uh, but since then, if you look in kind of any photovoltaic textbook, this is not really part of our normal models. We not normally talk about drift and diffusion and things like this. So this kind of just shows that that boundary between the kind of quantum and the semi-classical can actually be further along than we could norm than we would normally think. So just to highlight, this is some work from Ju Yang Sang, a postdoc of mine, who is now a professor back in Korea. So let's take a step into a different kind of material class, and we'll talk a little bit about excitons now instead of charge carriers, that's electrons and holes, in molecular semiconductors. So as many of you know, uh, in molecular semiconductors, upon photo excitation, you form strongly bound electron hole pairs or excitons. And these excitons can kind of move with a, in, in a variety of different ways. But if you were to pull and put them on a spectrum, you'd say at one end, there's localized site-to-site -site hopping as kind of given by Foster resonant energy theory. And then on the kind of opposite side of that, if you had a really strongly coupled system where your chromophores are very strongly coupled, you would have kind of delocalized excitons which could move coherently, right? Sort of in a wave-like manner. And the kind of the regime you'd operate in would be controlled by your underlying materials property, right? So typically in solution processed organic semiconductors, the kind that are found in organic photovoltaics or organic LEDs and things like that, you have a large amount of structural disorder, you have high dynamic disorder and relatively weak interchromophore coupling, right? So these are kind of very disordered systems with weak coupling. And we normally describe their, the motion of excitons in terms of FRET, right? So this is this kind of typical pic picture of sort of polymers as a spaghetti. On the other side of this, you have systems in which you have low static disorder, perhaps low dynamic disorder, has because you've cooled the system down or something like that, and strong electronic coupling, right? So these are systems which are kind of, uh, you know, strong G aggregates, things like this. And of course, there's this, has been, of course, a long and ongoing controversy regarding whether coherent transport plays a role in natural light harvesting uh, systems. We'll come back to that right at the end of this talk. But actually, from a device point of view, if you're building uh, of, you know, an organic photovoltaic device or a photo detector or an OECT or an OPV or something, you actually don't want to operate in either of these regimes, right? It's pretty clear you don't want to operate in a very disordered materials regime because then you're just stuck with localized transport. And these fret transport distances are normally on the order of about 10 nanometers. So this is, this is not brilliant. Uh, you really want to be having higher exciton diffusion lengths. Uh, but this, on the other hand, these highly ordered systems are actually not very easy to process, right? So we don't really have any examples of good working devices based on highly ordered materials, right? So we know how to make highly ordered J aggregates. People have known this for decades now but we don't actually implement them in devices. They, they don't actually meet our requirements for devices. So what we really want to operate in is some kind of intermediate regime where we can get perhaps local crystallinity, local regions of order, but we, can't, we don't need order throughout the entire system. And the question is what would happen in these kind of materials? So uh, along with some collaborators, uh, the group of Ian Manners uh, at the University of British Columbia in Victoria, we've been uh, looking at these kind of ordered polymer nanofibers. So the idea here is that you have polymers, but instead of just having a spaghetti of polymers, which you've uh, kind of created by spin coating or drop casting, these polymers self-assemble in solution into these nice nanofiber. So the material here is P3HT, which for those of you who are kind of familiar with organic materials, this is kind of the fruit fly material for the community for the last, well, almost 25 years, I'd say now. Uh, and P3HT is this structure over here. And what we're doing is we're taking chains of P3HT and we then stack them. So this happens in solution through a process called living crystallization driven self-assembly. So you essentially stack fibers of P3HT next to each other like this to form these long uh, nanofibers, which can be microns in length. 
And as you can see, hopefully in these TEMs, we get very, very nice crystalline uh, nanofibers. So these you can see sort of electron diffraction spots over here and the coherence length. So that is the time before this kind of crystalline coherence is maintained is on the order of about 80 nanometers. So we get very nice kind of uh, domains. This is kind of a cartoon picture of it compared to our normal P3HD based materials, right? So this is our, our model system of a nice uh, self-assembled organic semiconductor, which we can process into film. So we can take these materials, solution coat them into films. And all the measurements I'll be talking to you are done on these solution coated films, but now these are nice ordered films instead of kind of this classic picture of a, of a messy spaghetti. So once again, we're going to do our pump probe spectroscopy experiment. Uh, we can compare our films. So the two curves over here are both absorption measurements in the blue and orange. And these correspond to just a normal P3HD, uh, rigid regular P3HD spin coated film and our nanofiber film in blue. And you can see actually the absorption spectrum doesn't change very much. The materials are basically electronically speaking very similar. It's only their structural arrangement that is now changed. And this is the photoluminescence of the materials. And what you can see here is this again, this mean square displacement as a function of time now going out to picosecond time scales, right? So this is no longer some kind of non-equilibrium ultra fast process. This is actually happening throughout the lifetime of the exciton in the system. And what we achieve here is a diffusion constant of about one, right? This is two orders of magnitude higher than you would measure for standard polymers, including P3HD, if you just spin coded a film. So these are some control measurements. You can see these are nanofibers here giving this exciton diffusion coefficient of about one. If you take just a normal film of P3HD spin coated or basically any other kind of spin coated polymer, you will achieve a number which is two orders of magnitude lower, which on our instrument, we basically can't resolve, it's more or less zero. If you take the nanofibers and you break them by putting in some chloroform kind of dissolving out that nice order, again, that goes back to zero. So what's going on here, right? We have ordered this material and now it's achieving a diffusion constant, which is a hundred times higher uh, than the comparable material in an unordered state. Okay. So one could say, okay, there's sort of coupling in this, but the coupling, if you model it, this isn't achieving very strong coupling. We have these chains lined up nicely, but there's still the electronic coupling from one chain to the next is not very high. So it can't undergo some kind of coherent kind of transfer. But what we believe is happening is the following. So we've aligned the system up. The system now has kind of low energetic disorder, right? So the energetic disorder is actually comparable to room temperature in these systems now. So the Urbach tail uh, for these systems is comparable to KT. And actually what happens is that in these materials, you have kind of a long range coupling kicking in. So that is to say, each of these fibers you can think of as an antenna and it can broadcast that exciton to another one of these antennas down the chain. And because now these are all aligned, you can start to kind of broadcast further and further down the chain. And so you can see if you kind of do a simple uh, coupling calculation and you turn on these long range couplings, you actually get a much higher rate of diffusion, which is still lower than our experiment, but actually much higher than what you'd expect from just the kind of uh, disordered fret model case. So this is essentially a fret case, and this is kind of uh, with the long range couplings turned on. So what we believe is happening is in these systems, we have, um, you have your wave function, which is sitting on one of these polymer chains and is localized on them, right? So this is not a case of delocalized excitons or coherent transport, it's still localized excitations. But every now and then, this excitation will interact with vibrations in the system, and that essentially kicks that exciton up, right? So what you have is uh, you have sort of uh, your wave function sitting somewhere in the density of states like this, and then every now and then you get an interaction with a, with an, with a phonon mode or a molecular vibration, which kicks that up, and essentially you can access high line states along which they, you can then move very quickly and then relocalize, right? So this isn't a case of having delocalized excitons all the time, you have only transient delocalization, right? So this is, this is what we term transient delocalization in the field now. We go from a localized state most of the time, if you look at this inverse participation ratio, you can see essentially there's mostly a localized state and every now and then you get a jump up to a higher line state, you get fast motion and then a relocalization. So why this is very useful is that mostly in organic systems, it's very hard to maintain delocalized states for a long time. So if you only rely on non-equilibrium delocalized states, uh, you will not get very far in terms of how far you can move excitations because things will scatter and kind of the wave function will collapse very quickly. But over here, what we're finding is there's a way to essentially, if you have long range order, you can re-access those delocalized states. So you can have a delocalized state, have it localized, have it re-delocalized, move quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So you kind of 
move in this inchworm-like behavior, but this allows you to get very, very far down the line. So in these systems, we've achieved diffusion lengths of two to 300 nanometers, which is a very important number because that's comparable to the uh, absorption depth of the materials. That is to say, if you take a two or 300 nanometer thick organic film, it will absorb all solar uh, sunlight that you put onto it, right? So if you wanna build a photocatalytic system or a solar cell or a photo detector or something like that, that's a very important distance we can now transport the excitons over that entire range uh, or that entire depth. So this is again about two orders of magnitude larger in terms of diffusion lens than what was possible before. So we think this is really quite interesting. Uh, and we are kind of, of course, working on this further to try and push these materials and into device applications. So again, this is a, uh, hopefully an example where we can see that spectroscopy can help guide the way towards the design of materials and also provide that feedback for the chemistry as to what can be done to kind of engineer the materials better. And uh, this work is all done by my PhD student, Sasha, and uh, the materials are all from the group of Ian Manners in Canada. So um, these are just a few examples of the work we're doing with this ultrafast microscopy. We're applying it to various systems. I talked a little bit about uh, some of our work with organics and perovskites today. There are some other papers we have, we have in the area. We're also looking at quantum dots and quantum dot assemblies, uh, and also some materials for, you know, perhaps more exotic use cases, such as room temperature exciton condensates. So let me now kind of switch gears and talk about a material system, which is kind of more complicated uh, and in requires a different kind of uh, microscopy or spectroscopy. And this is battery systems, right? So we all know batteries are very important for our kind of transition to a sustainable future. Uh, and traditionally, you know, optical spectroscopy and optical microscopy is not really, or our fields don't interact, right? Battery chemistry and battery, battery material science is a rather separate field from the normal materials that are studied with optical spectroscopy and microscopy, which tend to be, you know, semiconductor based or, you know, some of the kind of spin based systems we've been talking about today. But actually, fundamentally, the challenge is still the same, right? So if you look at a battery electrode, these materials are, uh, of course, you have a cathode and an anode, and you have the active particles in there. And these materials are incredibly heterogeneous. So you get a range of you know, particle sizes, chemical composition, states of lithiation or delithiation, et cetera. And what's really missing from the battery community is really a kind of a single particle level picture of how these materials are behaving. Okay? Um, so it's very similar to kind of the nano heterogeneity problem that we have been talking about in semiconductor materials. How do we understand at the nanoscale what's going on in these materials? How fast does lithium actually go into a single particle? So it turns out these are actually very tricky questions to, to ask and answer. And so if you want to figure out how well your battery material does right now, this has been kind of the state of the art. So you do uh, synchrotron-based transmission microscopy measurements in sort of very specific customized cells, uh, which look something like this. So these are beautiful measurements that you can then see essentially as a function of time, uh, you know, how you lithiate or delithiate or whatever kind of chemistry you have for the ion, these sort of materials. But these are very complicated synchrotron based measurements. Um, you know, they give you a lot of uh, data, but they're often done with kind of unrealistic sample designs. They're very costly and time consuming. This is not a kind of a high throughput methodology. So we came to this problem essentially with our ultra fast microscopy. But of course, um, you know, ultrafast optical absorption microscopy is useless for batteries because you know, ions don't absorb at any useful wavelength. Uh, most of the battery materials don't absorb at any useful wavelength either, right? So this is not an absorption of photoluminescence problem. However, we realized that actually we were thinking about it the wrong way because there is an interaction which is universal, which is actually light scattering, okay? So light scattering is a universal interaction and it's actually an easier thing to kind of to do in many ways than an optical absorption or photoluminescence type method. Okay. So what we're gonna be talking about is our lab-based kind of optical interferometric uh, light scattering microscopy. As I'll show you, this allows us kind of really high time resolution from a battery point of view, which in batteries is just sub millisecond is very, very high time resolution. There's no femtoseconds needed here. Uh, we can do very high throughput and realistic cell dormitories and can have high spatial resolution, okay? So essentially the idea is the following. We build a light scattering microscope, very simple to build actually. Um, we take a, a kind of battery half cell, which is optically accessible. So essentially you can see uh, we have our active material here. We have our lithium metal on the other side. We have a separator. The entire thing is immersed in electrolyte and we have an optical. So we have a, a window over here through which we can shine our light. Okay. So this is kind of an SEM image of an electrode. 
and uh, here are kind of um, are sort of interferometric scattering images which are comparable to this. Right? So what we're going to be looking at here is the scattering contrast uh, in these materials as they undergo electrochemical scattering. And the first material we started off with is lithium cobalt oxide. It is the most widely commercialized lithium uh, battery technology. It's what's in your phone, in your laptop right now. The Nobel Prize for this was handed out a couple of years ago. And it's essentially been developed you know, 40 years ago. And uh, you would think, or at least I thought, uh, that you know, we already know everything we need to know about this material. But it, as it turns out, actually at a single particle level, there are still open questions. You know, how do these materials, what rates do they actually lithiate it? You know, what, how do the phase transitions work, things like this. So we set out with our colleagues here in Cambridge Chemistry to kind of work on this problem. And what I'm going to do is, uh, is play you a video of what one of these imaging experiments looks like. So on the right hand side here, you have kind of view of a single particle of lithium cobalt oxide. On the left is essentially the electrochemistry data here on the top. And I've marked out the kind of various regions where we have the phase transitions in this material. Uh, as it kind of undergoes delithiation and lithiation. And then over here, we'll be looking at the bottom in this as the, the total scattering contrast, right? So let's just play this. And what I'd uh, hope you can see here, is essentially there's a lot of kind of wiggling and stuff moving around on this particle, right? Especially as we come into these phase transitions, now you'll see something will snap kind of across this particle. And then again, as we come into one of these, these phase transitions, and then as we re-enter this kind of biphasic region, uh, you will again see stuff to kind of move around from the outside of the particle to the inside. Okay. Hopefully that was clear to everyone. I'll be happy to play it again uh, later on if, if it wasn't. But essentially what our technique allows us to do is actually to come in and again with this sort of sub uh, diffraction limit precision on the spatial dimension uh, and with you know relatively high time resolution from a battery point of view, really image how um, ions are intercalating into these, into these uh, systems, right? So we could show, for instance, that on delithiation, these systems undergo a shrinking core mechanism, which is diffusion limited. Whereas on lithiation, there's actually an intercalation wave mechanism, which is charge transfer limited. So although these materials have been around for a really long time, they are commercialized, et cetera, these were actually, these hadn't been worked out in detail. So we could actually come in and do this. So I think it's a kind of nice methodology where you know, something which originally started in ultra fast with femtosecond time resolution, we were able to kind of think through and adapt for, for a completely different problem. But it shows that these kind of methodologies can be quite useful. So again, this is kind of, a, I think, a useful technique because it is actually rather simple to do in some ways. Uh, you can do it on realistic cell geometries where the electrochemistry is comparable to coin cells, which are kind of the standard platform for to test battery materials. We have relatively high spatial uh, precision on the measurements. We can do a range of different materials and ion uh, kind of chemistries. Uh, we can do this at really high throughput. These experiments are on 365 days a year, you know, seven days a week. Um, and yeah, so I think it's kind of a neat tool and hopefully in the end we can help to drive some of the materials optimization the systems use this as really a high, high throughput screening and materials optimization tool. Uh, I'd be happy to talk, talk about that more. If you are kind of interested, uh, these are a couple of papers. This was our original paper published last year. And then this one is just going to be coming out in Nature Materials, uh, hopefully next month, which tracks uh, one of these high rate lithium anode materials. So, right, now just the last few minutes, let me circle back uh, again to ultrafast microscopy, but now in a, in a very different system. And in some ways, the original energy material uh, which is photosynthetic systems, right? Uh, so what I'm going to be showing you is some very, very preliminary data. So please take it with a pinch of salt. Uh, but I thought this would be an interesting audience to kind of show this data too. So what we're, or you know, what we, but many people have been interested for a number of years, uh, probably more than a century, is you know the mechanism of photosynthesis, right? How this happens, and specifically from a uh, kind of you know photophysics point of view, how energy transfer happens in these systems. So this is a this is sort of a uh, photosynthetic bacteria, and if you look inside these things, you have the thylakoid membrane, in which you have these antenna complexes, right? Uh, so this is sort of a this is kind of a three D model uh, of these things. You have these antenna complexes which sit on the thylakoid membrane, which you can see here, and underneath these sit the reaction centers. So at these reaction centers, excitons come in from these antenna complexes. They are funneled through space to these reaction centers. And at the reaction center, uh, the exciton is split. 
uh, into electron and hole, and then this is used to drive redox chemistry, right? So these kind of photosynthetic bacteria uh, and kind of their, their sort of more evolved versions, if you want to talk, think about it that way, power most of the biosystems of the world, right? So this is kind of the primary energy generation vector, taking sunlight and generating energy from it. So there has been a long uh, debate and controversy in, in this field as to you know, what the nature of the energy transfer mechanism in these systems. We know it's extremely efficient. So these uh, photosynthetic antenna complexes are very, very good light absorbers, very, very high absorption cross sections. And then we know that they're very good at transferring that energy to the reaction center. And the question has been, you know, does this happen through kind of uh, fret-based sort of hopping type exciton transport, or is there something more fancy to going on, right? So there's been lots of debate about coherent energy transfer, et cetera, et cetera. And some of you would have heard these debates uh, if you've been around in the ultrafast community long enough. So we said, okay, you know what, we're gonna try and come at this with a slightly new perspective. And let's see if we can do our microscopy on the actual living cells. Okay. So maybe as a caveat for those of you who aren't really familiar with this, typically the way this has been studied is that one extracts these complexes out of cells and then studies them in solution. So you study the individual proteins, uh, you know, uh, your reaction center, your PS1, PS2, or your photosynthetic antenna, you study them individually extracted from the cells in solution. Because typically that's, uh, you know, we like to do ensemble based, solution based measurements in ultrafast photophysics or in photochemistry. Uh, we are coming at it, but you know, that's a kind of, that's a field which is very, um, very well established, people have done beautiful experiments in that. So we said, okay, if we can bring something new to this, it would be interesting. So what we're doing here is we're gonna be actually doing our ultrafast microscopy on living cells. So the entire living cell, we're just gonna go inside that cell and do our kind of spatially resolved microscopy in the living cell. And um, so as a caveat, when I say living cells, uh, they're living when we start, they're actually living at the end sometimes as well. Uh, if we don't do the experiment for too long. So the kind of data I'll show you is taken about in a 10 minute run. And some of the cells we fry, some of the cells we don't. Um, and so that's your def our definition is we're living at the start. They may not be living when we're done with them, but surprisingly, a few, some of them do survive this experiment as well. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at uh, three kinds of mutants over here. One of the great things of biology is that, you know, when you, when you work with smart biologists, they can do genetic engineering and knock out different proteins in this. So let's start with the wild type. Uh, system. So what we're here, what we're looking at here is that we are exciting uh, these, uh, these antenna complexes and we're looking at the energy funneling into the reaction center. But now we're looking uh, both at the kind of spectra, which I'm not showing here, but over here we're actually looking at the spatial movement of this energy within the actual cell, right? So I apologize again, this is very raw data. This is plotted in pixel counts. Uh, instead of actual kind of length scales, but essentially uh, the unit here is uh, per pixel is about 50 nanometers, right? So what we see in these wild type cells is that we photo excite and the center of mass of that photo excitation shifts in real space between 50 to 100 nanometers, which actually uh, ma matches quite well the distance scale that we'd expect here. So this sort of 52 nanometer length scale for the antenna complexes coming off, across these, off these thylakoid membranes. Now, if we take another mutant here, this is a so-called olive mutant, um, where essentially these phycobilosomes, so these antenna complexes, it's deficient in them, so it's been genetically engineered to be deficient. Uh, we actually see no motion at all. So we have kind of taken out some of these antenna complexes, we have weakened this, this, this apparatus here, and we see no motion. And then if we take this so-called PAL uh, mutant over here, these have been completely eliminated, so this, this mutant completely lacks these phycobilosomes, uh, but it still has kind of the carotenoids and the reaction centers of the stuff down here. Over here, we see no motion at all. Um, so what it looks like in this system is that we are able to resolve, and again, as, as I said, this is very preliminary, but it, is able, it looks like we're able to resolve the actual movement of the excitons within the living cell from, the, um, from these antenna complexes down into the reaction center. And that happens on a very, very fast time scale. So you can look at the axis here. This is done in you know, uh, one or 200 femtoseconds. It seems to be moving these 50 nanometer length scales. Okay? So these experiments are done by a couple of great PhD students, Arjun and Tommy in my group. And um, so I think it's a watch this space kind of message here. We don't know exactly what's going on, but 
it appears that it, it doesn't look like, at least to us at the moment, that this is explainable with classical hopping type uh, transport of energy. So let me just wind up by thanking a bunch of people uh, who over the years have helped us a lot. Um, I especially would like to give a shout out to Giulio and the team in Milano who have been kind of instrumental in helping us over many years to understand ultrafast physics and develop all these uh, cool spectroscopy methods. And also uh, my friend Philip Kukura in Oxford and a bunch of people around Cambridge and uh, elsewhere who have helped on the materials front, our collaborators, especially Claire Gray, uh, on the battery stuff and um, and our biology collaborators as well, and David Belgeon, who we've been doing a lot of theory with. And with that, let me just wind up and uh, thank you for your attention. And yeah, this my message is essentially that these kind of time-resolved optical scattering and absorption-based measurements have a, have a lot to kind of give the community in the energy materials to help kind of not only provide fundamental insights into how the materials work, but also hopefully steer the direction for the development of new materials and kind of really help fix the problems in these materials so that we can quicken the pace of this energy transition. Thank you very much. Happy to take any questions. Thank you for the, for the nice talk. Do we have any questions in the room? Oops. We'll start at the front. Hi, Akshay, this is Misha. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you, Misha. I have a sorry that I'm not there to uh, to answer in, in person. That's okay. Um, I I I have a uh, a question about the ballistic transport of charges in the in the perovskites. Mm -hmm. So I th I think yours is not the only uh, observation of that phenomenon uh, using um, ultra fast microscopy, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Um, the the the. My conundrum is that we have looked at ballistic transport, transport using terahertz um, spectroscopy, and we've uh, looked at, at you know single crystals, polycrystalline films, different types of um, uh, perovskites, and we, there is one particular system where we find evidence for ballistic transport, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it's generally uh, we find that nascent um electron hole pairs are less conductive or less mobile than mm -hmm. um those uh sure. you know than, than, so do you do you know so it, is there some specific sensitivity that you have that i don't have so i'm, I'm just trying to sure, is sure. It, I, mean, I can give you my theory i guess uh, yes that'd be great yeah i'd love to hear that. that so i guess uh so first to maybe um, for those who are not familiar with this field, as uh, Misha said, there's another paper which uh, reports similar observations, but actually quite different in some ways, uh, which is a very nice science paper from Li Bai Huang's group, which looks at longer time sort of transport of hot carriers, right? So that's looking at actually picosecond time scales uh, and looking at kind of transport of hot carriers um, at also, I can't remember the velocities that they, that they measure in that, uh, but essentially it's looking at hot carriers. So one thing that I would kind of stress over here is that you know the phenomena we're looking at is really non-equilibrium. And you can see in these plots, right? You can see when this tails off. This is done in 30 femtoseconds. Okay. And if you think about the band structure of the material and what you would expect, right, from, uh, from this classical semiconductor physics, is that you excite the system, you create a non-equilibrium distribution where the carrier temperature is not defined. You will then undergo electron-electron scattering very quickly. And in perovskites, that's been independently measured, in fact, by Julio. Uh, so you can you can ask him about that if he's still in the room. Uh, and that time scale is about 50 femtoseconds, right? So essentially, you get this electron electron scattering. And then, at least in our measurements, we don't see any fast motion after that, right? So from about 30, 40 femtoseconds on onwards to picosecond time scales, then we don't see anything fancy. We just see normal diffusion, which is very slow. In fact, it's surprisingly slow, I would say. Right. So if you actually, if you try to apply the Druda model uh, to these systems, it fails massively. Okay. Because um, you know we can measure directly the scattering times. If you put in put in the Druda model, you would predict a completely different scattering time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's something that suppresses the mobility of carriers at longer time scales, and that could be polarons and you know phonon scattering, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we don't measure any um, longer time. 
uh, fast motion of carriers. So one thing could be, and I, I and of course you're the expert, uh, this is my speculation, is that of course what the terahertz is sensitive to is something else, right? You're not sensitive to something that is gone in 20 frames to seconds. I think you're sensitive more to things which are kind of uh, after that, the actual motion of the carriers or the longer time frame. So if it was happening on you know, 200, 300, 400 frames per second out to picosecond time scale, that's what you'd be picking up. Um, on, on a comparable length, uh, kind of time scale, we don't actually pick up any fast motion at all. So there's this really early time expansion and then it all stops. And then there's just very, very slow diffusion after that. That's what we see. Does that, is that a plausible hypothesis, I guess? I think that's plausible. So there, there are some systems where we, when we re-excite the, the electron hole gas, we see enhanced transport. So we can see it. It's not like we, right? We cannot see it, but um, this, I think this, this makes sense that it's just, I, we cannot yeah, see stuff on, on tens of femto second time scales. Good to see you. Sorry. It's only the back of your head, but it's good to see you. So yeah, I think, uh, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's a question of, you know, it's what one would really expect. So, I mean, I, I would be surprised. I mean, I would be shocked and actually I wouldn't trust the measurement if we saw this kind of velocity going on for picoseconds, right? Because that would be insane. This is room temperature, there are phonons all over the place, the material is disordered. And so for instance, I, let me actually see if I have the, sorry, it's always good to have the supplemental slides. Okay, so I have it here. Um, play this. So hopefully you can see this. So this is essentially uh, this transport length versus the carrier concentration, right? So we're just increasing the pump fluence and you can see essentially like you, if you go to higher pump fluence, this collapses quicker. So this, this so-called ballistic motion, it kind of dies even quicker. Uh, and it depends on the film. So if your film is terrible, then something else is scattering, presumably defects, et cetera. And in fact, we've done work with Sam Strangs here in Cambridge. And you know we've looked at these, um, Sam has done excellent work with us and with others on kind of these deep traps essentially, which form uh, from kind of uh, lead iodide uh, vacancies and things like that. Uh, and this, this lens has scales actually match up very nicely with, with beam, beam data he has. But when you take a, the best film that at least at that time we could make, uh, we can kind of see this regime where, you know, we do enter some kind of saturation regime. So if your pump fluence is low enough, you are not scattering off just the excess electrons. There's some intrinsic time. Uh, but if you then pump harder and harder, that, that scattering goes faster and faster and this process just dies. So I think uh, this is a really, really fast time process. It really is the kind of trans the transition from the quantum mechanical picture very quickly to that kind of more, you know, normal semiconductor textbook picture. And that's what we're seeing here. It's just that it actually moves quite fast and quite far in just that those few femtoseconds, but then it's kind of gone. And we never see it again at later times as it were. Thank you. And sorry, I'm not there to answer this. Thank you. Yeah. No, no problem. Hi, um, I just have a couple of questions. Oh, maybe sure. I can. Oh, no, Luca okay. Bolsonaro. <laughs> oh, okay. And um, now they are uh, concerning the. Um, well, first of all, thank uh, thank you very much because it was very inspiring presentation. I have um, a couple of questions concerning the photosynthetic uh, uh, photosynthetic study. Yeah. And uh, the first question is, uh, um, how exactly do you distinguish? Uh, I mean, which are the spectros spectroscopic uh, observable to know if you are, uh, if the exciton is uh, like uh, in the antenna or in the reaction center? Uh, so, so are you using different wavelength? Uh, how are you? Yeah, so sorry, I, I don't have all the data here. It's very preliminary, but essentially what you can do is, you know, um, so we measure the live cells, right? Just in normal kind of solution-based measurements, you, you can measure the entire live cell. So you do the normal pump probe spectroscopy at fast time resolution. Uh, you know, these materials, are not material, these, these systems are of course well characterized through many years. So people know what the various signatures are for the phycobizlolomes, for the carotenoids, for the reaction center, et cetera. So that's kind of all not fully worked out, but relatively well known. Uh, so then, and then you can sort of selectively excite different regions. Uh, and this is a kind of more specific experiment where, of course, we have a broadband light pulse, because as Julia was, was kind of telling you this morning, you know, we need the fast time resolution here. So we excite a, a bunch of things, but not, uh, but we ex we're making sure we're exciting the, the antennas. And then we're watching essentially, I don't have a spectra here, 
but we can watch at different spectral positions how this energy is flowing spatially, right? So one can essentially do, we, we can have the kind of spatial thing, but then we can do it at different spectral uh, positions and watch how the energy is flowing. And we can see it essentially flows to lower energies from higher energy, right? Towards 680 nanometers, which is where the reaction center sits. So we can see the energy is funneling uh, in, in kind of energy towards 680. And then we can see it appears to be moving in space as well. So kind of our overexcited takeaway is, hey, we can see this moving, you know, in like in this real system. You know, I, 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 it may not be that, right? I don't want to, I want to, don't want to kind of jinx this. It may be something more trivial than that. But at least we think it's quite cool right now. So, okay. Okay, we have a question online. All right. Uh, Q&A, okay. We have a couple. Can you see them or would you like me to read them out? Uh, no, I can see them. So the first one is, I think, I was wondering about long range couplings among the polymers does not change the absorption. All right, so that's a great question. Uh, let's scoot back. Ooh. Right, so the question is essentially we have aligned these fibers um, and we see essentially that the absorption spectra is very similar, not exactly the same. You can see sort of uh, this peak, we have a nicer aggregation peak. So for those of you who are familiar with P3HT, this sort of shoulder here at 630, 650 nanometers is a sign of kind of good aggregation. So the better your aggregation, the nicer this peak is. So essentially this, this long range coupling, right, is not, uh, so if you think about what is happening in the absorption spectra to generate massive changes, it's really side to side coupling. So neighbor to neighbor coupling, and then you're getting the formation of sort of slightly delocalized excitons across different chains. So that's what gives you this, you know, this partially H, partially J character with Frank Spano and uh, other people have worked out for P3HD. That's what gives you the change in the absorption spectra is interchain kind of coupling between, between things. Over here, the couplings we're talking about are actually much weaker. So these are not couplings which are giving you delocalized excitons across hundreds of chains. It's nothing like that. They're kind of relatively weak couplings. But they are sort of, you know, couplings which do exist, which in a normal kind of disordered spaghetti-like system wouldn't be there because the structural order just isn't there. So the, the, the answer is essentially these couplings that we're talking about here are actually very weak uh, and they're nothing like the coupling that would give you these sort of much nicer, strong aggregation bands. Um, so I hopefully that, um, that answers that question. Um, so the second question is about how the photon energy affects the initial ballistic transport. So it's a little bit complicated for us to answer that question simply because, um, because of the methodology in the sense that we use a very fast light pulse, uh, which um, means it has a very broad uh, energy distribution. And this process is done in 30 femtoseconds. So if we use a narrow band pulse, we don't see it. So we're kind of limited by our technique, but you know we've tried to play with it a little bit and we don't see a great deal of difference. And for us, the answer is simply the band structure. So actually, if you look at this, uh, you know where you're generating those wave packets um, in the band structure, um, you know there's a kind of, there's a curvature to the band structure. If you go very high up in energy, it's not necessarily that that curvature is changing very much. And the thing to keep in mind is that this is not a, this, so th there is this notion in the literature that I excite the particle with more energy, hence it will have more kinetic energy, right? And somehow it's gonna move faster when it's hot. I, I just, do, I don't agree with that, that notion essentially because it doesn't match any kind of physics that I agree with. Uh, what's happening here is, you know, you're exciting these things, they're in a band structure, they undergo scattering, and then it'll cool to, you know, eventually to whatever the, you'll form some hot population and that hot population then will have um, electron phonon coupling and it will cool to the lattice temperature, right? So for me, there's no reason why exciting somewhere very high up in the band should necessarily give you faster ballistic transport. The ballistic transport will just be governed by where it is in the band structure. And it's not like this thing goes super parabolic or something like that. It's not crazy. So, you know, it's uh, it's not super flat around k equal to zero and it's not the, the, the kind of derivative isn't going mad. So it's actually reasonably similar. I wouldn't expect much change. And within the limited spectral kind of variability we have, we don't see much change. So hopefully that answers that question. 
So I, I'm only spotting two. Are there other ones that I'm missing or? That was it, unless we have any one last question from the room? No. Okay, thank you again for a great talk and we'd like to thank all of the speakers today. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, not many people left here, but uh, you can still get a lab tour if you want. I think there might be some you already did. Most people did. Anyway, I will come back. <laughs>